Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. It's pretty exciting to tell your parents you've decided to have your own wedding. Tina Thomas was much more nervous than her fiancé, Gabe Watson. Tina was 26 years old at the time, exactly like her future husband. This was her third serious relationship and her second attempt at marriage. Her first attempt to start a family with her boyfriend, Scott McCulloch, failed. The relationship between the young people was fine, but only Tina's mother opposed the wedding. Scott disliked the fact that there were no specific claims, but like every mother, she wanted a better and happier life for her daughter, Tina, who was still very young at the time. As a result, the couple quickly split up and the prospect of a shared future faded. The second attempt, with Stan Marks, also failed. Tina's parents had no involvement in this situation. The couple was unable to overcome the first three-year crisis and separated with mutual consent. Tina finally meets Gabe Watson on Christmas Eve at a party with her friends. We can't say it was love at first sight. Instead, the relationship was based on mutual support following a recent breakup. Yes, this may not be the most exciting reason to begin a new relationship, but two years later he proposed marriage to Tina. Tina, having learned from bitter experience, said she agreed but couldn't do it without parental permission. Gabe chose Valentine's Day in 2003 to make a beautiful and romantic appeal to his chosen one's parents, just like a true prince. However, Tina's father was away, so the dinner was rescheduled for the following day. On February 15, during the dinner, when Watson expressed his desire to live with Tina for the rest of his life, her father asked of him a seemingly simple question. Is he in love with Tina? Gabe stammered like a schoolboy and never responded. His father saw this reaction as a common embarrassment among strangers. He then asked his daughter the same question. Surprisingly, Tina did not directly answer this question, but she did begin her speech by expressing her fear of being alone at the age of 26. After giving it some thought, the father blessed the children. Planning a wedding takes a significant amount of time and effort. While Tina was thinking about her outfit, her guests, and the entire wedding, Gabe was only concerned with the honeymoon. He didn't care how his future wife chose to spend her vacation. He had already made every decision for her. His plan was to visit the Great Barrier Reef in the Pacific Ocean near Australia and dive there. First, look at the sunken ship, the Townsville Titanic, which sank in 1911. The problem was that, unlike Gabe, Tina was not into diving. Yes, he took her scuba diving in the pool, occasionally in calm water under the supervision of lifeguards, but nothing more. Gabe was an experienced scuba diver. He was completing a rescue diving course and had over 50 dives under his belt at the time. And they weren't in a pool. If you do not learn to dive by our honeymoon, I will warn you right away. You're staying at home, walking your dog, or pruning roses in the garden, Gabe said. You are not going anywhere with me. Tina had no choice. Gabe even took out a loan to buy her own equipment and cover her fiancé's tuition. Tina's first instructor was disappointed with her abilities and even warned Gabe that his fiancé lacked the necessary skills for open ocean swimming. A furious game refused to listen to the diving instructor, accusing him of being the one who couldn't explain and refusing to continue with the class. The second instructor quickly gave Tina credit. Although she stated that Tina does everything she can to please her future husband, the young couple married on October 11. After two days, Tina and Gabe flew to Australia, spending $10,000 on a trip that provided funds for their wedding. It should be noted that Tina dedicated a portion of her honeymoon to her. They walked around Sydney and visited the Sydney Aquarium and Zoo. Tina was excited. But the closer they got to the Great Barrier Reef, the sadder she became on October's morning. When they first flew to Townsville, they boarded a boat to one of the most beautiful places on the planet, and every diver dreamed. After a while, dive company employees will tell you that the couple did not appear to be experienced divers. Even Gabe, who had completed courses and gained experience, struggled to understand the equipment as if he had never seen it before. Nonetheless, he assisted Tina in passing the pre-dive exam, despite the fact that such a test should be conducted separately. When the instructor offered Tina his assistance underwater, she refused. It was also mentioned in the conversation that there was a strong current that day and that this historical moment should not be overlooked or dismissed. As I previously stated, Gabe assisted his wife in organizing the equipment they had purchased in the United States before heading to retrieve the tanks they needed to rent. 
Gabe took an 11 liter tank for himself and gave his wife an eight and a half liter tank, which was extremely small for this location and potentially dangerous given Tina's lack of experience. It was not possible to descend to the Townsville Titanic for the first time. Tina requested additional cargo because she could not dive to depth. Gabe also initially refused to use the underwater computer, which calculates the necessary diving and ascent speeds and displays the amount of oxygen in the cylinders. After returning to the boat, the computer worked, so they tried again. Tina was the first to submerge Gabe, who was swimming behind her, according to the game statement. The wreck was 49 feet deep. At first, everything seemed fine. Tina came to a halt and began waving at me before signaling her desire to ascend. I realized right away that she was simply panicking. She used to do that. By this point, we had climbed halfway. So I decided to calm her down by staying with her at the same depth for a while without diving further, allowing her to psychologically adjust to the pressure. She continued to breathe deeply, which was dangerous, and I realized she was sinking. I tried to grab her belt to keep her down, but she swung her arms so hard that she knocked my mask off. Tina was already too far away from me by the time I finished putting the mask back on my face. For a while, I attempted to swim to her but was unsuccessful. Then I decided to return to the surface and ask for assistance from the lifeguards. Along the way, I met another swimmer with a narrow set, but he ignored my signals for assistance. Yes, there were two Asian men with them, but neither of them confirmed Gabe's statement about his request for assistance. Later, when the police took underwater computer readings, they confirmed that Gabe attempted to swim after his drowning wife for a short time before abandoning the effort. Although the ascent to the surface was not an emergency, Gabe followed the instructions and stopped at each required depth level. When questioned by police, Gabe stated that he could have saved his wife but chose not to. Furthermore, this tragic incident occurred at the start of their dive, so Gabe had enough oxygen in his tanks to swim to the bottom and return to the surface. The rescuers are on duty aboard the ship. When they realized what had happened, they immediately went in search of Tina, and they found her quickly, but it was too late. Tina was lying on her back, eyes open under her mask at 82 feet. Her body was immediately lifted onto the deck of the yacht. They gave her artificial respiration for approximately 40 minutes, but to no avail. Tina died, and despite all of this time, he did not approach his wife but instead stood to the side and sniffed his nose, according to witnesses. The same company employees claimed that the young man on his way to the shore, who smiled and even played cards with other passengers, denied this in court. Tina's subsequent autopsy revealed that not everything was clear. Yes, there is no evidence of a violent death, but there are bruises on the neck. There are traces of blood in the nostrils, which is common at the 82-foot depth where Tina's body was discovered. There are no traces of alcohol in the blood, but there are high levels of medications like ibuprofen and paracetamol. Although these drugs are used to treat seasickness, a small amount of fluid was detected in the lungs. Tina died from drowning, according to the report, but she could have drowned while already oxygen deprived. Tina's equipment was examined by Australian water police, but no malfunctions were discovered. The police could have written it off as an accident. An inexperienced diver disregarded safety precautions and paid with his life. Unfortunately, this is a very common case, but there were some suspicious moments in the story, such as the rather ambiguous results of the autopsy. According to the diving team, the autopsy also revealed Watson's strange behavior, which does not fit into the conventional picture of a husband grieving for his wife who has just died. All of these factors contributed to the case's difficulty and closure. That's why the investigation took so long. Gabe realized detectives were searching for him, Furthermore, his parents refused to accept what had happened as a tragic accident, preferring to see their son-in-law in the dark, if not as their daughter's murderer, then as a man who had not helped her. During the first interrogation, the police noticed that the suspect was in shock, crying and laughing, twitching nervously, asking to call his father, who complained of ear pain, and begging him to inform his wife's parents about the tragedy. Gabe was released late at night. He went to the yacht owned by the company that sent them to the reef and requested a night's stay, claiming that the trip was supposed to last two days, but because his wife had died, they had only been there for 24 hours. He also requested a refund of half the cost of their dive. In fact, he never saw the sunken ship. Gabe's mother flies to Townsville on October 24 to support him and help him find a lawyer. 
they go to the morgue that same day, as requested by Gabe. Gabe wanted to see his wife one more time because the husband was still a suspect. The morgue employee contacted the detective and detective in charge of the case who may have hidden some evidence. But the bereaved husband only cried, gripped his wife's cold hand, and begged her forgiveness. Unaware that a police officer was standing outside the door at the time, he recorded him on a tape recorder. I did not mean to hurt you. Detective Lawrence later uses these words against Gabe in court. Then visit the morgue. You said you didn't mean to hurt Tina. What do you mean by that? Lawrence will ask the question. The story of Gabe's sore ear was told again as he traveled home with his wife's body. During a layover in Oakland, he requested medical attention on the airport grounds and was held there for evaluation. The investigation determined that this was done on purpose to avoid seeing Tina's father. However, divers will confirm that your problems are a fairly common ailment. Tina's funeral was held on November 5, and Gabe still had to meet with his late father. Gabe removed his wife's wedding ring, placing it on his ring finger instead of hers as well as earrings, which he immediately handed over to his father-in-law. Watson and the Thomas family did not cross paths again that day. Later in the trial, Gabe would be asked, did you really remove your wife's jewelry during the funeral? Gabe will just smile and shrug. I doubt I could have done it later. Everyone had different perspectives on Gabe. Some described this chubby funny man as a kind man, while others called him a tyrant and desperate man, but they all agreed on one thing. Gabe and Tina were not happy, or didn't appear to be. Tina's friends confirmed what she told her father during a family dinner on February 15. Tina died on the seabed because she was afraid of dying alone, and her union with Gabe was simply a means to that end. Also, the victim who died shortly before their honeymoon told a friend that her husband dragged her to an insurance company and forced her to insure his life at a higher interest rate in case of death, putting his name in the beneficiary column. The insurance agent checked the testimony and confirmed everything. The taxi driver who took the newlyweds to the yacht was also questioned. Tina cried the entire way, but her husband ignored her. Finally, Tina's friend Amanda Phillips shared another story, revealing what the couple's relationship was truly like. This damn jerk videotaped Tina urinating in the bathroom, edited it, and put it on a Christmas videotape. That would have been fine, but he showed it to a large group of people. He laughed like a horse as everyone twiddled their fingers around their temples, attempting to explain to him that it was a very low act. I was clutching crosses on my fingers, hoping Tina wouldn't get the idea to marry him. While removing jewelry during a funeral may appear to be a frightening and condemnatory act on Gabe's part during the trial in 2008, the jury was shown extremely disturbing footage of Watson visiting Tina's grave, removing all the flowers, and carrying them away. They were later discovered in a nearby trash can. Tina's father noticed the missing flowers and wanted to find out who had stolen them. He placed a hidden camera in the next row among the monuments. But he didn't expect to see Gabe. On the tape, and I was outraged by such an act in court. Gabe's defense was that he and his wife had discussed the death of one of their own during an extreme honeymoon. Her request for no flowers on the grave sounded strange and unlikely. There's no telling how long the search for evidence would have lasted. If the cops had worn the same gear as the newlyweds and not attempted to stage the incident, Gabe claims Tina drowned while he was attempting to put a mask on her face. It turned out that you couldn't put on the mask underwater without using another source of air. Tina received oxygen in late November 2008. Gabe was arrested by Australian police, and his trial began on June 5, 2009, with him pleading guilty, but only to failing to save his wife. So he was charged with negligent homicide and sentenced to 18 months in prison. After serving his sentence, Gabe returned to the United States. However, a year later, the now us court charged him with first degree murder, with the motive being to receive insurance payments following his wife's death. Gabe's lawyer attempted to defend his client by blaming the diving company, claiming that the employees of this company failed to ensure the safety of tourists and are now afraid of losing their license. And thus the entire business is attempting to shift the blame onto the unhappy husband, who has already served his sentence in another country. The insurance company paid Gabe $33,000, but he spent a lot more money on lawyers and additional expertise. Nonetheless, the prosecution continued to argue that the husband's spending was necessary because he could not assume he would not be believed. 
Furthermore, the prosecutor refused to accept Gabe's lack of ability to save his wife, despite having a degree in drowning rescue. When Gabe finished speaking, he addressed the jury. It has been seven years since the tragedy, and I haven't stopped thinking about that terrible day. The public has pounced on me, blaming me for my wife's death and accusing me of murder. There was no one who looked me in the eyes and said, yes, I understand how bad you feel, but this is not your fault. On the contrary, everyone simply wants me dead. And now I can only understand my late wife's parents. They will never forgive me no matter how much I kneel before them. And no matter how much I kneel before them, and no matter how much I beg their forgiveness, you frequently hear the phrase, I can't imagine what it's like to lose a child. But I've never heard anyone say that they can't imagine what it's like to lose a wife, especially on their honeymoon. If I can be accused of anything, it's that I didn't do enough to save Tina. But I've already been punished for that. Perhaps you would have been satisfied if I had drowned with my wife seven years ago, but I was afraid of death. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to get from the bottom to the top. I only wanted to live, and I still want to live today. There was no evidence presented in court to prove Gabe was guilty. The jury found Gabe not guilty. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Today we'll look at the story that took place in Oklahoma. On August 8, 2012, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation called Garvin County Sheriff. The latter said they were contacted by a resident named Van Emblem, who claimed to have witnessed the disposal of the body and an attempt to hide all evidence. Emblem stated that the night before the call, his friend, on whose ranch he has worked for four years, asked him for assistance. When he arrived at the ranch, a friend admitted that he needed help disposing of the body. At first, Van assumed it was a joke. However, when he saw the red stained plastic buckets, he realized it wasn't a joke. The buckets were heavy, so his friend needed assistance loading them into a pickup truck. Before realizing he might become an accomplice to the crime, Van helped his friend regain his composure before leaving, telling him to deal with everything on his own. Over the next few hours, Van spoke with a lawyer, who convinced him that the only way out of this situation was to call the police. After all, if it was discovered later that he knew about the crime but did not report it to authorities, he would be charged as an accomplice. Brandon Duran was born in 1980 in San Diego, California. Brandon's father was a motorcycle enthusiast and a former member of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club, the world's second largest criminal organization after the Hells Angels, according to the FBI. His parents divorced when he was about 10 years old. They maintain good relations, however, and share equal responsibility for their son's upbringing. At the age of 25, Brandon gradually inherited his father's love of motorcycles, he had his own motorcycle, which he built by hand and treasured dearly. He frequently socialized with other bikers, but did not belong to any motorcycle clubs. Brandon's father died unexpectedly on April 5, 2005, which was a difficult time for him. Brandon decided to make a change in his life to combat his increasing depression. He sat on a motorcycle and headed to Las Vegas. Brandon had been living in Vegas for about a year when he met Amber Andrews, 24, whose company made him forget about his problems. A whirlwind romance between them led to marriage two months after they met. Amber was already pregnant at this point. In December 2006, she gave birth to Brandon's son, Brando. Brandon's life changed dramatically after his child was born. He became a devoted father and husband who worked at a high-paying job and prioritized family over his interests. However, the same cannot be said for Amber. As if she didn't notice the birth of a child, she continued to live her lifestyle, attending biker gatherings and various parties. As a result, relations within the young family began to deteriorate quickly. Sometimes it came down to fights. Undoubtedly, the only outcome of this was a divorce filed four years after the wedding, with Brandon receiving full custody of the child. After all, unlike Amber, he could support himself and his son. After the divorce was finalized in 2010, 
Amber returned to her hometown of Meeker, Oklahoma, while Brandon returned to San Diego with his son. He was glad to be reunited with his family, who later assisted him in raising a child. Brandon's emotional wounds from a failed marriage began to heal over time, and he became more optimistic about the future. However, while pondering the future, the past knocked at his door. In the summer of 2012, he noticed Amber on his doorstep. His ex-wife wanted to reunite and asked him to give their relationship another chance. Brandon's previously suppressed feelings resurfaced. He believed his ex-wife's sincerity and agreed to a new start. Their son Brando was scheduled to start kindergarten in September, and Amber invited the three of them to visit her parents in Oklahoma, who were eager to see their grandson. Brandon agreed, and they began planning the trip, intending to stay in Oklahoma for about a week, several days before Brandon Amber and their sons returned to San Diego. Van Emblem contacted the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Van reported that his friend and employer requested assistance in disposing of the body, claiming that it was Brandon Duran's. Justin Hammer, 30, of Garvin County, requested help with a van. After receiving a call from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation regarding the possible crime, the local sheriff and his assistant went to Hammer's ranch right away. Furthermore, after calling Brandon's relatives in San Diego, the authorities discovered that Brandon had been out of reach for several days before confirming Van's information. They decided not to tell Brandon's family about this case. During questioning, Justin quickly confessed to murdering Brandon Duran, which surprised detectives. However, there was one critical moment. Hammer claimed he acted in self-defense and identified Duran as a dangerous motorcycle gang member who had threatened him. According to him, on August 7th, Brandon arrived at his house on a motorcycle, kicked out the door with his foot, entered, and began threatening him. Hammer claimed to have an intimate relationship with Amber, which prompted Brandon's unexpected visit. Brandon threatened him, according to Hammer, saying he needed to disappear from Amber's life, promising to ask his biker friends to help him disappear forever, and mentioning that if he disobeyed, his relatives would die as well. Hammer allegedly grabbed a shotgun from the corner of the room and fired it following these words. When he realized Brandon was dead, he was afraid of retribution from the Bandidos Motorcycle Club and did not call the police, instead deciding to hide all evidence. Instead, Justin took the body to the bathroom and disposed of it with a saw, five-gallon buckets, and concrete. According to the Hammer statement, he was unable to load the buckets into the pickup truck on his own due to the added weight of cement. As a result, he sought help from his friend Van, who assisted him in loading buckets into a pickup truck before leaving and turning him over to the police. Hammer's ranch had a small pond into which he tossed the buckets. After dealing with the body, he started cleaning the house. Hammer later burned the cleaning supplies, gloves, and rags he used, claiming that he had given Brandon's motorcycle to a relative. At the same time, Hammer stated that his relative was unaware of the bike's origin and had disassembled it for spare parts. After all, five buckets were recovered from the bottom of the pond, and the officers went to Meeker to inform Amber of the sad news. The woman was shocked when she learned of her child's father's death. She stated that they divorced but intend to reconcile. Amber also mentioned that she had a fight with Brandon the day before after he learned about her relationship with Justin Hammer. After the argument, Brandon left on a motorcycle, claiming he would deal with her lover on his own, and such an account of events appeared plausible. However, there was a recent development in the case. Criminologists working in Hammer's house began to discover new evidence that called his testimony into question. Justin claimed Brandon kicked down the door and entered the house, but in reality, someone kicked it from inside. The shoe print on the door matched the footprint of Hammer sneakers, indicating Justin was the one who knocked on the door. In addition to the pistol and shotgun, they discovered a list of items required to dispose of the body and the gun safe. It's possible that the crime wasn't spontaneous and that Hammer planned it ahead of time. Aside from the five buckets, they extracted a doghouse from the pond, which was filled with cement and contained fragments that would not fit into the buckets. Based on this evidence, Justin Hammer was charged with first-degree murder. The forensic medical expert had a difficult time analyzing 25 individual fragments of Iran's body. 
an autopsy revealed that Brandon was shot four times in the head, three with a pistol, and one with a shotgun. Furthermore, according to the expert, the shotgun shot was the final one. Brandon had most likely died and was lying on the floor by this point. However, it contradicted Hammer's testimony, which stated that he fired only once and from a shotgun, but the investigators couldn't understand it. A question arose. Why did Hammer need to use a shotgun after firing a pistol three times, especially when Brandon was already dead? This evidence suggests that someone other than Hammer could be involved in the crime. The investigators called to Brandon's mother, Cindy, about her son's death left her speechless after she regained consciousness. Cindy clarified that Brandon was never a member of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. Brandon's father, she explained, passed on his love of motorcycles to his son, but it never progressed beyond that. However, Cindy's story contained another intriguing twist. She stated that Brandon's bike was broken when he left for Oklahoma. He loaded it into the back of his pickup truck, intending to repair it in Oklahoma. Furthermore, Cindy stated that her son disliked conflict situations and that his ex-wife Amber was the source of all of his problems. Her infidelity overshadowed their relationship from the beginning. Amber remained loyal even after the birth of her son, to her lifestyle, and when Brandon expressed his displeasure with her behavior, she began a fistfight. All of this culminated in a divorce, with Brandon receiving full custody of their son, which infuriated Amber. She then went missing for over a year, seemingly unconcerned about her son's life. As a result, Brandon and the rest of his family were taken aback when she appeared unexpectedly and requested another chance. After learning all this information, including Justin Hammers, Amber and I were lovers. The investigators decided to look into Brandon's ex-wife more closely. Amber informed police that Brandon left on a motorcycle following the argument. However, his family claimed that it was broken. The question arose as to whether the breakage was not severe. Why would Brandon take the motorcycle to Oklahoma rather than repair it at home? Amber never mentioned that Brandon was fixing it. She also claimed she went to the doctor after Brandon left to deal with a hammer. Despite this, the police discovered no evidence that she was in any of the city's medical facilities on that particular day. All of this implied Amber had no alibi. Amber later revealed to detectives that she had asked a friend to babysit her son on the day Brandon died. When her friend arrived around 3 p.m., Amber and Brandon left the house together. They drove into Brandon's pickup truck, which was carrying a motorcycle in the back. Amber forgot her phone at home and didn't return until eight hours later. However, when she arrived, neither Brandon nor his motorcycle were in the truck. After accessing Amber's phone, investigators discovered a message sent just before she and Brandon left the house. Justin Hammer sent a text stating that the ink was ready. The investigators assumed it was a secret code, indicating that everything was prepared to deal with Brandon. After interviewing Amber's close friends, detectives discovered that she never wanted to reconcile with her ex-husband and always spoke negatively about him. She despised Brandon for having full custody of their son and for being a square. Soon. Authorities discovered physical evidence that contradicted Amber's story. The forensic handwriting analysis revealed that the note was discovered in a hammer safe. Amber wrote the list of items needed for body disposal, and when the police gained access to the local hardware store's CCTV cameras, they discovered that the crime had been planned and prepared in advance. The footage taken the day before Brandon's death shows Hammer purchasing buckets and other items from Amber's list. However, while awaiting trial, Hammer insisted he had no accomplice and had acted in self-defense. He was doing everything he could to keep Amber safe, as she was still free. The man claimed that the items on Amber's list were necessary to repair the house, not to dispose of the body. Furthermore, Hammer explained why he used two different weapons, stating that he held a shotgun in one hand and a pistol in the other. To say that investigators found this statement strange is an understatement. Many expected the trial to last several weeks. The jurors deliberated for approximately an hour and a half before recommending a life sentence without parole. We're very pleased with the decision. We think it was appropriate. Assistant District Attorney Jennifer Austin says it's justice for Brandon Durant's family. 
We also believe that the sentence of life without parole is entirely appropriate. I am overjoyed that the jury determined Cindy was Durant's mother. I'm sure it was difficult, but this is what I've been hoping for for two years. Justin Hammer received a life sentence without the possibility of parole in October 2014. Amber was arrested two months later and charged with first-degree murder of her ex-husband, desecrating his remains, and conspiracy to commit a felony. Amber pleaded not guilty, hoping to be released on bail. I've been fighting for 32 months to bring my son home with me. Andrew spoke as she sat in the courtroom, handcuffed and dressed in a light purple inmate suit. My son has been at home for exactly one month, and she asked if there was anything I could do to stay with him until the trial. Norman is in town to oversee a jury trial, as ordered by District Judge Jeff Virgin. He agreed to the state's request to deny Andrews a bond amount. Given the nature of the allegations, this court believes bond should be denied at this time. Virgin stated that it took more than two years before the trial began in the spring of 2017. Amber pleaded not guilty, and her lawyers claimed that the defendant was not at the crime scene. Prosecutors Christy Miller and Jennifer Austin claimed that Andrews was the only person with a motive to kill Brandon Duran. According to Miller, Amber was the crime organizer who lured Brandon to her lover's house and Air Hammer shot him three times with a pistol, and Amber fired the final shot with a shotgun. Miller informed the jury that all witness statements and evidence presented at the trial point to Amber's direct involvement in this crime. She was the only person who wanted him gone. Amber Andrews is the only person with motives. She was the only one who could understand why he was gone. Miller stated that she did not only want him dead, but also for him to disappear. She had the motivation, and Hammer had the place to do it. They believed they had the perfect plan. Miller told jurors that the motive was to push the ran out of the way so Andrews could regain custody of their young son, despite the fact that she was absent from home for eight hours on the day of Brandon's death, and there was no evidence to back up her alibi. The prosecutor stated that Amber assisted Hammer in disposing of the body and cleaning the house. While unable to fulfill her parental responsibilities, she did not want to give her son to a man she despised. And since she couldn't obtain custody of the child through the courts, she decided to kill Brandon. However, the defense attorney, Jay Mendros, claimed that the prosecutor's office had provided no evidence of Amber's involvement in the case. There is no evidence. Mandro told the jurors that is what you do when you don't have any. They disparage her character. The state has a conspiracy theory, but there is no evidence to support it. She isn't a cold-blooded killer. She did not plan the murder. Justin did this because he feared losing Amber. Jay Mendros described it as a perfect recipe for disaster, with Duran traveling to Oklahoma to reunite with Andrews, while Hammer, who had been dating Andrews for a year, was concerned about losing her to Duran. The defense attorney made the following statements Justin Hammer had every reason to kill Brandon Duran. It was a love triangle, or a case of being torn between lovers. There is no black and white here. She switched back and forth with both men. They twisted and turned every statement in here to make them appear sinister. They're attempting to imprison someone on suspicion of innuendo. In this country, people are not convicted based solely on suspicions. This does not make her a conspirator or a murderer. Justin Hammer confessed to the murder. He claimed to have done it all by himself. That demonstrates that jurors returned guilty verdicts after more than four hours of closing arguments in a Garvin County District courtroom. They recommended that Amber Andrews, 35, be sentenced to life in prison. Sentencing was scheduled for June 12, 2017. Amber arrived at the court hearing in a good mood. Cindy, Brandon's mother, approached the witness stand in tears expressing how her son's death had affected her and her grandson Brando. You and your minions have taken away every dream I've ever had, he said, placing a photo of Duran next to the stand. Brandon only wanted his family, and you murdered him for it. I'll never see that smile that lights up the room before Brandon even walks in. He won't have the chance to teach Brando how to snowboard. You ensured this by murdering him. If you genuinely cared about Brando, you would not have murdered his father. You must work for what you want, not kill for it. You wanted it and would do anything to destroy it. She said this while pausing and staring up at Andrews, shaking her head up and down. 
That is the devil's work, she said, adding that Andrews has done unspeakable things to her as Iran's mother. Before the judge's decision, defense attorney Jay Mendros issued another statement. The defense continues to maintain that there is no evidence linking her to the murder. Metros informed the judge, there is no evidence that she was involved in the murder. I would request that the judge disregard the jury's verdict. We asked you to overturn the jury's decision and restart this case. Jay Mendros contended that the state's case lacked evidence and relied on jurors' emotions to secure a guilty verdict. They used guessing and speculation to convince her to go to prison. There is no evidence that the state was solely concerned with shock value. Amber Andrews received a life sentence without parole for the first-degree murder of Brandon Duran. She was also sentenced to seven years for desecrating the remains and an additional 10 years for conspiring to commit a felony. Justin Hammer is currently serving time at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister, Oklahoma, while Amber Andrews is still incarcerated at the Mabel Bassett Correctional Center in McLeod, Oklahoma. Since August 7, 2012, Brando is currently in a foster home after being taken into custody by the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. After fighting the court system in January, he was allowed to return to San Diego and live with his grandmother. However, it was not a victory yet. Cindy had to wait five years before she was granted full custody of Brando. Following the trial, she and her relatives told him the truth about the verdict and his mother. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will discuss the events of 2013. Jaden Parkinson, 17, went missing after leaving his hostel in Oxford, England. The police began searching for her as soon as they received a missing persons report. While investigating this case, the police discovered something they had never seen before. Nothing like this has ever occurred in the UK before. Jaden Parkinson was born September 26, 1996, in Folkestone, United Kingdom. She was the youngest of the family's three children. Her parents' relationship was far from idyllic. Samantha Shrewsbury, Jaden's mother, claims her children have witnessed a lot of unpleasant things. Jaden was seven years old when her parents divorced. The girl lived with her father but was very close to her mother. They lived in various locations and spoke on the phone every night. When she became a teenager, her life became a little chaotic. Samantha claimed that Jason's father gave her complete freedom. She joined a company where she began smoking and drinking. She lived with her father from time to time before moving in with her mother when she was 13. She ran away from home and approached her mother, expressing a desire to live with her. Ultimately, the family court allowed Jaden to remain with her. She had disagreements with several people at school, including teachers. She didn't like how someone was attempting to control her behavior. In her personal life, she was in a relationship with Benjamin Blakely. Jaden was only 14 when she met Ben Blakely. They didn't live together because she was still a child, but he kept nagging her and gradually changed her completely. Jaden began dating Ben when she was 15 years old. He was 20 years old at the time. Jason's mother was undoubtedly concerned about the five-year age difference but she had no control over her daughter's love life. Their relationship began as tender and romantic, but everything changed with time. There was no trace of their previous mutual understanding, and their relationship became extremely strained. Ben oversaw every aspect of Jason's life she stopped wearing makeup and became increasingly withdrawn. Ben even decided what clothes she could wear. He caused Jaden to drift apart from family and friends, as a result, the girl left her mother's house and began living in a hostel for women experiencing domestic violence. Although Ben was forbidden from entering this hostel, he was still able to completely control her life. They frequently argued, and Jaden even informed the hostel staff that Ben was aggressive toward her. She couldn't do anything without his consent. He took her phone away, convincing her that all she needed in the world was him, his love and care. Ben forbade her from speaking with men. 
He had complete control over her social media accounts, and she had stopped attending school. Ben's level of control was so high that he even forbade her from leaving her room to use the restroom. Jaden used to call her mother every day. However, their communication has been reduced to one or two conversations per month. Samantha requested her daughter return home and end her relationship with Ben. However, the persuasion did not work. Ben dominated Jaden both mentally and physically. She was seen multiple times with bruises on her face. On November 30th, 2013, Jaden called her mother to tell her she was pregnant. She hoped that the child would force Ben to reconsider his attitude toward her and his lifestyle in general. She expected the baby to strengthen their bond and Ben to return to his former self, but he fell short. Ben stopped acting like a good boy, as is common in such situations. When he took complete control of Jaden, she fell into a trap. He made her drift away from her friends and family and rely solely on him. She did not have her own money. As I previously stated, he eventually forbade Jaden from leaving her room, even if she needed to use the restroom. Ben dated other girls behind her back, over whom he exercised psychological and physical control. Samantha once again asked her daughter to return home after learning of her pregnancy. However, Jaden refused they met to discuss it, but Jaden remained adamant. The girl didn't want to cause her mother any more problems. When Jaden told Ben about her pregnancy, he became enraged and claimed that he was not the father of her child. He even threatened Jaden to share her naked photos and videos on social media. She reported Ben to the police a few days before Jaden went missing. She was afraid he'd post her naked photos and videos. Ben had approximately 30 photos and 13 videos of Jaden, which she did not want made public. On December 3rd, Jaden, you failed to return to the hostel for the night. Jaden is aware of the problems in his personal life. The staff attempted to find her. They contacted Samantha by phone, but she had no idea where her daughter was. The police received a missing persons report shortly after midnight on December 4th, 2013. I discovered that Jaden has personal issues. Investigators attempted to contact Ben to determine if he knew anything about her disappearance. He was aggressive and repeatedly hung up the phone, claiming he couldn't help Jaden and had no idea where he was. Jaden had a difficult childhood and occasionally quarreled with her family. She ran away from home several times but eventually returned. As a result, her disappearance did not seem unusual in the early hours of the investigation. On the same day, December 4th, police apprehended Ben Blakely. They took him to the police station, and it had nothing to do with Jason's disappearance. Jaden had reported Ben to the police a few days prior because she was concerned that he would post her intimate photos online. The investigators who spoke with him were unaware that the police were searching for Ben as a person of interest in the Jaden Parkinson disappearance case. He denied planning to post images of Jaden on the internet and was released on bail the same day. Samantha was distributing flyers featuring her daughter's photo. She also uses social media to raise awareness about the case in the hopes that someone has seen something or knows where Jaden is. Meanwhile, the police are checking surveillance cameras to find her last known location. They obtained CCTV footage from Jaden's hostel, which shows her leaving to meet Ben and never returning. The date was December 3rd. The next location where Jaden was seen was Oxford Railway Station. CCTV footage captures her walking inside with Ben. Nothing unusual is occurring in the video. After tracing their route, investigators discovered that Ben and Jaden took a train to Didcot, about 10 miles from Oxford. Jaden's last known location was the train station, and he did cut. The footage showed her and Ben exiting the building. Usually when Jaden ran away from home, she would contact someone from her family within a day or two to let them know she was fine. But this time was different. And Jaden did not contact her family or friends or post on social media. Since CCTV footage showed her boarding a train with Ben, he became the primary suspect in her disappearance. The police had no doubt that Ben knew where Jaden was and what had happened to her. The footage showed Ben returning to the train station alone, but no one saw Jaden alive again. A week later on December 10th, 2013, police arrested Ben Blakely. Investigators wanted to speak with him and find out where Jaden went after they left the train station building and Digcott together. 
It was also possible that Ben was holding her against her will somewhere. During the interrogation, Ben was very confident. He said he didn't know where his ex-girlfriend was. Ben called Jaden his ex-girlfriend. He claims that he and Jaden split up and she moved on to another man. Ben stated that's who the cops needed to talk to. He also stated that he didn't care where she was or what happened to her because they had split up and he now has a new girlfriend. He advised the police to check her social media to determine her location and who she was meeting with. Although Jaden remained missing, Ben Blakely was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. The police interviewed Jaden's friends to determine whether she could have gone somewhere. However, the investigators only discovered that Jaden became estranged from her friends after she began dating Ben. No one knew if she had a place to hide. During the ongoing search for Jaden, a taxi driver from Digcop provided crucial information to investigators. He said that around 1 a.m. on December 4th, he picked up a passenger along a dirt road. He described him as a young man carrying a large, heavy suitcase splattered with mud. He couldn't lift it and asked the taxi driver to assist him. All of these circumstances prompted the taxi driver to consider what was in the suitcase and whether he had witnessed the crime. Investigators discovered that the person who called the taxi used Ben Blakely's mobile phone. When the police questioned Ben again, the latter stated that he would not answer further questions. After analyzing his mobile phone's location records, the police discovered that Ben had visited several locations in Digcot, including an abandoned barn in the countryside where an attack took place because he picked him up that night. A team of investigators, criminologists, and dog handlers arrived to conduct an investigation. It was also revealed that Ben and Jaden had previously visited Didcot, where her mother lived. Next to the barn, the police discovered a bracelet similar to the one Jaden was wearing. The service dogs trained to find dead bodies began barking inside the barn. But Jason's body wasn't present, and it probably had something to do with Ben's suitcase when he got into the taxi. The police appealed to the public for assistance, urging anyone who saw a man carrying a large suitcase in the Didcot countryside to report it. At the same time, police went door to door, interviewing residents of the houses closest to the abandoned barn. The video from the train station shows that Ben and Jaden did not bring a suitcase. As a result, the investigators wanted to find out where Ben got this suitcase. But what if the taxi driver misidentified Ben? The police discovered the answer to this question on December 14th. Investigators discovered Ben Blakely, his grandmother, grandfather, and younger brother Jake living near the abandoned barn. When the police knocked on Ben's grandmother's door, the first question she asked was, are you hearing about the suitcase she stated that Ben had taken a suitcase from her a few days ago? He arrived in a hurry and said he needed a suitcase, then dumped its contents on the floor without explaining anything. Ben's grandmother says he returned it two days later and threw it in the barn. However, it was now dirty. She also mentioned two missing shovels, which reappeared in their original location. A thick layer of dirt had also settled on the shovels. Why does Ben need two shovels? Perhaps the man wasn't acting alone. Jaden was friends with 17-year-old Jake Blakely, and she met Ben through him. Witnesses stated that they saw Ben and Jake riding dirt bikes together. When the police began searching for Jaden, Jake Blakely was arrested on suspicion of complicity in the crime. They sent the suitcase that Ben had returned to his grandmother's barn to the laboratory for analysis. The police wanted to know if Jason's DNA was on it. Based on all available evidence, investigators concluded that Jaden was killed in an abandoned barn. After some time, she was placed in a suitcase and taken to another location where the perpetrator buried her. However, given the vastness of the fields surrounding him, finding Jason's body appeared to be a difficult task. The police used aviation in their investigation to determine the approximate location of Jaden's burial. They used aerial photography to identify 10 locations where the soil surface had recently changed significantly. The police investigated several locations but found no results. They could not locate Jason's body. Before the police searched all 10 locations of interest in the investigation, there was another breakthrough in the case. Jake Blakely began cooperating with the police, telling them to check his uncle's grave in a nearby cemetery. 
The cemetery next to All Saints Church in Digcott was one of the ten places where the surface had recently changed, but it was at the bottom of the list because a soil surface change in such places is not unusual. The police cordoned off the cemetery after receiving a note from Jake Blakely indicating that Jason's body could be in his uncle's grave. Detectives have never seen such a method for concealing a victim's body. According to reports in the English press, Ben and Jake's uncle was buried in 2006. The new circumstances surrounding this case have sparked widespread media coverage. It was the country's first crime in which the victim's body was already buried. The forensic experts set up a tent in the cemetery and began their work. After a while, Jason's family received the worst possible news. Her body was discovered in the grave of Ben and Jake Blakely, his uncle she was naked, and the police were unable to locate her clothing. She also had all of her jewelry removed. The forensic examination revealed that Jaden had been beaten before her death. Finger marks on her neck suggested strangulation. The pathologist determined that asphyxia was the official cause of her death. While awaiting trial in prison, Ben Blakely altered his behavior strategy. After speaking with the prison chaplain, he and his lawyer wrote a letter admitting that he was responsible for Jaden's death. However, Ben insisted that the crime was not premeditated. According to him, he pushed Jaden during an argument and she fell off a bridge near an abandoned barn. He tried but failed to bring her to her senses. He initially buried Jason's body in one location, but later moved it to the cemetery. He buried it in his uncle's grave. However, the autopsy revealed no signs of such a fall. Her face was injured with blunt force, and as previously stated, asphyxia was the cause of her death. It implied that Ben Blakely was lying to absolve himself of some responsibility for what had occurred. Jason's father died of heart problems before the trial began on June 23, 2014. When Blakely appeared in court, it was clear to everyone that he had no remorse for his actions. He acted provocatively and shouted insults, indicating that he was unconcerned about the fact that he had killed Jaden and her unborn child. Ben Blakely testified during the four-week trial that Burks was a violent and controlling boyfriend, and three of Blakely's previous girlfriends testified that he was controlling and violent to them while they were in a relationship. The jury heard that he would take their phones, hit them, and grab them by the throat if they responded or if he suspected they were cheating on him. The ginger-haired murderer's temper was on display during the trial. The judge warned him several times about his four-letter outbursts in the dock and on the witness stand, during which he swore and shouted at the prosecutor, Richard Latham. His rages became too much for Jaden's mother and other family members, forcing them to flee the courtroom in tears. It was also too much for Judge Patrick Eccles, who confined Ben to the cells and continued the trial in his absence for one day. Although Jake Blakely is under the age of 18, Judge Eccles lifted the usual prohibition on reporting a juvenile's name because he believed it was in the public interest to do so. Jake has pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice, but claims he believed he was burying weapons or dead animals at the time. Ben had promised his teenage sibling an Xbox game console and 100 pounds if he carried out the evil deed, according to the jury. The jury saw CCTV footage of Ben and Jaden entering the Oxford train station and boarding a train to Digcott. Blakely was also seen returning alone and looking down, attempting to hide his face. The prosecutor stated that the crime was premeditated. Blakely purposefully led Jaden to a location where no one would witness him killing her. What else could be the reason he took Jaden to an abandoned barn in another town? Jaden was eager to begin a new life after discovering she was pregnant. But Blakely was accustomed to having complete control over every aspect of her life, and he refused to let her go. He did not want to be a father either. Samantha Shrewsbury, Jaden's mother, supported the creation of a domestic violence registry. In an interview with Sky News, she stated, I don't want another mom to have to stand there and look at their daughter's body on a slab. I'll never forget it until the day I die. For a year before Jaden was killed, I thought he was after me. I hadn't expected it to be her. I assumed he wanted me out so he could manipulate her. He could get money from her. I recall him coming around one day after spitting at her and punching her in the face the previous day. He made it into the block of flats and was banging on the door. 
I refused to let him see Jaden, so he walked away and spat on me. Later that afternoon, Jaden went outside for a cigarette and I didn't see her for two weeks. He'd met her outside. She was at an age when she did not have any income or benefits. They were living rough everywhere. It became difficult to contact her. He'd cut up her SIM card or smash her phone. She didn't want to admit to herself that he was like that. Everyone had heard these stories before. She wanted to change him. He burned, beat, and starved her. She was a rebellious adolescent who didn't listen. I was told that since she was 16, it didn't matter where she went. If the police said it was fine for her to stay there, they didn't have to tell me where she was. I did not have a leg to stand on. However, when she was murdered, she was classified as a child. Where does that get lost? Why couldn't the police get her back home? She was safe with me. I believe she could have been helped if people thought she wasn't a bad kid. And I wasn't an angry mother with a misbehaving child on benefits who didn't deserve to be looked at or heard. I'm very angry with the government. It has to stop. Other girls were hurt before Jaden. If there was a register, she'd be sitting here with my grandchild right now. The register should be public and accessible to everyone, not just the police and social services. The number of times he was arrested. There would have been flags along the way, which could have saved her life. I'd also like to see a program in schools that promotes healthy relationships. Many people do not realize they are in a coercive or controlling relationship until it is too late. I simply want more protection for women like Jaden and the women who will become women in England. In my lifetime, a partner or ex-partner has killed one woman every week. I'm aware that I won't be able to eradicate it. But if I can prevent one girl from dying and one mother from feeling the way I do, Jaden's death will not be in vain. The jury deliberated for 20 hours before returning a verdict by a majority vote. Ben Blakely was found guilty of killing Jaden Parkinson on purpose by a vote of 11 to 1. On December 3rd, the judge told Ben Blakely you took Jaden Parkinson, a complicated but loving and vulnerable 17-year-old girl, into the open countryside near Upton in the dark of an early winter's evening you strangled her to death. The judge also stated that Blakely's unreasonably jealous treatment of Jaden included physical and emotional abuse during their relationship. You dominated and controlled her daily activities. The judge stated that you took her phone away so she could not contact anyone else. And when she arrived at the hostel, you insisted that she stay in her room, even prohibiting her from using the toilet and forcing her to urinate in a plastic bottle. Jaden was obsessed with you, her violent abuser, and found it difficult to emotionally separate from you. According to the judge, Jaden finally found the courage to end the relationship in November of last year, after Blakely threatened to post intimate photos online to humiliate her. Jake Blakely received three years in prison for perverting the course of justice. In July 2014, his older brother, Ben Blakely, was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The state of North Carolina, the birthplace of country blues and Cherokee Indians, is now a conservative and prosperous state in the northern South Atlantic region. In comparison to South Carolina, the state has a relatively low crime rate. When it does make the national news, it is usually because of snowstorms, tornadoes, or severe thunderstorms. The coast, the tropical storms and flooding, or acres of dense wildlife refuge, as well as the threat of wildfires and landslides, posed far greater danger than people. However, this does not always happen. On April 10, 2019, the storm was caused by 17-year-old Tristan Borlais. The teenager, who comes from a large religious family, brutally murdered his loved ones at their home in Deep Gap, North Carolina. On Wednesday evening, a young woman called emergency services to report a large amount of blood in her home, as well as three missing family members, her parents and her younger brother. She also mentioned that she couldn't reach them. Police officers responded to the call and drove to a deep gap about a mile from the Watauga and Wilkes County lines. When patrol officers arrived at the house, 
They discovered blood on the walkway leading to the house, on the mat by the front door, and a blood trail inside the house that stretched up the stairs. Officers searching the area outside discovered the body of a man covered in leaves under a hammock with several stab wounds. A little later, around 10.30 p.m., the family's pickup truck was discovered hidden in the woods, with a woman's body covered in a blanket and mulch bags on top. Senseless, rash domestic tragedy. Kristen's father, Jeff Bohr, was born on April 16, 1975. He served as pastor of the Pietistic Bible Fellowship Church, a conservative Protestant denomination with Mennonite roots. The boy grew up in an environment that emphasized the importance of personal piety and the sense of being constantly under God's strict and watchful eye. His upbringing was built on a serious and careful study of the Bible in meetings, as well as moral instruction. Any form of entertainment, including laughter and colorful clothing, was frowned upon. Good works charity, missionary work, love for the enemy, and the renunciation of all forms of violence were regarded as virtues. Jeffrey, Pastor Harry's son, absorbed all of these fundamentals. He was raised to be a kind, loving, gentle, and patient boy. Jeffrey worked as a summer employee at the Big Surf Water Park on Lake Ozark in Missouri, United States. On his first day at work, the young man met a charming, meek girl. Tanya May Tran was her name. They were the same age, shared similar beliefs, and grew up in a similar environment. Tanya, like Jeffrey, grew up in a family that prioritized Christian values. A patient, humble, and selfless girl saw the pious young man as the ideal future husband and father. She gave Jeffrey a picture of an elderly couple holding hands and told him, that will be us one day. Kathy Brown, Jeffrey's mother, prayed to God to give her son a wife who loved the Lord with all her heart, and she believed her prayers had been answered. The young lovers married, and their family became a reflection of the ideas in which they were raised. Tanya's photo was carefully placed in the family album, very quickly. Taylor, the young couple's first child, is an adorable girl, Three more children arrived one by one. Tristan was the parent's youngest son. Taylor became a true big sister to her siblings. She cared for, helped, and supported everyone, especially the girl who was friends with her younger brother. Tristan Taylor became his best and sole friend. Despite their age difference, they traveled everywhere together. They enjoyed sports, listening to music and playing pranks together. Pietism holds that the task of parenting is to establish God's kingdom in the child's heart. As the four children grew older, Jeffrey and Tanya decided to fulfill their Christian duty by adopting four more orphaned boys who were open, loving, and friendly. According to others, the family grew to eight children. Taylor, twins Kaya and Alexis, Misery, Owl, Stephen Meliku, and Tristan. According to the family's religious beliefs, children were not allowed to use cell phones or social media until a certain age, and asceticism needs and desires were encouraged. Boys were forbidden from dating girls until the end of high school, until the age of 18. Bible study and other religious activities were required. Otherwise, children grew up like any other boys and girls, with parents making no distinction between native and adopted children. Everyone received the same level of attention, care, and affection. The loving mother maintained a peaceful environment while keeping an eye on internal order. Brothers and sisters' relationships were marked by frequent prayer and good deeds. The couple believed that virtue should be cultivated through their own actions, and they taught their children mercy by example. When the people of Haiti were hit by a hurricane, Tanya sold her expensive wedding ring and donated the proceeds to a foundation that was building housing for the victims. In exchange, she purchased herself a simple, inexpensive ring. Taylor graduated high school in 2015 and moved to Boone to attend Appalachian State University. This event deeply affected Tristan. He had lost his only friend and was alone. Taylor returned home at the first opportunity, but now she had her own free time, leaving Tristan with the same old rules and routines. He had been rebelling against the restrictions imposed on him since childhood, as well as his parents' religious beliefs. He was irritated by the lack of a cell phone and the inability to communicate with his peers via social media, especially since such communication has become an essential part of modern teenagers' lives. Quarrels with Taylor's parents only increased after he left in December 2017, 
there were positive changes in the family's lives. Jeffrey, his wife, and their children relocated to a new home with a large lot in a deep gap. The house in Watauga County, North Carolina, was on a dirt road leading into a wooded area and was much larger than the previous home. Furthermore, the new home was only a short distance from Robin's Tanya's mother and the children's grandmother's home. Because of their close proximity, they could call on her at any time for assistance, and she looked after the youngest children. It was unclear whether the move had been as pleasant for Tristan as he had to change his school and surroundings. He attended Watauga High School and began participating in track and field. Other kids became summer camp counselors. At first glance, it appeared that there was never any trouble in the bar, lone household. But this wasn't the case. Tristan's behavior worsened over time. In 2018, the school required several consultations with a psychologist regarding anger issues and a lack of impulsive behavior control. By 2019, despite his exceptional abilities, the young man began to struggle with some school subjects, and these difficulties only grew with time. Before the move, he was a diligent student who was always involved in school life. However, after the move, he became an indifferent, withdrawn teenager who lost interest in his education. Tristan began to be late for classes and had no desire to learn at all. It got to the point where he would put on his headphones during class and sit with an absent-minded expression. Some teachers attempted to assist Tristan, and he even made contact, but everything ended with the same indifference and lack of interest. Furthermore, the young man did not always act appropriately at home. By this point, he had everything. He was constantly arguing with his parents about his own cell phone and social media access. Tristan spent a great deal of time on the internet. He identified as a musician on Instagram. Taylor was always interested in her siblings' lives and noticed that Tristan fought with his parents more frequently and argued with his mother about religious issues. She also learned about his other problems at school. The sister attempted to communicate with her brother, but the previous closeness was no longer present. After a while, the young man made friends with Evelyn Faith Jackson, a girl from the religious community. They began to meet, disregarding the prohibition on intimate relationships. They sometimes smoked forbidden plants, and Tristan complained about his mother, who discussed his behavior with him at night, leaving him tired and unable to concentrate in school. The young man was concerned that he had many flaws that prevented him from living up to his mother's expectations. She cannot be proud of him. I was told that he can be himself around his father, but not so much around his mother. On April 10, 2019, many secret details about Tristan's life were revealed. The barn where the goats were kept had surveillance cameras installed. Kristen's old cell phone, which he sometimes kept hidden from his parents, also served as an access point. On this particular day, Tanya took out her phone and read text messages in which her son was having sexual conversations with girls and discussing illegal drugs with them. Tristan was at school when he noticed his phone start blinking with incoming messages. In a family chat, Kristen's shocked parents informed him of the information found on her old phone. The same day, Kristen's English teacher, Sherry King, called his mother to complain about the teenager's grades and behavior. She later testified at trial that Tanya Borlas called her back and said she and her husband would be at school soon and would pick Tristan up early to discuss his grades. Sherry King told Tristan what her parents had said, which surprised him greatly. The couple left their youngest child with his grandmother and enrolled in middle school to deal with the situation. The entire ride home was silent. Tristan will testify at trial that the mother appeared tense and frowned constantly while looking through his phone. At home, there was an hour and a half long conversation. Tanya then texted her mother, informing her that Tristan was not upset that his phone and car keys had been taken away until his grades and behavior improved, and that she would be coming to pick up the younger child soon. The message was sent at 4 p.m., and the conversation appears to have continued thereafter. According to Kristen, he and his mother discussed the importance of doing well in school, cleanliness and relationships with girls, the dangers of illegal drugs, and the fact that she did not want him to study religions other than Christianity. He was forced to listen, and he realized how much he needed to be corrected. They even created a list of qualities he should possess in order to become a better person such as compassion and honesty. The police later discovered that Tristan claimed his mother approached him from behind, put her arm around his neck, and applied pressure, causing him to instinctively jump up, turn around, and elbow her. He claimed that his mother had never done such a thing, 
That's why he reacted as he did. His mother, startled by the blow, grabbed what he thought were scissors from a shelf and approached her son. In shock at what was happening, he stabbed her, thinking he was defending himself, and ran to his father for help. Later, a forensic examination will reveal no evidence that Kristen's mother strangled him. During the trial, the prosecution will show the jury photographs of Tanya's neck taken by the medical examiner, which show a broken neck bone. The psychologist, on the other hand, will demonstrate during the trial that, in his opinion, Tristan Borlase was mentally sane at the time of the crime, but had a severely impaired cognitive state, experiencing depersonalization and derealization, and believing events were unrealization, and believing events were unreal. However, the court and jury rejected the psychologist's assessment, determining Tristan to be a skilled manipulator and a socially dangerous person. Tristan claims he had no idea what was going on, why his father was fleeing, and why he stabbed him when he caught up. Despite the fact that he begged him for help, he remembered his father picking up a rock and saying, Tristan, don't. But he was certain that his father would rather see him killed than harm him. Neighbors later reported hearing loud screams on the board lost property around 5.30 p.m. That was Wednesday. After it was over, Tristan returned to the house and vomited, which the psychologist concluded indicated severe stress rather than cold-blooded, calculated murder. However, the jury disagreed with the psychologist's findings. After all, they were shown the forensic medical examiner's reports at trial. Jeffrey Borlase. His autopsy report revealed multiple stab wounds to his left chest and back, slash wounds to his arms and hands, and abrasions to his skull and forehead. Tanya Borlase's autopsy report revealed that she had multiple stab wounds, including those to her left chest, back and arm, as well as injuries that may have occurred when her neck was compressed. The findings suggest that the parents were defending themselves, not attacking. Furthermore, if Tristan felt threatened, he could flee from his mother. Even if the mother was the victim of a sudden lapse in judgment and a misguided sense of self-defense, the father's murder and subsequent actions appeared to be different. Tristan returned home, removed his mother's body, and hid it in the truck with a tarp. He then spent about an hour cleaning up the crime scene, including cleaning the porch outside the house with a hose. Tristan arrived at his grandmother's house at 8.30 p.m. to pick up his younger brother Robinson. This seemed incredibly strange. Tristan explained that his parents had an urgent need to go to the store and apologized for not having time to stop by and pick up his brother. Robin received a call about 20 minutes later from her other grandson, who complained that his parents were not answering the phone and had not come to pick him up from his part-time job, as they usually did. Grandma dialed Alexis and asked her to go get her brother. They agreed to meet at Jeffrey and Tanya's house to figure out what had happened. As they approached the house, Robin noticed blood on the porch, but because the couple raised animals, she wasn't too worried. She went inside the house to get a flashlight to check on the animals and discovered that there was blood everywhere. Alexis ran into the house at the time and reported finding a body under a hammock near the animal barn, and she believed she saw Tristan in a getaway car with blood on his face. Alexis summoned emergency services. The operator instructed her and all family members to lock themselves in the car and wait for police to arrive. Following several hours of waiting outside and speaking with officers, the police arrived 10 minutes later. They were all taken to the station, where they learned that Jeffrey and Tanya Borlase had been discovered dead. While investigating the crime scene, detectives discovered a computer interface in the home that linked the video surveillance system to the monitors. When the detectives saw a screen on the monitor with a grid of cameras broadcasting live video, they immediately requested a warrant to obtain the system servicing company's credentials. Meanwhile, Tristan contacted his girlfriend Evelyn and arrived at her house. She noticed he was worried about something and he had a few scratches on his face and arms. Tristan, on the other hand, is shorter. He had only argued with his parents and received the scratches while playing with his dog. Kristen's injuries were described by Evelyn as three scratches on his forehead, a hand wound, a cut on his finger, and a bruised fingernail. Tristan posted a photo of his injuries on Snapchat shortly after the crime, claiming that he was injured by his father's dog. According to his girlfriend, the photo matches the injuries she noticed on him that evening. Tristan stayed all night. They went to Walmart and McDonald's the next morning, saying they were going to school, but then changed their minds. Evelyn was convinced Tristan just wanted to get away from his parents for a while, so she invited him to stay with one of her relatives. He agreed, and they proceeded to another state. 
On April 11, Sheriff's Office personnel obtained the username and password to Borlase's home video surveillance system. They examined the camera footage and discovered the details of the crime. The police obtained a warrant for Kristen's arrest and turned over the vehicle's details. He allegedly drove away to the National Crime Information Center, where a search for the vehicle and subsequent pursuit began. Investigator Matthew learned that Tristan had been seen in Tennessee and began the paperwork for extraditing the alleged perpetrator. He asked Robin Christen's grandmother to accompany him to the apprehension so that he could speak to the young man in her presence, despite his youth. As they drove the car with Evelyn, Tristan noticed blue lights behind them. He sped up and told his friend that his parents had registered the car as stolen in order to find him. He sped down the highway, attempting to get away, but eventually gave in to his pursuers and pulled over. The Ford was surrounded by police cars. Evelyn was completely perplexed when she saw her boyfriend handcuffed and driven away in a squad car. The officers noticed that Tristan did not seem upset or agitated. The April 11, 2019 interview conducted by investigator Matthew was videotaped and audio recorded. The young man responded to all questions, admitted to the crime, and detailed his actions. He occasionally cried. Tristan, who was a month away from turning 18, was arrested without bail. A short time later, the sheriff's office obtained a warrant to investigate Tristan Snap's chat account and five of his cell phones, all of which may have contained information related to the crime. A search warrant was also issued for Orchard Road Home, where detectives discovered another phone, a keyboard and pen from a safe paper cups, a hammer, a straw knife, a red stain swab, eyeglasses, a kitchen towel, a hammock, a digital video recorder, a rug, miscellaneous papers, South Dakota, business cards, and boots. According to court documents, a search warrant was also issued for the Ford F-150 truck and a red stain swab laptop computer charger and steering wheel were seized. A search warrant was also issued for Tristan, his girlfriend, and Boone's home as the young man was spending the night there. According to court records, a pillowcase, a zippered sweatshirt, and a notebook were seized from the property. The findings of the investigations and searches assisted investigators in reconstructing the timeline of events down to the smallest detail. This method of self-defense was deemed untenable. The couple's funeral services took place on April 17, 2019. The ceremony was officiated by pastors William Krantz and Brad Gray of Bible Fellowship Church. Children who lost their parents at such a young age found the strength to write a touching obituary. Our parents never had the chance to live for themselves because they always lived for us. Jeff and Tanya have always made their parents happy and proud. Our parents made the world a better place, and we hope to carry on that legacy by passionately loving people and following Jesus. Taylor paid her first visit to her brother in prison following the funeral and was unimpressed by his behavior. Tristan was not only unrepentant, but he attempted to blame the family for what had occurred. Her sister got the impression that he was confident that he would regain his freedom sooner or later. Taylor became disgusted, turned around and left. Her second visit came on May 11. Kristen returned with Grandma Robin to celebrate her birthday, but the meeting was largely the same as the previous one. Her brother was praising the birthday party they had for him at the prison. Taylor found the behavior unacceptable, especially considering their parents' tragic deaths. Following this visit, the family decided to cut off all contact with Tristan. The trial began February 16, 2022. Tristan expressed regret during the trial. He agreed with everything his family had said about him and supported the decision to impose a permanent ban on contact to make the family feel safer. On March 3, Tristan Borlice was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder on all counts. Judge Horn noted that Tristan Borlice's mental health was a mitigating factor as the psychologist's report indicated that he was still suffering from anxiety and depression and had developed symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. Judge Horn did, however, state that the psychologist found no evidence of psychotic disorders. Although the anxiety and depression may have been exacerbated by the continued use of illegal drugs, the most unusual fact in this story is that neither Tristan, his family, his lawyer, nor he himself made any statements about the motives that led to the crime a pious family and a socially dangerous man using illegal drugs who did not fully understand the reasons for what happened or competently played the misunderstanding. On the one hand, there is a self-hating young man with low self-esteem, a history of depression, 
active anxiety symptoms, and a lack of qualified medical care. During the court session, it was mentioned that his mother helped him cope with panic attacks because she, too, was prone to them. One of the main provisions of pietistic pedagogy is that children burdened with original sin are immoral from birth, and therefore education and school should correct them, preparing them for correct piety, based behavior in life, by establishing strict discipline, and suppressing strict discipline, and suppressing children's self-consciousness. Strict love is supposedly beneficial. A child who may have inherited nervous system overreactivity grew up with strict boundaries, constantly feeling like he was not a godly enough person. Some people require more love than others due to their nature. According to his older sister's memories of the new brothers, the little boy was extremely jealous of their appearance, which drew the parents' attention. Rebellion came first, followed by depressed moods and feelings of worthlessness, as well as illicit weed, panic attacks, and depersonalization. Derealization occurs. He didn't accept his parents' religion. He couldn't be what his mother wanted him to be, or what he was supposed to be in need of improvement was that list of needed fixes that the two of them put together with his mother instead of looking for a good therapist. Is this the final straw? Was there any way to prevent such a senseless and merciless tragedy in a truly loving family? Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. A 16-year-old girl who lived in the same house as her parents and younger sisters fell asleep in her room and was discovered dead the next morning. The police quickly realized they were dealing with a murder, but none of her relatives heard anything that night. It took 31 years to solve the case, but no one expected this outcome. Fawn Cox was born in Kansas City, Missouri, on March 24, 1973. Her appearance quickly led her to have two more daughters. The family lived in a modest two-story home in a rough residential neighborhood. She helped her parents care for the younger children from an early age, attended church on a regular basis, and enjoyed swimming. When Fawn turned 16, she got a part-time job at a nearby amusement park. Her family was quite poor, and the girls tried to earn some money in their spare time after school. She spent the majority of her summer vacation in 1989 at work, mostly behind the cash register selling amusement ride tickets. Her mother and younger sister drove her home because taking public transportation from the park would have taken a long time. Fawn went to bed almost immediately after returning home because she had another day at work. The following morning, the girl slept on the second floor. She had a room. Her sisters usually slept in the next room. But that night, she was alone on the floor. Her younger sister, Amber, was babysitting for a familiar family. That night, Felicia, the other sister, chose to sleep on the first floor because it was cooler. It was a hot night, and the only air conditioner working was downstairs. Their parents were also sleeping on the first floor. The next morning, around 9 o'clock, the entire family awoke to the sound of Fawn's alarm clock, which she refused to turn off for some reason. Her younger sister and mother then went up to her room, where they were confronted with a horrific sight. Fawn lay on the bed with no sign of life, her neck was visibly bruised, she also had no pulse, her parents immediately called an ambulance, but they were unable to assist her. It was clear that Fawn had died hours before. After examining her body, medical experts determined that strangulation was the cause of death, and the girl had also been abused from the start. Even though Fawn was killed in her room in a small house with poor soundproofing, her parents and sister heard nothing, however, there was an explanation. The air conditioner on the first floor was old and extremely loud, drowning out all other sounds in the house. Fawn's sister noticed the only strange thing that night their poodle was acting anxiously and barking, but they paid little attention. This behavior was attributed to the dog's pregnancy. After investigating the scene, the police made several significant discoveries. Their theory was that the attacker or group entered the house through a second-story window that overlooked the backyard. An old trailer parked near the house could be easily used to climb up to the outbuilding's canopy, which was nearly level with the window. The window had been left open because there was no air conditioning on the second floor, and one had to deal with the heat in Fawn's room. The experts discovered the first important clues a few short hairs, small blood stains, and traces of semen on her bed sheet and sent them to the lab for analysis. In addition, several items were missing from the home, including radios, a Nintendo game console, and a stereo recorder. 
Several other items were discovered on the ground in front of the house, indicating that the burglar had thrown them out the window to take them with him but left them there for unknown reasons. Detectives also discovered that several items had been taken from a closet in an adjacent room on the second floor. They suspected the perpetrator was hiding in the closet while everyone else in the house slept. Normally, Fawn's sister slept in that room, but not this night. As a result, no one noticed the items on display. The police discovered another strange clue in old army cap in Fawn's room. All of her relatives said they had never seen her wearing it, so detectives assumed the killer had left the cap at the scene. Despite an impressive collection of evidence, police were unable to identify the suspects quickly. The issue is that in 1989, DNA forensics was relatively underdeveloped, and there were no shared genetic databases. At that time, Detective Benjamin Caldwell, who handled the case, put forward the main version of what happened in his opinion there could have been several assailants, and they must have known the house well. Not only did they know how to get to the second floor through the backyard in total darkness, but they must also have known the layout of the rooms. The next step for the police was to look for witnesses. They interviewed neighbors, friends, and relatives of Fawn, but all were inconclusive. The detectives had one weighty problem before them. The neighborhood in which the house was located was very poor, and criminal, various criminal gangs separated there, and their participants were quite difficult to bring to justice a month. After Fawn's murder, the case finally got off the ground. The police had a witness who pointed them to three suspects. This witness knew a number of important details that the police never divulged, so his story was taken seriously. The suspects were three teenagers, one of whom was in the same class as Fawn. They were arrested and questioned, but the boys denied being involved in the murder. While searching one of their homes, police discovered items taken from the victim's room. This was enough to charge all three with murder, but the detectives were still disappointed. First, the witness abruptly recanted and ceased cooperating with police. The second DNA analysis of blood, hair, and sperm found at the crime scene did not yield a clear match to the suspect's samples. During those years, experts were unable to determine an exact match between the samples, and all of their tests produced questionable results. In other words, the analysis failed to confirm a complete game or a guaranteed mismatch. Despite this, the police were able to obtain useful information from one of the detainees during one of the interrogations he confessed that he had indeed broken into Fawn's house that night and the company of other boys and stolen some things he painted how he made his way to the second floor through. The canopy of the canopy and even revealed unknown details according to him when he threw a tape recorder out the window its handle fell off the boy hid it under a nearby bush and the police did find the item in that very spot, except that the young man quickly retracted his statement and no longer cooperated with the investigation which would have prevented his confession from being used in court because of this, the police had to let the men go, and the investigation was at a standstill again. Most likely, the witnesses were simply intimidated, but without their testimony in court, the case had. Almost no chance all we know is that one of them spent eight months in jail for stealing items from Fawn's house. Since then, the case has been stored in a long drawer. The police reopened the investigation in the early 2000s. The first thing they did was upload DNA samples from the crime scene to the CODIS database, which had been created several years prior and contained DNA samples from people charged with serious crimes. Unfortunately, no matches were discovered for the Fawn killer. This database emerged as a result of significant scientific advances in DNA research. It also enabled the police to obtain DNA samples from the three original suspects and perform more advanced tests. This time, experts concluded unequivocally that the hair, sperm, and blood belonged to none of them. This was strange, given that the suspects were found in possession of Fawn's belongings. Detectives speculated that the three men had robbed her house at night, but there was another man with them who had abused and murdered the girl. All of this raised additional questions. Could it be that four criminals entered the house unnoticed and murdered Fawn, and as they fled the scene, the police still had no answers? Since then, the case has stalled again. With each passing year, the Fawn family has become increasingly skeptical that the murder will ever be solved. They continued to believe that those three suspects had been in their home that night and could have identified the murderer, but they never did. The only thing that could help them figure out the truth was a DNA sample kept in the police lab. Amber Fawn's younger sister revealed some disturbing details about the crime she expressed her thoughts on facts unknown to the police on a popular American forum for unsolved crimes. Over the last 20 years, the forum has built a solid reputation. 
and its members have assisted the police in a number of high-profile cases. Amber's identity has been verified and confirmed, so her post deserves attention. She worked as a nanny Monday through Friday and was only home during the day. On weekends, the girl slept in the very room on the second floor, where the burglars had sneaked in. The criminals would have been identified immediately. They would also have watched the house and waited until Fawn's mother and younger sister arrived to pick up the girl from work. Despite all of this, Amber's story did not bring the case any closer to being solved, but it was already 2018, and DNA research had advanced significantly. New analysis tools helped solve dozens, if not hundreds, of long-forgotten cases. Fawn's relatives saw it all and resented why the police were in no hurry to reopen the murder investigation. They kept talking to detectives about the case and each time they got the same answer extended DNA testing requires money, and the police have dozens of cases, so the relatives were left to wait for their turn and funding to come in, but they decided to take the initiative and launch a fundraiser. In 2019, the family wanted to cover the full cost of the DNA samples and also offered a $10,000 reward for any information that would lead to the perpetrator's capture due to the extensive media coverage of the case and numerous interviews given by the family many people who cared. Responded to requests for help the family quickly collected the necessary amount of money, but even here they were disappointed the police department refused to initiate this investigation at the expense of the relatives of the victim. The lead detective explained that there was bound to be a big problem in such a situation if the relatives of one victim could pay for such tests and expedite the results then hundreds of other families who have been searching for years for the murder of their loved ones should have the same right but it is simply impossible to implement such a thing in practice since only a few laboratories in the world conduct innovative DNA tests and with such a simultaneous influx of those wishing to do so their resources are simply not enough the leading company in this field is Parabon Nano Labs which we have already repeatedly mentioned in the other reels they have made tremendous progress in the study of DNA from finding a person's relatives from the smallest genetic samples to creating an approximate portrait of the owner of the DNA, it was this lab that was to take over the study of the samples left in Fawn's bedroom the night she was murdered. The girl's relatives suspected that the police were reluctant to pursue their case for another reason they were a low-income family from a bad neighborhood, and murder was not a top priority for investigators. In an interview, Sister Fawn stated that if it had been the murder of a wealthy or high-ranking family, all necessary investigations would have been conducted immediately. Unfortunately, they were unable to speed up the process, and the long-awaited breakthrough did not occur until late 2020, but the family was not prepared for such an outcome. The FBI provided funding for the police to send samples from Fawn's room to a laboratory. They began a thorough examination of the DNA and looked for possible relatives of the possessors. In November 2020, they focused primarily on the semen sample discovered at the murder scene. They were eventually able to identify the individual to whom that DNA belonged. It turned out to be Fawn's cousin, Donald Cox. Of course, this news shocked the entire family. Donald was 21 years old when Fawn died, and no one had considered his involvement. Nonetheless, Donald was a troubled man who was frequently incarcerated. He was tried for misdemeanors including theft and possession of illegal substances. Unfortunately, they did not collect DNA samples from such criminals during those years otherwise, this case would have been resolved much sooner. Donald died of an overdose in 2006, but the police looked into his death because the circumstances seemed suspicious. A sample of his DNA was preserved as a result of the investigation, but it was not entered into the FBI database because the man in question was a victim rather than a perpetrator. When the experts informed the police of their discovery, they matched the sample to the semen found at the murder scene and obtained a 100 match, despite the gravity of the situation. The relatives have received an answer to a question that has been bothering them for 31 years, but one crucial point remains in the story. The evidence suggested that the three original suspects had also been in the Fawn house that night. It was now clear how the perpetrators knew the house and the family's routines Donald was a frequent visitor and was familiar with all of these details. However, the police closed the case and no new charges were brought against the three men. Sister Fawn said she didn't see the point in getting them to confess. Even though the men were present in the house at night, they may not have witnessed the murder. Donald may have remained in the house alone and attacked Fawn only then. Felicia added that the three suspects had already paid for their actions during this time. While the case remained unsolved, 
the entire neighborhood was convinced of their guilt. According to Sister Fawn, as a result, they were treated extremely negatively with all of the consequences that would follow. Their lives were effectively destroyed. Furthermore, after the case was closed, it was revealed that the police had first learned about the suspects from the family of one of their relatives. They discovered a Nintendo set top box among his belongings and remembered that it had been stolen from Fawn's home. It was on the news and everyone in the neighborhood was aware of the details. In any case, it is impossible to prove their guilt and the victim's relatives now know the killer's name. He lived for 17 years without being punished for his actions, as if nothing had happened. He communicated with his family, but his drug addiction eventually drove him to death, and he no longer posed a threat to anyone. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will talk about what happened in 2007. Kelsey Smith, 18, mysteriously disappeared after going to the store in Kansas, United States. What happened to Kelsey drew media attention and CCTV footage helped solve the case. Kelsey Ann Smith was born May 3rd, 1989 in Overland Park, Johnson County, Kansas. Kelsey was the fifth child of Greg and Missy Smith. She graduated from Shawnee Mission West High School on May 24, 2007, and was excited to start college in the fall. People recognized her as an outgoing and friendly individual. Her sense of humor left no one indifferent. She was a member of a marching band and played clarinet. Kelsey worked at an AMC movie theater on June 2, 2007. She had another shift. Missy, her mother, was leaving for a friend's wedding that morning, unaware that her family's life would be forever changed and that she would never see her daughter alive again. Missy said her goodbyes to Kelsey before leaving. Kelsey drove to work in the car her parents gave her. Her morning shift concluded without incident. After work, she went to see her father and sister, Lindsay. They visited an amusement park together. It had been a wonderful day, but it did not end well. Kelsey had decided to go shopping around 6 p.m. She asked her sister if she wanted to keep her company, but she declined. Kelsey left the house alone and drove to the nearest Target. Before leaving, she told her father, Greg, about her plans and expressed her love for him. Greg, a police officer, adored his children. The man taught them basic self-defense techniques and advised them to always take precautions. Kelsey called her mother, who was returning from a friend's wedding, about an hour later to say she was going shopping, they spoke briefly before agreeing to meet at home. After a while, John Kelsey's boyfriend arrived at Smith's home. John was one of the guys who boosted Greg's confidence. He frequently spent time at their house, and everyone expected their relationship to develop into something more. Kelsey went shopping that evening for a gift for John. The latter attempted to call her but was unable to get through. He went to her house, but she was not present. Greg tried calling his daughter, but she did not answer. Greg, a police officer, became concerned after several unsuccessful attempts to contact Kelsey. He tried to remain calm, but as a father, he became increasingly concerned with each passing minute. Greg began calling his daughter's friends, but no one knew where Kelsey was or why she wasn't returning calls and texts. Kelsey was unlike her peers. She always called her family even if she was a little late. After a while, John and Kelsey's sister Lindsay got into their car and began driving around the area, hoping to locate Kelsey's car. What if she gets into an accident? Perhaps the police pulled her over for speeding. They first inspect the parking lots of various stores. In one of those, they noticed a Buick belonging to Kelsey. She informed her father that she was going to the Target store. However, they discovered her car near another store. John checked the car but Kelsey wasn't present. Lindsay called her father to say they had found Kelsey's car. Greg warned them not to touch anything because the car could be a potential crime scene. After all, if this was the case, it was critical not to destroy any evidence that may have been left there. Greg contacted the police to report his daughter missing. The police conducted an official investigation. The detectives immediately arrived at the location where John and Lindsay discovered Kelsey's car. 
Greg and everyone else noticed something odd right away. Her car was not in the Target parking lot. It was next to another store in a dimly lit area of the parking lot. The detectives carefully examined the car, hoping to discover anything useful about Kelsey. But all they found inside was a package of gift wrapping paper and the gift the girl had bought for her boyfriend, John. There was nothing inside the car that suggested a crime. There were no signs of struggle. There was no trace of blood or anything like that. The keys were under the driver's seat. But then, the detective noticed something strange and suspicious. They noticed some fabric that resembled a t-shirt sticking out of the trunk, causing anxiety in his heart. Greg opened the trunk. It was empty. Kelsey was not present. She bought a gift for John at Target. That meant she was present at some point. The forensic experts thoroughly examined the car and discovered a thumbprint on the seatbelt. It didn't belong to Kelsey or anyone who had access to the car. Kelsey had recently graduated from high school and was preparing to attend the University of Kansas to become a veterinarian. She was always an excellent student. Kelsey was an ambitious and cheerful young lady. She had her entire life ahead of her. But now she had mysteriously vanished and her family was desperate for answers. The police continued their work. However, other than an unidentified fingerprint, there was no evidence that her car was a crime scene. It appeared that someone had just left the car in this parking lot. The detectives went to Target to gather new information about Kelsey's disappearance. CCTV footage could answer some questions. By the time the officers arrived, the store had already closed. Despite the fact that it was nearly 11 p.m., they were able to locate the person who let them in and showed them the recordings. The police spent several hours at the monitors, watching Kelsey's every move, but her trip to the store was routine. She found the necessary items, paid for them, and proceeded to the parking lot. There was no indication that anything was wrong. While at the store, Kelsey did not argue or speak with anyone. She remained calm and left there alone. But here's what appears strange. Kelsey got into her car and drove in the opposite direction of her house for some reason. The recording quality was poor, making it impossible to see any details. As a result, a number of new and important questions emerged. Why didn't Kelsey go home as scheduled? Did she drive the car herself? Could she have concealed her own free will? Before dawn, Greg and Missy went to the police station, where detectives questioned them. As a cop, Greg was aware that this was a common practice. When investigating such cases, detectives must rule out the possibility that someone in the family is involved in the crime. He knew that if he and Missy answered the questions quickly, they would no longer be suspects and the police would be able to focus on other leads. The couple answered all of the questions. Kelsey's parents were not the suspects. The police wanted to investigate the next person for his involvement in Kelsey. His disappearance was caused by her boyfriend, John. After all, Kelsey had spent the majority of her free time with him over the last few days. He was the last person she had contact with. They needed to know where John had been before he went into Kelly's house and informed her father that he couldn't contact her partners, which is frequently linked to what happened to their soulmate. As a result, the detectives decided to put pressure on the suspect. They began asking him the same but differently phrased questions to see how he would respond and whether he would change his story. It lasted approximately two hours. But John insisted that he was not involved in Kelly's disappearance and that their relationship was fine. He answered all of their questions and let the detectives examine his phone. The officers were inclined to believe that John was not lying and had no involvement in Kelsey's disappearance. Still, the detectives did not remove him from the suspect list. Kelsey's family could not simply sit and wait so they began an unofficial investigation. Greg was well aware that if his daughter had been abducted, the chances of finding her alive decreased with each passing hour. Greg, Missy, and John gathered willing volunteers and divided them into groups to search the area. Each volunteer carried a bundle of printed missing person flyers and walked around the designated streets, asking if anyone had seen Kelsey. Greg also called radio stations and requested some airtime. He inquired about his daughter's disappearance and advised anyone with any relevant information to contact the police or the Smith family. 
An hour after the radio stations reported Kelsey's disappearance, TV channels broadcast the news. It improved the odds of finding Kelsey as soon as possible. Her classmates joined the search. They moved from one door to another. Perhaps someone from the house heard or saw something suspicious, or something that did not appear suspicious at first glance but could aid in the investigation. Any information was critical. One of the questions the police had to answer was where Kelsey was for the three hours between when she left Target and when John and Lindsay found her car. Need to answer this question, the investigators returned to the surveillance cameras. The parking lot where they discovered Kelsey's vehicle belonged to another store. Fortunately, there were cameras there as well. However, due to the poor quality of the recordings and insufficient lighting in that area of the parking lot, the detectives were unable to see anything that would help them determine where Kelsey had gone. They observed how her car drove into an unlit area of the parking lot, after which the headlights turned off. The driver exited the vehicle and drove away shortly after, but it was just a silhouette of a person. It was unclear if it was Kelsey or someone else. The police were disappointed. Kelsey's family thought it was a good sign. The family members understood that she had no reason to hide. The most important thing to them was finding Kelsey alive. The police had no new leads yet, so they decided to look at the target surveillance camera footage again. However, the detectives now use higher quality monitors. They retracted Kelsey's every move while she was in the store, but she discovered nothing suspicious. Eight, everything appeared normal. Kelsey purchased the necessary items and exited the store like any other customer parking lot. What could have happened there to cause Kelsey's disappearance? Despite the poor recording quality, the detectives discovered a suspicious detail. After leaving the store, Kelsey went to the parking lot to park her car and opened the back door to store the purchased items. Then she approached the driver's door. At that moment, the investigator noticed a blurry spot following her. The police believed Kelsey had been attacked when she got into the car, indicating an abduction. The investigators repeatedly watched the recording. However, due to the viewing angle and recording quality, they were unable to see the full picture. The door closed in about 15 seconds, and the car left the parking lot. Perhaps her car turned in the opposite direction from her house because she wasn't driving, or someone threatened her. Detectives didn't want to tell Kelsey's parents that their daughter had most likely been abducted. The police had only a video recording of the abduction as evidence. However, it was impossible to see who did it. This person wore a white t-shirt and dark shorts. Thus, the investigators returned to the target CCTV footage. But this time, they're hoping to see someone in a white t-shirt and dark shorts. And then they noticed something new. A man in a white t-shirt and dark shorts followed Kelsey everywhere she went. He maintained his distance so Kelsey would not suspect anything but he was always present. It was clear that this man was following Kelsey. When Kelsey approached the checkout to pay for the goods, he made his way to the exit without hurry. He obviously left the store first and waited for her in the parking lot. Soon after, the police were able to obtain a clearer image of his face. It wasn't a perfect quality, but they hoped someone could recognize this person. The police asked the community for help in identifying the man. The number of calls with potential leads surpassed 1,000. It took a long time to review this amount of data. Detectives attempted to filter out information that was unlikely to be relevant to the investigation. The police interrogated several people who resembled this man, but none of them were the one they needed to locate. The breakthrough in this case came after the police located Kelsey's phone. After she vanished, her phone was found in a wooded area near Longview Lake, Missouri about 15 miles from Target. By this point, the FBI had joined the investigation. They focused the search in the area where Kelsey's phone was last active. Around 200 people took part in it. Kelsey was discovered four days after her kidnapping and only 45 minutes after her cell phone company provided information about her cell phone activity that is worth paying close attention to. We will address this issue later. Unfortunately, she had died. The criminal attempted to conceal the evidence of the crime by hiding her body beneath the leaves and tree branches. Kelsey was naked, revealing the motive for this crime. Her belongings were a few feet from her. 
During the forensic examination, the experts determined that Kelsey died from strangulation. The criminal committed suicide with her own belt. The police had to deliver the worst news of her parents' lives. Kelsey's death devastated her family and friends. The criminal was still out there, and the police needed to find him as soon as possible because they feared he would kidnap another person. At this stage of the investigation, the police only had CCTV footage. As a result, the researchers decided to conduct another study on them. Knowing that someone had abandoned Kelsey's car in the parking lot at 9.17 p.m., the officers decided to look into what was going on in the Target parking lot at the same time. They saw a man rush up to a dark pickup truck parked in the parking lot, get inside, and drive away. It was around 9.22 p.m., however, it is possible that this was just a coincidence unrelated to the case. The pickup truck left the Target parking lot after it had already gotten dark. But what if the person driving the car arrived during daylight hours? The investigators reviewed the recording, which confirmed their assumptions. The blue pickup truck arrived in the Target parking lot at 6.55 p.m. Kelsey pulled into the parking lot a minute later parking next to this pickup truck by some evil coincidence. Perhaps that was the first time the criminal saw her. The police released images of the pickup truck and the man who was following Kelsey in the hopes that someone could identify him. And it resulted in people calling the police station to say they knew the man in the picture. One of the callers introduced himself as a colleague and the other as a friend. Both callers gave the same name Edwin Hall. He was 26 years old, owned a pickup truck, was married with a son. The police investigated Hall's past and discovered that, while he had no adult convictions, he did have a juvenile record for threatening his adoptive sister with a bread knife when he was 15 years old. If Hall was the one who kidnapped and murdered Kelsey Smith, he may have attempted to flee after his image appeared in the media. As a result, the police went to his home right away. When the cops arrived, they noticed Hall packing things into his car. He intended to flee with his family, but the police apprehended him first. They arrested Edwin Hall and transported him to a police station for questioning. He told detectives that he had no involvement in Kelsey Smith's disappearance and death. He said he had no idea who she was. However, everyone knew he was lying because Target's CCTV footage clearly showed Hall following Kelsey. When they told him about the recording, they were able to refute his claims. He admitted that he watched Kelsey because he admired her legs. However, Edwin continued to deny any contact with Kelsey after she left the store. He agreed to give the police his DNA sample and fingerprints so that he would be removed from the suspect list. Hall was certain he'd left no trace. However, he was mistaken in believing that his thumbprint matched those found on the seatbelt and Kelsey's car. This information directly linked Hall to the kidnapping and death of Kelsey Smith. After all, there was no other explanation for his fingerprint on the seatbelt. Hence, regardless of what Edwin Hall said. The police knew he was the one who approached Kelsey in the parking lot. After the detectives informed him of the fingerprint match, he decided not to wait for the DNA results and confessed all. To avoid the death sentence. Hall agreed to reveal all of the details of the crime he committed. He stated that he liked Kelsey when he saw her in the Target parking lot. Hall began following her while she was shopping and then waited until she reached the car. After this, he pulled out his gun and attacked her. Hall pushed her into her car and took her to a wooded area outside the city. There, he told Kelsey to undress and eventually killed her because he was afraid she'd tell him everything. Then Hall hid Kelsey's body beneath branches and leaves and drove away. After leaving Kelsey's scar in a nearby parking lot, he returned to Target, where he had previously parked his pickup truck, and drove home. Missy and Greg Smith stated that following Kelsey's death, they noticed that the majority of violent crimes targeted children and young adults. We wanted to stop this from happening to others. Missy Smith stated that with that goal in mind, they developed safety awareness seminars. Greg Smith was a police officer when his daughter died. So he applied the training methods he learned in the military to a civilian environment. The Kelsey Smith Act was passed in Kansas in 2009, and similar laws exist in 23 other states. However, in 2016, 
it failed to pass the United States House of Representatives. Members of Congress who voted against the bill cited privacy concerns and the ability for law enforcement to access information without subpoenas. The Smith state that only one location will be released, so texts, pictures, and phone calls would be prohibited. For 13 years, the couple has been advocating for change in Congress. One thing keeps them going. It's Kelsey, without a doubt. Greg Smith identified Kelsey as an 18-year-old recent high school graduate who walked out of a Target in Overland Park and vanished. It took a cell phone company four days to release her phone's location information, once it did. Police discovered her body within 45 minutes. The Smiths dedicated their lives to enacting legislation to speed up the process for other families. It would have saved you days of searching for her and not knowing if your child was still alive or what her fate was. Missy Smith stated that if law enforcement determines that an emergency exists, the Kelsey Smith Act requires wireless communication providers to disclose a device's location information. It also grants the phone company immunity for doing so. Overall, it serves as a tool for law enforcement. We live in a technological age, so why not give them every tool they need to find someone? According to Greg Smith, the legislation states that the information should be released if officers believe the phone was used to call 911 within the previous 48 hours, or if there is reason to believe someone is in danger of death or serious physical harm. In September 2008, the jury found Edwin Hall guilty of all charges. During the trial, he apologized to Kelsey's family and expressed deep regret. The court sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Kelsey, who would have turned 34 on May 3rd, has become the face of a movement to force telecommunications providers to be more responsive in emergency situations, particularly as GPS and cell phone technology have improved and evolved over the last 16 years. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The summer of 1985 in London was sunny and warm with a strong sense of nature and tranquility. However, at 3.30 a.m. on August 7, Jeremy Bomber, heir to the White House farm, received a sudden phone call at his home. The young man, barely awake, answered the phone, wondering who could have called him so early. On the other end of the line was his foster father, whose voice was unusual. He was clearly in panic, and Jeremy couldn't understand his father's words. He tried to concentrate and figure out what had happened. However, his son's efforts proved futile. And then there was an eerie silence on the other end of the line. The last thing Jeremy heard from his father was, Your sister has gone crazy. She has a gun and an alarm. Jeremy wasted no time in calling the police and reporting the frightening conversation emphasizing the potential danger from his sister. Officers arrived on the scene an hour and a half late after receiving the call. They were followed by Jeremy. There was an unusual silence and stillness all around. This was suspicious given what the son of one of the farm owners had told the police over the phone. Because it was suspected that weapons were involved, the English police chose not to rush inside, as was their professional practice. The effectiveness of such actions can be debated endlessly but it is ultimately up to the English authorities. When they arrive on the scene of call, they are usually unarmed and do not interfere with the situation, instead waiting for it to resolve itself or for a special unit to intervene. The police officers kept their distance from the house while Jeremy remained close by. They asked him to tell them what had happened at the bumper house the night before. According to Jeremy, they had sat around the dinner table as a family the previous evening. There was a minor misunderstanding at the end of dinner, but nothing major that could have resulted in such a tragedy. He also stated that he had left his weapons, a pistol, and a .22 caliber carbine with his parents. Both weapons were serviceable and loaded. A special team arrived on the scene and discovered that all doors and windows in the house were locked, with the exception of the window in the master bedroom on the first floor. They spent two hours using a loudspeaker to communicate with someone inside the house, but all they heard was a dog barking. It had been nearly three hours since the first police officers arrived on scene. At 8 a.m., the SWAT team finally entered the house where an eerie silence reigned. 
The group carefully moved around the first floor, inspecting each room. As they approached the kitchen, they saw chaos, including an overturned chair on the floor. A dead man lay in a pool of blood. It was Neville Bamber, Jeremy's father. Neville's body appeared disfigured, with bruises and abrasions on his arms and face, as well as a broken nose and jaw, indicating that he had fought hard. There was no way to help him. His chances of survival were completely eliminated after eight bullet wounds, six of which were to the head. On one of the kitchen surfaces, there is a telephone with its receiver removed, as well as several rounds of point caliber ammunition. The image shocked the police officers, but they had to proceed to thoroughly investigate the entire house. It was decided to inspect the first floor first, and then proceed to the second floor if no other family members were present. Every step had to be carefully controlled to avoid creating unnecessary noise. However, the creaky floor of the old house made this a difficult task. There was nobody else on the first floor. However, on the second floor, there are two bedrooms. Four more bodies were discovered. June Sheila and two young boys, Daniel and Nicholas, were all killed by gunshots. June had been shot seven times while Daniel and Nicholas had five and three shots, respectively. Sheila lay on the doorstep of her parents' bedroom with two bullet wounds under her chin and a gun in her hands. A total of 25 bullets were used to kill five family members. The number of bullet points prompted questions. Was it possible that someone had deliberately removed the bummers? And what was the motivation? Could it be that the real culprit was attempting to mislead the police? Answers to all of these questions were required. So authorities immediately began investigating and researching the history of all deceased family members. The history of the Bamber family. The County of Essex, with its natural beauty, is close to the noise in crowded London, where there is always an endless stream of tourists flowing. However, it retains its value in the eyes of the locals, providing a respite from the hectic capital. The county invites you to unwind in both your body and soul. Enjoy the fresh air, walk through endless green meadows, taste crystal, clear lake water, explore medieval castles, and immerse yourself in fascinating stories. These benefits most likely drew the Bamber family to Essex, where they chose to settle. June and Neville realized their dream when they purchased White House Farm. June married Neville in 1949 when she was 25 years old, and the couple moved to their farm with the goal of raising a strong, prosperous family. Neville, a Royal Air Force veteran who had completed his service, was appointed magistrate of the local court. However, fate dealt the couple several unexpected twists and turns. June's lengthy attempts to conceive proved futile. They did not give up, however, and instead chose to place their two children in an orphanage. So Sheila, at three months old, and later Jeremy, at six months old, join their family. June and Neville were exemplary parents, filling their children's days with love and care. Their children received an excellent education from them in prestigious private schools. The Bummers' financial situation was extremely prosperous, allowing them to give their children every opportunity. Despite his brilliant education, Jeremy had a withdrawn personality and preferred solitude since childhood. His tendency to rebelliousness was evident in elementary school, where he performed poorly prompting his parents to send him to boarding school in 1970. When Jeremy was nine years old, English boarding schools were rigid, and he quickly realized that he would face strict discipline. The years at boarding school were difficult, but they may have helped shape Jeremy's character for the better. After excelling at university, he became more relaxed, and his parents were proud of him. After graduating from university, Jeremy's father, Neville, offered him a job on a farm in England, the young man accepted the offer right away, and in 1982, he returned from his journey that began after completing his studies. His parents provided him with comfortable living conditions, including a cottage, a car, and a decent salary. They also expected him to help them in their old age. Despite outward family, Jeremy experienced tensions due to religious differences. June, a deeply religious woman, experienced intense emotions because her children did not share her religious beliefs. Her attempts to lead them to faith were futile. She became depressed as a result of difficulties in her family relationships and frustration. She received treatment that included the use of electroshock, which was then considered a method of dealing with mental illness. Sheila Caffell and Neville's daughter had a significant impact on her mother's depression. Unlike her calmer brother Jeremy, 
She was fascinated by the fashion industry and wished to become a model. But June flatly denied the idea, saying she didn't want to hear about her daughter getting involved in show business. These were just a few of Sheila's many surprises for her parents. When she announced she was pregnant at the age of 17, June was faced with a difficult decision. Either forbid her daughter from having a child out of wedlock, which was religiously unacceptable, or force her to have an abortion, which is also forbidden in the Christian world. In the end, June absolved herself of all responsibility and instructed Sheila to make the decision herself, but in such a way that no one in their family would ever know she had terminated the pregnancy. As a result, the mother and adopted daughter's relationship deteriorated. In 1977, despite her parents' objections, Sheila married Colin Campbell, the father of her first unborn child. The young men formed a family and had twins, Nicholas and Daniel. However, after a while, Sheila began to suspect her husband of infidelity and filed for divorce. This had a significant effect on her mental health. Sheila spent several months in a psychiatric hospital where she received electroshock therapy just like her mother. Meanwhile, Sheila's sons were sent to an orphanage where they spent nearly two years. Sheila's health only deteriorated. She became anxious, frequently expressing a desire to end her and her children's lives, claiming that they were under the influence of Satan. She had paranoid schizophrenia, and Jeremy used to cause a lot of problems for his parents. He settled down and was content with his life on the farm. Sheila reunited with her ex-husband Colin in 1985, and the two took their sons from the orphanage. In August, Sheila and her children were invited to meet her parents at the Bamboo House. They planned to stay for a week, after which Colin and the boys would travel to Norway. He brought Sheila and the kids to the farm, and on Tuesday, August 6, 1985, Everyone congregated at the lovely White House farmhouse. It ended up being the Bamber family's last dinner. The Bummer's funeral took place a few days after the tragedy, and Jeremy, of course, attended. It was a difficult and bitter situation for him. He cried a lot and was stunned by what had happened. But it was on this day that the investigation took a new direction. Jeremy's strange behavior was noticed, and relatives of the Bomber family reported it to authorities. During breaks between bouts of grief and tears, he would say ridiculous phrases about himself as the boss. Those around him noticed a smile on his face, an unusual smile, but one typical of a contented winner. All of these observations and remarks were reported to the authorities, who decided to conduct a more thorough investigation. On this ill-fated evening, everything seemed perfect. A family dinner, a cheerful atmosphere, and a delicious meal. However, one comment made by Neville in June changed everything. The parents suggested that Sheila return the children to the orphanage, emphasizing her inability to provide them with a proper upbringing. This provocative suggestion irritated Sheila, who reacted angrily, stating that she was already thinking about it and would make her own decision. The warm atmosphere of the evening was disrupted. At 9.30 p.m., Jeremy went home. At the same time, Barbara Wilson, the Bamboo Farm secretary, called about a work-related issue. When Neville answered the phone, Barbara noticed he was irritable. There were several loud voices in the background. People appeared to be arguing excitedly. Barbara was taken aback by the atmosphere, as such occurrences were uncommon among bummers. She was unable to determine the cause of the conflict. However, Neville abruptly terminated the conversation and hung up the phone. The next morning, all of the family members in the house had been shot. Jeremy was the only surviving member of the family, and he couldn't hold back his tears. The investigators were sensitive to Jeremy's emotions and gave him time to recover before beginning interviews. Before leaving the house, Jeremy shared all of the available information, including his sister's life difficulties and the dinner conflict on the evening of August 6. Given her mental state, Sheila's crime appears to be a desperate and most likely unconscious act. Under the influence of a parental remark, she couldn't take the new invasion of her privacy and lost her mind, so she turned to gun violence, shooting the bummers, her children, and herself. Investigators were certain that was what occurred. During an inspection of the house, it was discovered that the crime that destroyed almost the entire family was committed by the Bamber's mentally unstable adopted daughter, Shelia. This was demonstrated by the weapon discovered lying on her body pointing upwards toward her chin. The detective's subsequent actions appear absurd. The police decided to clean up the house and organized an unusual process of burning the bloody bedding and carpets 
on which the bodies were lying. The police wanted to rid Jeremy of the horrible memories of what had happened, and the weapon found at the scene, which could be used as evidence, was picked up by the officer with his bare hands. To avoid jumping to conclusions when reopening the investigation, the scene needed to be thoroughly examined. The first step was for detectives to inspect the weapon. Several people's fingerprints were found on the barrel, including the investigator, who appeared to pick up an important piece of evidence without gloves. The presence of Sheila and Jeremy's prints raised no questions. Jeremy confirmed that it was his hunting gun. He'd bought it legally. Sheila's fingerprints as a suspect in this crime were quite expected. However, it is important to note that the alleged perpetrator was shot twice in different parts of her body. How did she come to take her own life? And that's when things became clear. Julie, Jeremy's girlfriend, began to question his innocence. She contacted the investigators and provided them with some interesting information. On the night of August 7, Jeremy called her to report problems at the farm. However, when Julie attempted to learn more, Jeremy abruptly hung up. She also recalled Ames complaining to her several times before the tragedy about his family's fatigue with his in-laws. However, the most shocking aspect of her testimony concerned the bomber's will. It turns out that the bombers had left a will stating that all of their property would go to their children after their deaths and that their mother would rewrite their share in favor of the twins, Sheila. This fact turned Jeremy against his sister. He did not like this prospect, and he openly discussed it with his friend. Furthermore, Neville's will stated that Jeremy would have to work on the farm to receive his share of the inheritance. But the worst part was when Julie overheard him say that Jeremy fantasized about murdering his family and blaming it on the mentally ill Sheila. He showed some acting talent by portraying himself as a witness to the tragic drama in front of the police officers. According to Julie, she told the police about it not only to assist with the investigation, but also out of a desire for revenge. After learning about Jeremy's mistress, Jeremy gave the police the name of a possible suspect in an attempt to cover his tracks and divert the detective's attention away from him. He went after a plumber he allegedly hired to work on the property. However, this cunning plan proved ineffective. The plumber was discovered and interrogated, but his alibi was strong. The plumber not only did not understand why he was being questioned about the crime, but he also provided clear evidence that he was not present at the time of the incident. As a result, the suspect list was reduced to just one. Jeremy Bamber, despite his temporary detention, the lack of concrete evidence resulted in his release. Furthermore, the police did not limit his travel abroad. Although it was known that following the inheritance, Jeremy's financial situation had improved significantly. Soon, he had left England for a vacation in central France, and a few days later, he easily sold his father's car. Jeremy's cousins demanded that the theory that Sheila murdered her family be reconsidered. They went to the police and the media, and the deputy director of the SID once ordered the Bamber cousins to leave his office when they asked him to consider that James Bamber had orchestrated the entire thing. After that, one of the brothers decided to investigate the scene in secret from the others. His strong doubts about Sheila's involvement in the murder prompted him to seek additional evidence. By then, Jeremy had gotten the keys to his parents' house and was living there alone. His cousin made it through the door and around every corner of the house, hoping to find new evidence and his search was fruitful. In one of the closets, he discovered an unexpected item, a silencer for a two-caliber carbine with bloodstains. It was something that prompted him to draw new conclusions. The weapon's length, including the installed silencer, indicated that the assailant would be unable to turn it on himself and shoot himself. This implied that Sheila could not have been involved in the crime. After being shot twice and bleeding, she would not have been able to remove the silencer and hide it deep in the closet. But, assuming she fired without this additional device, a new question arises. Why were there bloodstains on the end of the silencer? Thus, it only confirmed that it had been installed on the carbine at the time of the crime. On September 29, Jeremy returned home and was immediately arrested and charged with the Bamboo family's murder. The trial, which lasted 18 days, started on October 3, 1986, at Chelmsford Crown Court. Jeremy Bamber appeared arrogant as he took his seat in the darkness. Throughout the trial, prosecutors charged him with lying. The station's telephone technicians confirmed that Bamber's home phone line was busy that night.
The medical examiner testified at trial that key injuries on Neville's body discovered by experts included several bruises, indicating that the elderly man resisted blows. The medical examiner concluded that Neville had been beaten with the same point by a two-caliber carbine. However, given Sheila's frailty and short stature, it is unlikely that she could have caused such severe injuries to her father before his death. It is more likely that Jeremy was capable of such an action. Neville's body was covered in bruises, and it was clear that Sheila had taken some blows during the fight. However, her body showed no signs of beatings or bruises. Jeremy's lawyers insisted that Sheila, despite her mental problems, was physically fit and capable of committing a crime. Her gun experience and excellent shooting skills were strong evidence that she could have committed the crime. They also noticed that Sheila's blood was fresher than that of other family members, which led them to believe that she had first massacred her family before killing herself. This could have been due to a realization of her actions, or, as the defense lawyer suggested, a reaction to the approaching police officers. After hearing these theories, the prosecution categorically rejected them. The silencer was discovered in the closet, along with Sheila's blood, but, logically, it should have been on the carbine. These statements were unquestionable. The defense was in a difficult position, with no additional arguments to counter the prosecution's case. The prosecution claims that Jeremy's anger at learning of the divided will motivated him to commit the crime. He planned the bloodbath for financial reasons. On the day of the incident, the housekeeper saw Sheila and noticed nothing unusual about her behavior the day before. Two employees had seen her with the children and reported that she was happy and adequate. Barbara Wilson, the farm clerk, testified that she called Neville around 9.30 p.m. and believed she had ended an argument. Barbara reported that Neville was upset and appeared to hang up in frustration, which he had never done before. In her opinion, he was a calm man. Between half past 10 and 10 o'clock, Jeremy left his in-laws and went home. Late at night, he returned on the bicycle he had borrowed from his mother a few days before the events, steering clear of the main road to avoid being seen. Making use of an open window in a first-floor room, when Jeremy got inside, he discovered a pre-prepared and loaded gun. When he entered his parents' bedroom, he fired two shots that killed Jane. Then he pointed the gun at Neville, but his father awoke and attempted to defend himself. A struggle ensued, and the father and son went downstairs. Jeremy was able to kill his father in the kitchen. He then returned to the bedroom and killed Sheila and her children to make it appear that his sister was responsible for the crime. Jeremy placed the carbine in the dead Sheila's hands. He then returned to his bike and rode home. He first called his friend Julie, almost gave himself away with excitement, and then called the police to report his father allegedly calling. This call also prompted questions about the investigation. If Neville was in danger, he would have probably called the police rather than his son and the phone in the bamboo house was not covered in blood. Even though, according to Jeremy's testimony, the father was most likely injured at the time of the call. This indicated that the telephone receiver in the house had been removed for staging. Jeremy's own actions also raised suspicions. Why didn't he rush to the scene after his father called him? After all, this was his family. Based on all of the known facts and assumptions, the jury retired to deliberate on its decision. Before doing so, the judge asked the jury three main questions. Who should be believed, Julie Mugford or Jeremy Bamber? It was also important to determine whether they were convinced that Sheila had not committed the crime. The judge emphasized that this issue was related to another critical question. Was the second fatal shot fired at Sheila with a silencer? If the answer is yes, it eliminates the possibility that she committed the shooting. Finally, Neville Bamber called his son in the middle of the night. The lack of such a call undermined Jason's entire version of events. On October 28, after more than nine hours of deliberation, the jury unanimously found Jason Bomber guilty by a majority vote that was close to the minimum required for conviction. He received five life sentences in prison without the possibility of parole. Douglas Hurd, the Home Secretary, ruled in 1988 that Bamber should not be released. The case remains a source of contention. Despite the lack of direct evidence proving Jeremy Bamber's guilt, he is serving his sentence, and there is speculation that a miscarriage of justice occurred, with his sister Sheila Bomber insisting on his innocence through appeals. His lawyer claims that the judgment was skewed due to Jeremy's aggressive behavior in court. 
Jeremy Bamber believes there is no evidence of his guilt, and there are numerous unexplained points in the case. Tests on Sheila's hands were not performed. There was police misconduct at the scene, and Jeremy's ex-girlfriend may have retaliated. Bamber requested a trial, which was held in 1991, but much of the physical evidence was destroyed by a police officer in 1996. Jeremy's defense team described it as a disgrace. In 1997, a DNA test revealed the presence of Sheila and June's blood in the silencer, but the results were complicated and ambiguous. In 2012, gun experts from the US and UK argued that the injuries on the bodies were inconsistent with the use of a silencer. In 2015, Jeremy Bamber filed an appeal requesting that all evidence be turned over to the defense under the guise of a lawyer, for which he was sentenced to 14 years in prison for fraud, seeking evidence of his innocence. Bamber created websites to discuss the case and offered a large reward for evidence that could overturn his conviction. The Bomber family's conviction, the Bomber family's case continues to draw public attention, raising questions about the verdict's accuracy. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In 2012, at the Summer Olympics in London, a young Puerto Rican boxer named Felix Vertijo Sanchez shone brightly. He was dubbed a diamond, one of his country's most promising athletes, and was expected to win championships and gold medals. Then it appeared to everyone that this talented and motivated young man would achieve great things in sports. In 2021, the boxer's name appeared in all of the world's media, but this time in the Criminal Chronicles section. This story is about a teenage attachment that turned into an addiction and resulted in a terrible tragedy, as well as how the author of the main knockout of 2014 who was praised and promoted by two-time Olympic champion Vasily Lomachenko nearly received a death sentence, but was eventually sentenced to life in prison. It is worth noting that, despite the presence of irrefutable evidence and confessions from the boxer's accomplice, he continues to refuse to plead guilty. The future world boxing star was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in 1993. Born on May 19, he grew up in a large, modest family and developed an early fondness for port. True in childhood. He intended to make baseball a part of his life, but a funny incident changed everything. When the boy was nine years old, a family friend came to see them with his son of the same age. The boys were playing in the yard when they suddenly got into a fight. Parents separated the children, and the future athlete's father advised him that if he wants to fight someone in the future, he should wear boxing gloves. Following that fight, Felix was taken to a local gym at his request, where the boy fell in love with boxing, as he later admitted after the first training session. At the age of 16, he won the Pan American Junior Championship. A year later, he won his country's championship, and a year after that, he competed in the Olympic Games in London, reaching the quarterfinals. In the same year, he began his successful professional wrestling career. Vertigo competed in 29 fights, winning 27 of them convincingly, and in 2014 he was named the author of the best knockout in a fight against Sergio Villanueva. Felix won his first championship belt, the WBU Latino title, a year later and defended it six more times over the next two years. Everyone who witnessed the fight was certain that this young man would leave his mark on the history of world boxing. Meet Quichla Rodriguez. The girl was born in San Juan in November of 1993. Her full birth name is Quichla Marlene Rodriguez Ortiz. Her parents, Josie and Kyla Rodriguez, shared another daughter, Belize Nicole, and they also raised Kyla's son, Jonathan. Quichla, who had a previous marriage with a woman, grew up to be an open and sociable girl. She excelled in school and adored animals, with aspirations of becoming a veterinarian in the future. Her best friend was her sister, Elise, to whom she confided all of her secrets and concerns. Kishla attended the same school as Felix Verdejo, who was her age. Young people have known each other since childhood, and in adolescence, they formed a romantic relationship. In 2011, Rodriguez's parents divorced and separated. Kyla moved to Florida with relatives, 
while her daughters, who were already adults, chose to remain in San Juan. Despite the fact that each of the sisters had long since lived their own lives, they remained in close contact and informed each other of everything that happened to them. At the age of 18, a promising boxer who had already competed in the Olympic Games had an affair with a young schoolgirl and aspiring model named Elisa Maria Santiago Sierra. At the time, the girl was only 14 years old and still in school. Even so, she had big plans for the future with a promising and world-renowned athlete. In addition, Eliza's parents were not opposed to the relationship. Felix, an attractive and talented boxer who has always had a large fan base and is on his way to becoming a star, was literally bathed in the rays of fame and surrounded by female attention. He did not pass up the opportunity to write a novel or have a side affair. In addition, despite his serious relationship with Eliza, he continued to meet with his school friend Kishla, whose sister barely informed her mother Kayla Rodriguez, who was aware of the affair and did not approve of it. In addition, the situation was very unclear. On the one hand, Eliza considered herself the only woman, while the athlete's great love was planning their wedding and making long-term plans for their future together. On the other hand, Kishla was aware that the lover had a fiancé, but Felix refused to let her go. Furthermore, he was her first great love, and the naive girl secretly hoped to be the one. In 2016, the boxer married Eliza, who was barely 19 years old at the time. Eliza was already a well-known model, with tens of thousands of social media followers, and had recently opened her own beauty studio for eyelash extensions. In August of the same year, just a few months after the wedding, the athlete was involved in a serious car accident while rushing on his motorcycle. He was rushed to the hospital with serious head injuries, bruises, and lacerations. His trainer, Ricky Marquez, was concerned that his talented charge would go off the rails at the peak of his career. Despite the disappointing prognosis, Felix recovered quickly and returned to the ring. In September 2019, the boxer posted a photo of himself with Elise, who was pregnant for a long time, on his social media profile. In the photo's comment, he wrote, Soon I will meet my daddy's princess, and a month later, he announced the birth of a daughter named Miranda Verdejo Santiago. The young man in public appeared to be a devoted husband, a caring father, and an excellent family man. But, hidden from his wife, he continued to meet with Kishla, who refused to let go. As Eliza later admitted, she suspected her husband was cheating on her. But every time he made a tearful vow to leave his mistress, Kishla tried to end the painful relationship, but Felix refused to let her go. She had no other men because the boxer threatened that if he discovered that Kishla had someone who was unsuitable for her and her chosen one, Kishla, who had fallen in love with Vertigo since high school, would continue to love him despite everything. Rodriguez, as planned, decided to devote her life to animal care and accepted a position at a veterinary medicine and aesthetic center. Colleagues described her as conscientious, hardworking, and responsible. She lived with two dogs and a cat, which he adored. In 2020, Eliza discovered her husband's correspondence with several mistresses, including Kishla. The wife scandalized her husband and threw him out of the house, threatening to file for divorce and forbidding him from seeing their daughter. Eliza's threats had some effect. Furthermore, the athlete's career at the time was in serious decline, with unnecessary problems that he didn't need for a while. He stopped seeing Rodriguez, but Felix refused to let her go. Kishla attempted to control almost every step after a few months of secret visits, and in April 2021, she discovered she was pregnant. She purchased a rapid test from the drugstore, which only confirmed her fears. She first called her sister, who was aware of her complicated relationship with the athlete, and explained everything. Abortion was out of the question because Kishla was already 27 years old and ready to have a child, even if it meant raising it on her own. A few days later, Kishla broke the news to her child's father, hoping in her heart that he would accept it, but Felix was not pleased, to say the least. He became enraged and told his mistress that she should see a doctor, and if the pregnancy was confirmed, she would need to have an abortion. Rodriguez responded with a firm refusal, but the boxer began to threaten and insist. Felix stated that an illegitimate child will eventually destroy his reputation, which he cannot allow. Following Kishla's hospital visit, her pregnancy was confirmed, and she now had a certificate to prove it. She called Felix and told him everything, making him furious. 
Felix yelled and demanded that Kishla immediately get rid of the child, but she flatly refused. The athlete then decided to go undercover, claiming that he did not believe her and wanted to personally inspect the issued medical certificate. He invited Kishla to a meeting in the evening in a crowded location, which did not surprise her given that they always tried not to draw attention to themselves and did not stand in front of anyone. A few days before the meeting, the boxer visited his old friend, Luis Antonio Cadiz, who worked in a local machine shop and had connections to the criminal underworld, selling illegal drugs. Felix briefly explained the situation and requested assistance in getting rid of his pregnant mistress. Luis had previously been in the field of vision for the police and faced the prospect of imprisonment. It didn't scare him, but the athlete persisted, confident that everything would go well and that the cops would never come after them. Furthermore, Felix promised him a substantial monetary reward, and Luis agreed. Felix called Kishla and said he wanted to meet her on the evening of April 29 to confirm her pregnancy and decide what to do next. Kishla called her sister back right after speaking with her lover, telling her everything. She remained hopeful that Felix would accept her child and not insist on an abortion. However, the situation is not particularly alarming. She was aware that the boyfriend had threatened her sister, and she was concerned that he would not do anything to her. Marilise called her mother and expressed her concern. Even with their combined efforts, they were unable to persuade Kishla to cancel the fateful meeting. Rodriguez arrived at the meeting on time, driving her own Kia Forte and carrying a doctor's note. Vir de Ho arrived there in his pickup truck. In the back, Louis was hiding. Kishla immediately got into the athlete's car and showed him the test results. He mentioned terminating the pregnancy again, but Kishla, crying, refused. Against this backdrop, the couple began to argue violently, leading to shouting before Felix suddenly hit Kishlin in the head with his fist, causing him to lose consciousness. Until Kishla regained consciousness, Felix injected her with a syringe containing a large dose of illegal substances that Luis had obtained at his request. Then, he and his accomplice carried her to the back of the car, where pieces of wire and a concrete block had already been prepared. The men tipped Rodriguez up, attached the load, and then covered her with a tarp to ensure that no one saw anything. Felix then returned to the pickup truck while his accomplice took the wheel of the cashless vehicle. They drove together to the bridge that crosses the San Jose Lagoon. It was almost deserted at night, and the men made certain no one could see them through Kishla, who was still alive in the water. However, they decided to fire a few test shots in pursuit, using the firearms they had brought with them, so that the victim would not have a chance. After finishing the massacre, each of the perpetrators returned home. Kishla and his co-workers were the first to become concerned when she failed to appear at the veterinary medicine and aesthetic center the following day. Kishla has always been a responsible person who would never skip work without informing anyone. Because she didn't answer the phone, it was decided to call her sister and find out what happened. After several unsuccessful attempts to contact her sister, she went to her home. No one answered the door, but Marilise had a spare key, so she was able to enter without difficulty. However, she was met only by hungry animals who hadn't eaten in nearly 24 hours. Bear Elise was already panicking because she realized something terrible or irreversible had happened to Kishla. She immediately called her mother, told her everything, and then informed the police about her suspicions and threats against her sister. She also called Felix, but he said he had spent the previous evening and night at home with his family and had not attended any meetings. The missing girl's mother boarded the first flight from Florida to San Juan. She suspected that her lover had taken her daughter to a private clinic and paid for an abortion without her consent. Kyla didn't want to consider the fact that cash flow was no longer viable. The first step was to question the missing girls, their neighbors, and co-workers, but they saw nothing suspicious and were unable to provide any useful information for the investigation. In parallel, messages about Rodriguez's disappearance were posted on popular social networks with requests for responses from anyone who knew anything about her fate or current location. The case quickly gained widespread attention, and when it was revealed that the missing girl was in a long-term relationship with a famous athlete and was expecting a child with him, reporters lined up to interview any of Rodriguez's family members. The relatives did not hold back and openly express their suspicions, including blaming Felix for the incident. On April 30, Kishla's car was discovered abandoned on the east side of the city. She has her documents and personal belongings inside, 
No signs of struggle were discovered in the interior, giving a slim chance of finding its owner alive. On May 1, a passerby on the lagoon bridge noticed a strange shape in the shallow water that resembled a human body. He informed the police, who quickly recovered the body of a young woman from the water, presumably the same one the entire city had been looking for for several days. Members of the Rod, his family, who arrived to identify the body, hoped to the very end that it was not Kishla. However, their hopes were not realized. The body had been in the water for a few days and had changed significantly. However, the girl was easily identified by a remarkable tattoo on her arm. When news of the gruesome discovery reached the press, city residents revolted and began to hold spontaneous rallies, demanding punishment for those responsible who were detained and taken to the police station for questioning on the same day. However, the athlete categorically denied his involvement, claiming that on the night of Kishla's disappearance, he was at home with his family because there was no evidence to charge him. Felix was released under his own recognizance. One of the key witnesses was the athlete's legal wife, who admitted during the initial interrogation that she was aware of his affair with Kishla, but had only recently learned of her rival's pregnancy. Furthermore, she did not confirm her husband's alibi, claiming that he was not home on the night of the murder. The first thing investigators did was review traffic surveillance footage on the way to the bridge from which Kishla was thrown. That's how they discovered Felix's pickup truck and the victim's car driving behind each other. However, the Kia Forte was clearly not driven by its owner. On the same day, the boxer's car was seized for examination, and some of the deceased hair was discovered in it. Lewis was the first to surrender to police, promising to tell the whole truth in exchange for a lighter sentence. Felix was also arrested, but he refused to cooperate with the investigation, did not answer questions, and continued to deny his guilt. Despite the presence of irrefutable evidence, Felix was apprehended with a firearm that he used to shoot the victim from the bridge and for which he had a valid permit. Furthermore, a cell phone check reveals that Felix Lewis and Kishla were in the same location on that fateful night. Kishla's final farewell took place on May 8, and the funeral ceremony made national headlines. It was a type of action that called for the perpetrators of the tragedy to be punished to the fullest extent of the law while also drawing public attention to the issue of gender violence. The coffin containing Rodriguez's body was transported to the cemetery in a white carriage, over which white flower petals were thrown from the air, rather than the traditional hearse. Many well-known Puerto Ricans, including show business stars, athletes, politicians, and public figures, have spoken out about the high-profile case in which Verdejo was charged with carjacking, kidnapping, premeditated murder, and murder of an unborn child, each of these crimes carried the death penalty. However, the relatives of the deceased requested from the start that the court sentence the killer to life in prison so that he could suffer in captivity for the rest of his life. The hearing was repeatedly postponed due to the global coronavirus pandemic, but in the spring of 2021, the trial was held virtually. The court determined that the crime was committed by a group of people through prior conspiracy with particular cruelty to a pregnant woman. The chain of events of that night, as well as the details of the crime, could be reconstructed, thanks primarily to Lewis' testimony, who did not deny guilt. He admitted that, at the request of a friend, he obtained the drug for injection and brought a wire and a concrete block to dispose of the body. But Felix insisted on his lack of involvement in the case. Although his words had no significant impact on the situation, the boxer's wife, who testified in court almost immediately after her husband's arrest, filed for divorce and attempted to distance herself from what was going on, focusing on the development of his business and raising a young daughter instead. According to some reports, Lisa Santiago recently remarried. Elisa admitted in an interview that she had received numerous anonymous calls and messages containing death threats, as well as death wishes for her and Miranda. Many believe the athlete's spouse was the organizer of the crime but no evidence was found in summer 2023. It became clear that the jury, having reviewed all of the evidence and heard testimony from all of the witnesses, was finally ready to announce the final verdict. Felix Verdejo and his accomplice Louis Cadiz were found guilty of all of the charges against them. Despite this, the killers have yet to be sentenced. The next court hearing is set for mid, November 2023. Most likely, both men involved in Kishla Rodriguez's and her unborn child's deaths will be sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole.
Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. After Hannah Potts, 23, went missing, the FBI launched an investigation. The case received a lot of media attention, and the revelations about the mysterious disappearance shocked many people. Hannah's family had no idea who would ultimately be charged. Hannah and her large family lived in Gibson County, Indiana, a southwestern American state. Many of the residents, including the Potts family, were farmers. They had their own small farm, which Hannah's parents considered a good and safe place to work, live, and raise their children. It was indeed a safe environment. But, as you know, things can change. The summer of 2020 marked a watershed moment for the Potts family, forever altering their lives. Hannah couldn't sleep on the nights of July 23rd and 24. She told her mother that she was going to walk around the farm, look at the animals and possibly take some photos. She then grabbed her phone and camera, exited the house and headed to the barn. Hannah's family discovered she was not at home in the morning and a post on her Facebook page shocked everyone. She posted a video clip based on the image that was recorded in the dark because the image is a black screen throughout the video and she was saying, Mom, are you there? Hello. Mom, if you can hear me, please say something. I really need to hear your voice. Something happened. I was out taking photos of animals, and this guy appeared out of nowhere. He's the same guy I saw in the maroon car yesterday morning. He grabbed me and pushed me inside the truck. Oh, God. Where will he take me? Mom, please consider Hannah's point of view. He's black about Jerry's height. On the jury I work with, his voice is deep, and the way he referred to me as baby girl sent shivers down my spine. I do not like it. Please, Mom, if you're there, could you say something to me? I'm in a room with a little light. There are four walls. I don't think they know I have the phone, so I'll have to tell the cops everything you're going to show them in the videos, so maybe they'll find me. I do not know where he is. Where did he say this? What exactly did he say? He mentioned something about Ohio. God, I love you, Mom. Tell Dad that I love him, too. Please take care of Gigi for me. Please. If I do not make it back. I love you. I really love you. Hannah's parents immediately contacted the police, recognizing the gravity of the situation and the fact that even minutes can change everything. The FBI became involved in the case. The video quickly gained traction on social media. Hannah's kidnapping was covered by all of the country's major television stations on the same day. Extensive media and social media coverage helped attract a large number of volunteers who, along with the Potts family, distributed several thousand informational flyers on the first day, stating that Hannah was last seen at home around 2 a.m. She wore a gray shirt and sports pants. It was also stated that the person who abducted her was driving a maroon vehicle. The police appealed to anyone with information to come forward. Hannah's family used every available resource to find her. One of these resources was social media, which allowed information about the kidnapping to spread rapidly. Hannah had a twin sister named Lauren, and she posted a request for help with a broken heart. I never imagined I would be posting something like this. I need help. Please share this post with your Facebook friends. Share this photo. Please help us. My twin sister Hannah posted a video this morning describing how she was kidnapped. If you have seen or heard from her, Please contact Princeton, Indiana, police or my family. Hannah, I miss you. Please come home. When the FBI attempted to track Hannah's cell phone, they discovered that on the day of her abduction, a cell tower located about a few miles from the Potts family home received a signal from her phone. Hannah posted the video to her Facebook page around 6 a.m. She was already being held hostage at the time, and a cell tower near the house was still picking up her phone signal. This meant Hannah was being held in a room close to her family's home. The police were desperately looking for a man driving a maroon car, but it was impossible to find a man who fit that description within a five-mile radius of the Potts family home while researching Hannah's life 
and determining whether anyone she knew was involved in her disappearance. Detectives discovered that prior to her disappearance, she had been in close contact with Maria Hopper, a 34-year-old woman who lives just a mile away. When investigators arrived to speak with Maria, she confirmed that she knew Hannah but had last seen her a few days prior to the abduction. It looked like another dead end. However, when police obtained a report from a cell phone carrier and gained access to Hannah's social media page, where she posted her heartbreaking plea, it became clear that Maria Hopper lied when she claimed to have seen Hannah a few days before the abduction. Hannah disappeared in the early hours of July 24th. Two days later, on the morning of July 26th, several police officers arrived at Maria's house and she once again told them she had no idea where Hannah was. Maria's boyfriend, 45-year-old Joshua Thomas, was also present, and he told police that he knew nothing about Hannah. Officers asked Maria for permission to look around the house. The woman reluctantly gave her consent, but immediately stated that Hannah was not in her home. Except for the stairs in the kitchen that lead to the basement, the police found nothing suspicious. Maria stated that there were only unnecessary items in the basement. However, law enforcement officials decided to inspect the basement firsthand. Among the dusty items in the basement, the police discovered a sheet of plywood that was unlike anything else. There was no dust on it, and it appeared that this sheet of plywood had not been in the basement as long as the other items. The plywood appears to be blocking the passage to another area of the basement. As one of the officers began to move it away, Maria Hopper made a significant announcement. But first, we need to return to Hannah's recording. When the video was shared on social media, people immediately noticed Hannah's strange and illogical behavior she recorded a six-minute video. Many people questioned why she was wasting time recording the video instead of calling 911. Why didn't the kidnapper search her or take her phone? What was she going to photograph at the farm at 2 a.m.? While recording the message, Hannah initially claimed she was kidnapped by a man, but after a few minutes, she is heard saying it appears there were multiple kidnappers. She then used social media, so she had internet access at the location where she was being held and could have pinpointed her exact location. For some reason, she didn't. Of course, the authorities were aware of all of these strange occurrences. However, because everyone behaves differently under stress, the investigation was underway, and Hannah's disappearance was presumed to be a kidnapping until proven otherwise. The truth was revealed when the police obtained Hannah and Maria Hopper's correspondence. When the officer asked to see what was behind a sheet of plywood in Maria's basement, she revealed that Hannah was hiding there. The police officer pushed the plywood aside and directed her to approach him. When Hannah entered the light, the officer noticed that she had fully functional handcuffs on her right wrist and shackles on her ankles. The young woman immediately admitted to police officers that she had not been kidnapped and was sitting in the basement of her own free will. Hannah had planned her own kidnapping with Maria Hopper and Joshua Thomas assisting her. This was clear from their social media interactions. The tone, content, and context of the messages read like a fantasy fiction story. The police filled out the arrest records. All three were brought to the police station for further investigation. Of course, everyone wanted to know why she did it. Hannah informed the investigators that she was writing a book and had decided to stage her own kidnapping as inspiration and to learn how kidnapped victims feel. Maria and Joshua were characters in her story who helped her keep everything organized. They hid her in their basement, brought her food and drinks, and, per Hannah's instructions, destroyed her cell phone so the police couldn't find it. Hannah's heartbreaking video on Facebook was pre-recorded, and she said she rehearsed for about a week before recording it. No one in her family knew what she was up to. After the truth was revealed, the Potts family apologized to everyone who assisted with the search. And to everyone who was concerned for Hannah, her sister, Brittany, issued a public apology on her social media page. It particularly included these words, as word spreads that Hannah has been found. I need to make a public statement about it. I neither publicly disowned nor wish to have any future contact with my sister. She's dead to me. I hope she is prosecuted to the full extent of the law. My family is deeply embarrassed and hurt by her actions, 
and the fact that she attempted to blame this on someone of color. I hope no black man driving a maroon car was targeted because of her Blanton lie. She has caused a great deal of grief for my family and others. Shame on you, Hannah. You made my six-year-old son cry, believing that something bad had happened to you. My six-year-old baby loved you so much. I hope you are prosecuted to the full extent. I have no words. I just feel like I owe an apology to the public. I am very angry and embarrassed. While in the basement of her friend's house, Hannah kept a personal journal in which she revealed that she was aware that her social media posts would go viral. Hannah Potts was charged with making false reports of a kidnapping. Miss Potts' actions are criminal in nature. She had many people in her family and community concerned about her personal health and safety. Gibson County Prosecutor Michael Cochran stated in a news release that by providing a false description of the alleged abductor, she risked involving innocent people. Finally, the number of hours spent by multiple law enforcement agencies during this period of limited resources cannot be recovered. This callous disregard for others simply cannot be tolerated. His statement concluded that Maria Hopper and Joshua Thomas were charged with perjury and concealing information during a police interview. Hopper admitted to taking pots from her home and lying about harboring her. Thomas also admitted to knowing about the kidnapping hoax and the presence of pots in the house. All three were released on bail and remained at large pending trial. Hannah Potts pleaded guilty in September 2020 to knowingly filing a false kidnapping report. She was sentenced to one year's probation and 120 hours of community service. Joshua Thomas and Maria Hopper also received probationary sentences. Many people who are familiar with this story believe Hannah was not only looking for inspiration, devising a plan for her own abduction, but also wanted to create a stir around her person, laying the groundwork for successful book sales. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The events in this video occurred in the city of Duluth, which is in northern Georgia. In April 2005, Jennifer Wilbanks disappeared just four days before her wedding. Hundreds of people came searching for her, and the story of her disappearance captured the attention of the international media. Many women fantasize about marrying the person they love. They believe that this grand occasion will be unique in their lives, so they want the wedding ceremony to be at least as good as everyone else's. Making a guest list, selecting a venue, designing a menu, and purchasing a wedding gown were all exciting experiences. Jennifer Wilbanks, 32, has gone through Jennifer Carol Wilbanks was born February 28, 1973. She has lived in Georgia all of her life where she has family, friends, and worked. It was in Duluth that she met her 32-year-old fiancé, John Mason. John, like his family as a whole, was financially successful. The Masons operated a private medical clinic in Duluth. His friends described him as a kind and caring man who was always willing to help others in need. John and Jennifer had been dating for a year and seemed like the ideal couple. Everyone who knew them was overjoyed when they announced that they were getting married. The wedding preparations went well for them. The swanky ceremony, to which several hundred guests had been invited, was set for April 30, 2005, a Saturday. However, four days before the wedding, on Tuesday, April 26, John Mason reported Jennifer's disappearance to police. He explained that she had gone for an evening run and had never returned. He tried to find her on his own, but when he couldn't, he turned to law enforcement for assistance. The next day, April 27th, a search was launched involving over 300 police officers and volunteers. They searched the woods and bodies of water along Jennifer's planned route. In such cases, every minute counts, so the police involved officers who were supposed to be off-duty. On the same day, April 27th, one of the search teams discovered potential clues including clothing, sneakers, and a strand of long, dark hair. All of the findings were sent to the laboratory for analysis. Jennifer's family posted and distributed flyers featuring her image in the hopes that someone would have seen her or had valuable information for the investigation. 
the media became involved in covering the story. Additionally, billboards with Jennifer's image appeared throughout the city. The police checked the house where she lived with John, but it was mostly a formality. Detectives discovered nothing suspicious in the couple's home. So on Thursday, April 28th, Major Donald Woodruff of the Duluth Police Department announced that Jennifer Wilbank's disappearance was being investigated as a criminal case, with the FBI and Georgia Bureau of Investigation involved. A second day of searching produced no results either. There was no sign of Jennifer. Her family was shocked by what had happened and did everything they could. They asked radio and television stations to publicize Jennifer's disappearance, implying that she had been kidnapped and taken out of state. They begged the possible kidnapper to let her go. The cable news network swarmed around the incident like flies on a pie. Where was Jennifer? Did something bad happen? She did not take her person's keys. She planned to marry in four days at a grand wedding with 28 chaperones and 600 guests. Jennifer's style did not include not calling her family or sobbing during press conferences and interviews due to stress. In this photo, an unhappy groom, John Mason, is comforting his bride's mother. Those who watch real crime videos on a regular basis, as well as those involved in Jennifer's disappearance, have most likely already solved this case mentally. Answer a single question for yourself. Have you figured out who will appear in the document? John was the last person to see Jennifer alive, and when the investigation yielded no results, suspicion fell on him. The detectives decided to find out who was hiding behind the guise of a law-abiding do-gooder who went to church every Sunday and, according to his friends, couldn't kill a fly. The man was asked to take a lie detector test, but he refused. Instead, he took a private polygraph test in front of his lawyer, and the results were given to the police. However, such strange and unusual behavior only heightened detectives' suspicions about John Mason. The test results provided to the police did not definitively answer the question of whether John was involved in the disappearance of his fiancée. Detectives conducted a more thorough search of the couple's home to determine whether he had any motive to get rid of Jennifer, and three computers were seized. It is worth noting that no evidence of a struggle or other crime was discovered in the house on Friday, April 29th. Jennifer's relatives offered a $100,000 reward the day before her wedding for information that could help them find her, dead or alive. Police held a press conference to announce that the active part of the search would be halted. According to the chief of the local police, they must have investigated every possible lead in this town. There were no clues, so they called off the search in the area. John Mason attended the press conference but did not speak with reporters. Jennifer's uncle suggested that John simply didn't know what to say, which added to the speculation about his role in his fiancée's disappearance. Meanwhile, it was revealed that the clothes, shoes, and lock of hair discovered on the first day of the search had nothing to do with Jennifer's disappearance. According to police reports, the fines were for litter. The only suspect who might have had a motive was John, a journalist who was at his house all day and literally followed him around. There was little doubt that he was involved in the bride's disappearance, but proof had yet to be discovered. The next day, April 30th, was scheduled to be spent at the wedding. But now, people were gathering to pray for Jennifer's safe return. On the evening of April 29th, John received a phone call. A number appeared on the screen, but John wasn't sure who it belonged to. When John answered the phone, he put it to his ear. He was nearly speechless. He heard Jennifer's voice. She claimed that she was kidnapped, taken somewhere, and forced to be intimate. She cried and said that after everything was done, she had been released and now she had no idea where she was. This image depicts John rejoicing that his beloved is alive. I cried. I laughed. I tried to remain calm and talk to her to help her stay calm. John stated that he had no idea that his joy would be quickly overshadowed by an interesting circumstance. After speaking with John, Jennifer dialed 911. She told the operator that she had been kidnapped and then released, and that she had no idea where she was. The number from which she called was traced, as it came from a payphone in Albuquerque, New Mexico, more than 1,400 miles from Duluth, Georgia. 
Police officers were dispatched to the address where the phone was found. And when they arrived, they discovered Jennifer. Her family thanked everyone involved, including the media, for successfully convincing the kidnapper to release Jennifer. When the police took Jennifer to the station, they noticed that her appearance did not match the accounts she gave of her captors, whom she described as a man and a woman in their 40s, torturing her in a blue van with her hands and feet tied inside. The FBI agents who came to speak with Jennifer quickly discovered inconsistencies in her story. And when they pointed these inconsistencies out to her, she admitted that no one had kidnapped her on April 26th. She told John that she was going for a run, but instead went to the station and boarded the bus that brought her to New Mexico. According to her, she did so because she could not stand the pressure and excitement of her upcoming wedding. News outlets found that she had a history of criminal behavior, including three separate charges of shoplifting. In 1996, she stole $37 worth of merchandise from Walmart in 1997. She was accused of stealing $1,740 worth of merchandise from a supermarket. She was 24 years old at the time. Jennifer repaid the damages and was placed on community service, and after completing that, the theft charges were dropped in 1998. She was caught stealing again, this time for $98 in damages. She was also accused of stealing from the homes of people who hired her as a nanny. She always managed to avoid imprisonment because the thefts were petty after her kidnapping story ended. All was well in some sense Jennifer was found alive and unharmed, but on the other hand, the state of Georgia spent nearly $60,000 searching for her on April 30th. Jennifer returned to Duluth to shield herself from the attention of the people and reporters greeting her at the airport. She hid her head under a plaid. There was no more talk of the wedding, which was scheduled for that day, and it was postponed indefinitely. She left Georgia because of the pressure of the wedding. Officer Michael Medrano said the list of things she needed to get done and no time to do it made her feel overwhelmed. It turns out that Miss Will Banks basically felt the pressure of this large wedding and could not handle it. Duluth Police Chief Randy Belcher added that John turned out to be an abandoned bridegroom who, contrary to rumors, suspicions, and baseless accusations, had nothing to do with his bride's disappearance. Jennifer was dubbed the runaway bride. She publicly apologized to her family, friends, and residents. According to John, the first thing he did when he saw Jennifer again was to give her the engagement ring she had left behind to show that he still wanted to marry her. Just because we haven't walked down the aisle, just because we haven't stood in front of the 500 people and said, I do, my commitment before God to her was the day I bought that ring and put it on her finger. Mason said on Fox and I'm not backing down from that now. On May 9th, 2005, Jennifer went to a medical facility to address the physical and mental problems that she believed were instrumental in her escape. On May 25, 2005, she was charged with making false statements relating to her abduction. She faced up to five years in prison for this charge on June 2, 2005. As part of a plea bargain, Jennifer was found guilty of perjury and sentenced to two years of probation and 120 hours of community service. She was also ordered to pay just over $15,000 in restitution for expenses incurred by the city in her search. The story doesn't end there. However, in September 2006, Jennifer sued her now ex-fiancé John Mason. The couple had, by this time, broken off their engagement and separated. In the lawsuit, Jennifer claimed that while she was in treatment, she gave John power of attorney to act on her behalf. According to her, John sold the rights to their story for half a million dollars to Reagan Media. He used the proceeds to buy a house that was registered in his name only. Now that they had broken up, John had kicked her out of the house. Jennifer demanded $250,000 in compensation for her share of the house and another $250,000 in damages. John Mason countersued, claiming emotional distress over being left at the altar and suspected involvement in Jennifer's disappearance. In December 2006, both parties dropped their lawsuits. Allegedly, a settlement was reached between them. Thanks to the attention of not only American but also various world media, Jennifer became popular for a while, and some companies wanted to make money from her fame. Hero Builders, a manufacturer of figurines, 
rushed to create a doll depicting Jennifer Wilbanks in a sports suit with Vegas Baby written on it. Included was a small towel that was placed over the doll's head to imitate the woman's appearance on television when she returned to Duluth. Will Banks has inspired a runaway bride action figure and a hot sauce called Jennifer's High Tail and Hot Sauce. A musical play based on the story of Jennifer Wilbanks opened on March 13, 2008, at the Red Clay Theater in Duluth, Georgia. A photo of Will Banks appears in the trailer for the 2008 movie Professional Poker The Grand as one of the many women Woody Harrelson, his character, has been married to in the past. John Mason, who had already spent a lot of money on a failed wedding where several hundred people had been invited, married another woman in 2008. In a quiet ceremony at his parents' home in Duluth, Jennifer married in 2010, but 11 years later, the marriage dissolved and she still lives in Georgia. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this episode we will talk about what happened in 2008, in Iowa. When the detectives arrived at the scene, they assumed it was a normal car accident. However, this case quickly proved them wrong. The police solved the mysterious death of 41-year-old Michelle Davis thanks to CCTV footage, which helped them determine what happened and who was responsible. Michelle Ann Cosner was born on December 15, 1966 in Iowa. In 2008, the 41-year-old woman lived in Des Moines, Moines with her three children. She was on the verge of a new chapter in her life. Michelle was excited to start a new life after the court nearly finalized her divorce papers. She has already moved into a separate apartment and obtained a restraining order against her husband Randy Davis. The family had a strained relationship in the years preceding the divorce. Michelle was described as a friendly, active person who enjoyed adventures and motorcycles. She worked as a secretary for a trucking company, where she was treated with respect and authority. Michelle worked on Thursday, September 11, 2008. Colleagues noticed that after leaving her husband, she appeared to have released a burden that had been weighing her down for many years. Michelle was in a good mood that day, so she left work around 4.30 p.m. She had finished all of her business, Shortly after that, 911 began receiving calls from eyewitnesses informing the operator of an accident on Interstate 235. The Mercury Sable was upside down, with a woman still wearing her seat belt in the driver's seat. She was unconscious. Unfortunately, the paramedics who arrived at the scene were unable to save her. The deceased woman's name was Michelle Davis. After arriving at the scene, Police determined that Michelle had lost control of the vehicle, resulting in an accident. However, the following day, they excluded this version. Michelle did not die as a result of a head injury during the rollover. According to forensic experts, her death was caused by a gunshot wound to the head. They extracted the bullet and sent it to be examined in the hopes that it would help them find the criminal. This was the first time the investigators assigned to this case had encountered something like this. While awaiting the results of the ballistic examination, the local authorities decided to ensure the safety of those on the street. After all, what if Michelle was a random victim, not predetermined? What if the shooter didn't stop with one victim? There are many cars on this interstate, and each one could be a target for the distraught shooter. It was critical to resolve this case as quickly as possible. As a result, the police increased their patrols throughout the city. When it became clear that Michelle's death was not an accident, detectives went to the crime scene to determine where the shooter was and whether he left any traces. However, it yielded no results. They discovered neither the cartridge case nor any other evidence that would aid the investigation. Furthermore, because the police initially assumed Michelle was the victim of a car accident, the traffic services cleared the scene. As a result, any evidence that existed was irretrievably destroyed. Despite this, the detectives remained hopeful that by reviewing traffic camera recordings, they would be able to find answers. CCTV cameras are increasingly used to assist police in solving various crimes, and this case was no different. 
The investigators immediately began studying the traffic camera recordings that they had at their disposal. First, they needed to locate the recording from the camera closest to the crime scene and rewind it to the point when people began calling 911. Half an hour later, the investigators discovered what they were looking for. The video showed Mikkel's car upside down. However, the quality of the footage was subpar. As a result, the video was more akin to a slideshow, with separate, alternating images with intervals. As a result, the investigators only had a few shots to work with, none of which revealed what caused Mikhail's car to roll. It was an unpleasant development because the investigators were confident they already had the necessary clue. Unfortunately, it was a false hope. All that remained for the police to do was to continue reviewing the remaining camera footage and looking for potential witnesses. While the police team continued to examine the recordings from other traffic cameras, the investigator assigned to the Michelle Davis case contacted her family to inform them that her death was not an accident, as previously assumed. Michelle's family was shocked to learn that she had been the victim of a crime. Michelle's mother, Patty, died before the end of her life. Michael Lee Cosner, Michelle's father, sued over the deaths of his second daughter, his first daughter, and Michelle's older sister, Cheryl. Michael Cosner's first child died in 1965 when she was about a year old, and 43 years later, he has lost another. Outliving their children is the worst thing a parent can go through. Michelle's family informed the investigator that her life was gradually changing, and she had no financial problems. However, the family believed that Mikkel's husband, Randy Davis, was the only person capable of causing her harm. After all, the court almost finalized their divorce, and she sought a restraining order against him. At the same time, Another detective went to the company where Michelle worked to speak with her co-workers. That's how the investigators discovered Michelle had a close relationship with another man after splitting up with her husband. His name was Matt Jorgensen, and he was her colleague. According to Michelle's friend, the couple's feelings were mutual. However, because Michelle was in the process of divorcing Randy Davis, they decided to keep their relationship private, so only a few colleagues and close friends knew about it. As a result, the police had two potential suspects, Randy Davis and Matt Jorgensen. All attempts to contact Randy were unsuccessful. All calls went directly to voicemail. The investigators met with Matt to ask him about his whereabouts on the day Michelle died. He didn't hide anything, admitting that he and Michelle were romantically involved. As he stated, they never argued or fought. The man was stunned by Mikkel's death so he described in detail what he was doing on the day she died. His alibi checked out, and he was removed from the suspect list. The ballistic examination revealed that the crime was committed with a 22 caliber rifle. Experts concluded that it was a close-range shot. Furthermore, because everything happened while Michelle was driving on the interstate, the police assumed the shooter was in another car driving next to her. Simultaneously, this case had a new suspect. The police received a call from the insurance company informing them that Mikkel's brother Todd was claiming payment on her life insurance. Crimes committed with the intention of receiving money through life insurance are not uncommon. Was this case one of them? Could Todd have killed his sister to get this payout? The detective went to his house to ask some questions. When he began questioning Todd about where he was when Michelle died, the latter realized the police considered him a suspect. He told Todd everything he did on the day his sister died. Todd stated that their family was in a difficult financial situation and could not arrange a proper funeral for Michelle. He turned to the insurance company because he needed money for Michelle's funeral. Todd's alibi was checked by police and they discovered that he was in another part of the city at the time Michelle died. Todd was not the one who shot her. Todd did, however, provide the police with information that enabled them to locate another suspect, Michelle Stepson Josh. When Michelle married Randy, he already had a son from his previous marriage. Josh had already reached adulthood when Michelle died. He was a Marine who had returned home from the army shortly before Michelle was fatally injured on the road. Josh knew how to use weapons, which made him one of the suspects. The police began investigating whether Josh had a motive for committing this crime. Meanwhile, the police got another clue. A woman said she was driving on Interstate 235 on the same day. At the same time, Mikkel's vehicle rolled over. 
she saw a red pickup truck, most likely a Ford F-150, whose driver swerved from one lane to another. It appeared that he was chasing someone. The woman described the driver as an adult white man wearing a baseball cap, and that is all she could see. This new information seemed significant, so the investigators started looking into it. They looked at traffic camera footage again, but this time they were looking for a red pickup truck, and the woman was correct. The video showed a red pickup truck following Michelle directly from her workplace. However, the police were unable to see the driver's face or the red pickup truck's license plates due to the poor video quality. After reviewing the footage from other cameras, the investigators concluded that the red pickup truck was driving along the same route as Michelle, following her every move. It wasn't a coincidence. Furthermore, as Michelle approached the scene of her death, the pickup truck was close behind her. This information suggests that the criminal fired the decisive shot while driving. With a few suspects in mind, detectives quickly discovered Michelle's husband, Randy Davis, had a red pickup truck. Detectives immediately went to his home. Randy was not at home, but his son Josh was present. He was a Marine who knew how to use weapons professionally and had access to his father's car. Josh told detectives that on the day Michelle died, he went shopping with his sister before returning home and spending the evening watching TV. He described Mikkel's divorce from his father as arduous because, among other things, she wanted half of the house's value. Josh also stated that his father came home around 5.30 p.m. Josh's story did not seem convincing on that particular day. Furthermore, this conversation revealed that he may have a motive for committing the crime. Josh was very upset when his stepmother decided to take a portion of his estate during his divorce from his father. However, these were only assumptions without any physical evidence, and no evidence means no arrest or charges. While Michelle's family prepared for the funeral, police looked for new leads. The police began searching all of the shops and gas stations along the route from her workplace to where she died, hoping to find more surveillance footage a few miles from the trucking company where she worked. The police discovered another crucial piece of footage for the investigation in a store. While the surveillance camera was inside the store, it was still recording in the parking lot. On September 11, 2008, at around 4 p.m., on the day Mikkel died, a red pickup truck drove up to the store and parked near the entrance. The police were aware that Randy Davis owned the pickup truck, but since his son Josh also had access to it, they needed to figure out who was driving it that day. The footage captured the driver exiting the car and entering the store. However, due to the poor video quality, investigators were unable to determine whether it was Josh Davis or his father, Randy. The man eventually disappeared from the camera's field of view. But after a while, he reappeared, bought something, and left the store. Then he got in his car and drove off. I'd like to remind you that all of this occurred at 4 p.m. Michelle departed work at 4.30 p.m. The police investigated the footage further and discovered that the pickup truck returned to the store several times within the next 30 minutes. However, the driver did not exit the vehicle, instead turning around and driving away. The pickup truck last appeared near the store when Michelle left work. I wasn't able to identify the suspect. The police made another attempt to contact Michelle's husband, Randy Davis. The latter eventually got in touch and arrived at the police station. The investigators explained his rights and clarified that he was not being arrested. Randy agreed to answer a few questions. They inquired about what he was doing on September 11th. Randy mentioned going through the arduous divorce process with Michelle. After all, they had been married for 17 years. He also stated that he worked as a carpenter and was at work that day. Randy hesitated when asked when he got home, but eventually stated that he arrived at 3.45 p.m., it contradicted the surveillance footage and Josh's testimony, which stated that his father arrived home around 5.30 p.m. Randy stated that he did not leave home after 3.45 p.m. He said he was home alone, but then his son Josh arrived and they cooked dinner together. This information contradicted Josh's testimony, which stated that he was already home when his father arrived, implying that the father and son were dependent on one another. And after speaking with Randy, the investigators discovered that one of them was lying. To see Randy's reaction, 
investigators informed him that Mikkel died as a result of a bullet rather than injuries sustained in a car crash. Mikkel's family were the only ones who knew about it because the police did not reveal this information. Randy barely reacted to the news, pretending to be surprised and lowering his eyes. Randy demanded a lawyer after the police asked him when he last saw Michelle. Thus, the conversation had come to an end. The investigation lacked the weapon used to murder Michelle, as well as any other significant evidence that could have led to his arrest, so he was released on September 5, 2008. Four days after Mikkel died, her family and friends gathered for a funeral service. Randy Davis was also one of those who came to say goodbye to Michelle. With his entire appearance, he attempted to convey that what had occurred was a significant loss for him. He even burst into tears at one point, but who was responsible for Michelle Davis' death? The investigators did everything they could to get a quick answer to this question. Help came from unexpected places. Josh Davis entered the police station with his lawyer and requested to make a statement. According to his statement, his father's car was parked in the driveway when he returned home from seeing his sister. He entered the house and saw his father holding a gun. Randy told his son that it would be best if he did not come now. Josh said he understood what his father was up to. He tried to stop him, begging him not to do anything he would later regret. But Randy got in his car and drove away. He returned and drove the car into the garage. Josh went to the garage, where his father admitted that he had shot Michelle. Randy Davis was upset when his wife filed for divorce and decided to sue him for a portion of the property. He couldn't accept it and decided to take drastic measures. Randy waited for Michelle to leave work on September 11, 2008, by parking his red pickup truck outside the store. He drove past the location where Michelle worked several times. I'm afraid of missing out on the moment. It explained why Randy was seen on the store's CCTV footage several times. After Michelle left work, he followed. When the time came, he rolled down the passenger side window and fired. Randy Davis was arrested based on Josh's testimony, and he faces first-degree murder charges for Michelle's death. However, before going to trial, Randy agreed to plead guilty to second-degree deprivation of life in exchange for a reduced sentence. Based on this, 53-year-old Randy Davis was sentenced to 50 years in prison in 2010. His guilty plea indicates that there will be no trial. Perhaps we missed justice a little, but we did get what we wanted. We knew he had done it, and he admitted to doing it, according to Michelle's brother, Todd Cosner. He claimed Davis had destroyed their family. I adored Randy. He was a member of my family for 17 years. Todd Cosner said, I cared about him. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The events discussed in this video occurred in Kansas in 2007, and it has been 16 years since then. This high-profile case has yet to conclude. On January 5, 2017, 19-year-old Jody Sanderholm, who lived with her parents in Arkansas City, attended a dance rehearsal at her college. On that day, Jody did not return home and stopped answering the phone. Such behavior was unusual for her, so her parents became concerned and filed a missing persons report with the authorities. Jody Leon Sanderholm was born on September 26, 1987, in Arkansas City, to Brian and Cindy Sander Sanderholm. She was her parents' third child. She was her parents' third child. She had a brother, Jason, and a sister, Jennifer. Jody enjoyed dancing since a young age. And while it played an important role in Jody's life, she did not abandon her studies. She was among four valedictorians in her graduating class. Jody was a member of the National Honor Society in high school, a Kansas State Scholar, a Kansas Board of Regents Scholar, and received the Outstanding Physics Student of the Year Award from David Stein Mitzi. She was on the Ark City High School dance team for four years. She served as captain for two of those four years. Jody taught for Arc City Dance and the Universal Dance Association. After high school, she attended Cali College to study pre-pharmacy. 
She was a member of Cal Poly's Cali Tiger dance team. In 2007, Arkansas City had a population of approximately 12,000. Jody's parents, like most locals, believed it was a good and relatively safe place to live and raise children. However, as the details of Jody's disappearance became public, many people realized that safety was an illusion and that the man was the most dangerous beast. On the morning of January 5, 2007, Jody drove her Dodge Stratus to college for a dance rehearsal that was supposed to end at 10.45. After the rehearsal, she planned to return home. Cindy called her daughter's cell phone several times, but she did not answer, which was extremely unusual. Jody was always in touch with her family. Even if she missed a call, she would call back shortly. Cindy had bad feelings about this. She decided to leave work and go home to see if Jody was okay. When she arrived, she noticed her daughter's car was not parked in front of the house. Cindy's anxiety was heightened by the fact that she expected Jody to have returned from rehearsal by this point. When Cindy entered the house and looked around, she realized Jody had not returned home. Her dance uniform, which she had placed in the washing machine when she returned from rehearsal, was not present, nor was it in the hamper with her dirty clothes. The shower stall was dry. Although Jody always showered after dance class, it was soon clear that she had lost contact with her father and older sister, Jennifer. She had an appointment at noon, but she didn't show up. Cindy and Brian began calling their daughter's friends, hoping to find out where she was. But when the morning rehearsal was over and Jody left college, none of her friends saw her. That evening, the college dance team was scheduled to perform at a basketball game with a routine choreographed by Jody. She would not have missed it voluntarily, but she did not show up either. At approximately 6 p.m., they still can't learn anything and aren't waiting for their daughter to come home. Cindy and Brian contacted the police to report her missing. Officers from the sheriff's office immediately created flyers depicting and describing Jody, began to inquire about her last known location, and issued an app on the vehicle she was traveling in. Cindy and Brian told the police that Jody had a boyfriend she had been dating since high school. His name was Colby Wilson. His name was Colby Wilson. When contacted by phone, he said he had been at his brother's house in Texas for several days. His stay in another state was confirmed, so the police quickly ruled him out as a potential suspect. The following day, January 6, was extremely eventful. Jody's best friend, Lori Leglighter, with whom she had been friends and danced since high school, gave the police crucial information. They both enrolled at Cowley College and went on to study dance. Lori reported that she left her job at Sirloin Stockade in Arkansas City around 10 p.m. on Tuesday, January 2. I noticed a light blue card. As she drove past the restaurant several times on her way home, she noticed a car in her rearview mirror. I suspected something strange was going on. Lori explained to the detectives that she decided to see if the car behind her was actually following her. So she began turning onto two different streets. The driver of the car behind her was doing the exact same thing and it terrified Lori. She drove to the local police station and parked next to it, hoping the stalker would leave her alone. She didn't see him after she stopped, so she drove home again. However, she had to return to the parking lot near the police station after seeing the car chasing her again. Lori sat in her car for a while before heading home. She informed the detectives that she did not go to the station because she believed it was someone else's stupid prank, but that was not all. On Friday, January 5, Tiger at the dance line was rehearsing at college. Lori and Jody arrived around the same time, and Park, as usual, was close by. Lori saw the light blue car again. In addition, she recognized the driver. Justin Thurber, 23, is a local resident. Lori didn't know him personally, but she'd seen him several times with his older brother and friends. Lori and Jody both left practice at the same time, and we agreed to meet later, but Jody never showed up. Soon, several members of the dance team confirmed that they had seen Justin near the college in the last week. He was always sitting in his car in the parking lot, just watching. Within the first 24 hours of Jody's disappearance, police searched the city but were unable to locate her car. Arkansas City is surrounded by fields and woodlands. They brought in a fixed-wing aircraft to search the area from above. The car was more difficult to conceal than a person due to its size. The police hoped to see Jody's car from the air. It was determined that the last time her cell phone signal was received, it came from a cell tower near the Cali Wildlife Area. This is a vast wooded area on the Arkansas River. 
At this point in the investigation, only one person, Eugene Thurber, had been identified by Lori Legg, Lidar, and other members of the dance group as a possible suspect in Jody Sanderholm's disappearance. It is worth noting that, despite his young age, Thurber was well known to the police. Three years earlier, in 2004, he was charged with illegal possession of prohibited substances. He eventually received a suspended sentence and was released, but three months later he was arrested for theft and probation violation. In October 2005, he was charged with disorderly conduct. Three months later, he was arrested for petty theft and discovered to be in possession of a controlled substance on December 31, 2006, just six days before Jody went missing. Thurber was arrested again for theft. He was released the same day after posting $3,000 bail. After celebrating New Year's Eve the following day, January 1, he began impersonating a police officer and disrupting public order. When the real cops arrived, Thurber complained of chest pain and was transported to the hospital rather than the station. Why he was not arrested after being released from the hospital is unclear. It is also unclear why he was always able to get away with it. His relative, who works for Cowley County Police, may have contributed to this, but that's just a guess. That same day, January 6, a police officer noticed Thumber's car, a light blue Cadillac, parked outside his parents' house and decided to speak with him. His father invited the officer inside the house. When the police officer asked Justin where he had been yesterday, he said he had driven his car to Winfield, a town about 13 miles outside of Arkansas City that morning. There, according to Justin, he met up with his friend and two other friends whom he did not know very well. The four of them then began driving around the countryside in a car owned by one of his friends until the car became stuck on a dirt road near Cedarvale. Then, as Thurber claimed, he walked to Arkansas City, about 30 miles from Cedar Valley. After six hours, he was tired of walking in and asked his father to pick him up. Thunber's father confirmed his statement, saying he picked Justin up wet and dirty a few miles from Cali State Fishing Lake. Justin also informed the police officer that his car, which he left in Winfield, had been returned by friends. The story was not convincing, but there was nothing to charge Thurber with, so the officer left. That same evening, officers spoke with Alexis Schwartzel, who had recently ended her three-year relationship with Thurber. She told officers Thurber frequently took her to the Coal Wildlife Area southeast of Arkansas City, and she pointed out places they would go together. When the police informed Alexis that they were investigating Jody Sanderholm's disappearance, she was taken aback because Justin had previously stated that he had started watching Jody when he was 13 years old. He would watch her swim in her backyard pool, and in the evenings he would peek through the window in her room and wait for her to change clothes. When police asked Alexis why she had ended her relationship with Thurber, she said that it was because he was abusive and had strange tendencies that were becoming more frequent. She claimed several times that during intimacy, he would choke her unconscious. On top of that, he asked her to fight him because he couldn't get aroused otherwise. It was becoming increasingly obvious to the police. By the minute, Justin Thurber could be involved in Jody's disappearance. The police found no evidence linking him to the girl's disappearance. Thurber was arrested, however, late in the evening on January 6. Detective Eric Matta arrested Thurber on bail revocation and criminal trespass charges after the investigation into Jody Sanderholm's disappearance revealed that Thurber was on the college campus, which the detective believed Thurber should not be. Thurber informed Maida that he wanted to speak with his lawyer. At the same time, police officers arrived at Justin's parents' home with a search warrant. The officers took Justin's shoes, which he had worn the day before when his father picked him up. The shoes were wet and drying on a towel. Thurber. His father told the police that he helped his son clean the mud from his shoes. Justin's clothes from when his father picked him up were also recovered, but he had already washed them. The next day, January 7, searchers trained to detect human activity and rugged terrain were deployed in the Cowley Wildlife Area. They discovered shoe prints that matched Justin Thurber, as well as several smaller shoe prints as darkness fell, they decided to continue their search the next day. On their way home, some searchers drove past Cowley County State Fishing Lake and decided to stop because they had heard Thurber was wet when his father picked him up. They discovered muddy tire tracks and shoe prints near a public restroom that was addressed to Jody Sanderholm's parents, as well as dance shoes, another toilet, and a flip-flop sandal. 
Investigators eventually discovered cut-off sweatshorts and a wallet containing Jody Sanderholm's driver's license and social security card. Her black leotard features a tiger on the jacket, with Jody Sanderholm's first name on the front, as well as a vehicle floor mat and car seat cushion. The sandals matched the impressions discovered at Cowley Wildlife Area. The searcher spent the next two days near Cowley County State Fishing Lake and Cowley Wildlife Area. On January 9, sonar specialists deployed to the lake's bottom discovered Jody's sunken car. On the same day, the Sanderholm family's hopes had also died. Jody's naked body was discovered under a pile of leaves, logs, and twigs in the car wildlife area. Authorities discovered DNA evidence linking Justin Thurber to Jody's car and body. The car had been in the lake for more than three days, and police were concerned that the water that filled the interior had destroyed all evidence. That was partially true. Forensic investigators spent many hours searching for short hair in the interior. Terry Melton, director of the Forensic DNA Testing Lab, conducted mitochondrial DNA tests on the hair found on the driver's seat of the Jody Sanderholm car and determined that it was almost certainly Justin Thunber's hair. Barbara Leal, a private DNA testing company employee, tested samples from Jody Sanderholm's right biceps and chest. She concluded that Thurber could not have been excluded from the study, whereas 99s of the population could have been. Cell tower data revealed that on the day Jody disappeared, her phone and Justin Thumber's phone were in the same location at the same time. Lori, Jody's best friend, claims she saw Thurber in the college parking lot the day she vanished. When the police reviewed the camera footage provided by the college administration, they concluded that Lori was telling the truth. Thurber was in the college parking lot while the rehearsal was going on. He left the parking lot at the same time as Jody. The tape revealed that Thurber followed Jody in his light blue Cadillac based on the discovery of letters addressed to Jody's pair of rents near the lake. Investigators suspected Thurber had followed Jody from the college to her home. And when she came out to get the letters from the mailbox, he attacked her, pushed her into her own car, and drove her away. That theory was confirmed when a shoe print that matched the sole of Justin Thurber's sneakers was discovered next to the Sanderholm family mailbox. As previously stated, Footprints from Thurber shoes and smaller shoe impressions were discovered at the Cowley Wildlife Area. It was determined that these were Jody's shoe footprints discovered at the fishing lake, along with her other belongings. Thurber's and Jody's footprints were found side by side while walking through the preserve. At one point, the searcher noticed that Jody's footprints were interrupted, while Justin's footprints continued deep into the forest. This indicated that he was carrying the girl further on his own. His shoe prints were discovered alongside the body. All three people Justin claimed to have been with on the day Jody disappeared denied his claims. They hadn't seen Thurber that day, so his story about the car getting stuck near Cedar Vale was fabricated. The three officers drove Thurber to Cedar Vale so he could show them where he claimed to be. Thurber was unable to pinpoint where he claimed the car was stuck. Thurber returned to the police station and volunteered to take a polygraph test. He also requested that his relative Chad Monroe who worked for the Cowley County Sheriff's Office, attend the questioning. The evidence gathered was sufficient to indict Justin Thurber. He denied guilt, and the judge set his bail at $1 million. Thurber, his attorneys attempted to persuade the court that he was mentally retarded and incompetent, but were unsuccessful. Thurber had graduated from high school and even attended college for a time, so the judge ruled that his defense claim of mental retardation was unproven. The medical examiner who conducted the autopsy testified during the trial. He stated that the first time he saw the body, he knew that Jody's final hours were excruciatingly painful. Her whole body and face were covered in bruises and abrasions. There were obvious signs of strangulation on her neck. Strangulation was identified as the cause of Jody Sanderholm's death. I am unable to provide all of the details about what the medical examiner found during the autopsy. Not all horror movie maniacs are as brutal as Thurber was to Jody without going into detail, while also providing an idea of what happened at the Cali Wildlife Area. I'll say the following. The crime was motivated by carnal desire, and Thurber committed it with a stick during the trial. In addition to Thunber's ex-girlfriend, six other women testified, alleging that the defendant stalked them. One of them was his co-worker. In one instance, she had to contact the police to have an officer walk her to her car after work. It was already dark, and she was afraid to enter the parking lot because she saw Justin waiting for her. Earlier, he had left a rose and a note under her car's windshield wiper.
her and wanted to know her better. Several witnesses stated that they saw Jody Sanderholm's car on January 5, 2007. Corey Morris, a friend of Jody's, noticed her sitting in the passenger seat as their cars passed each other in Arkansas shortly after noon. Morris reported that the man driving Jody's car appeared to be a large man. She called Jody's cell phone but got no answer. Other women reported seeing a vehicle resembling Jody Sanderholm's while driving on a dirt road south of Arkansas City at 3 p.m. One of them claimed the driver was Thurber and identified him in court. On February 17, 2009, the jury returned a unanimous verdict, finding Thurber guilty on all counts and recommending that he be sentenced to death. Thurber attempted to negotiate a plea bargain after determining the sentence the judge would impose. Justin's lawyer informed the prosecutor that if he was not sentenced to death, he would plead guilty. Jody's family was against such a deal. The presiding judge considered the jury's decision and sentenced Thurber to death by lethal injection in March 2009. In 2008, the state of Kansas passed the Jody Act, which expanded police authority over suspects and expanded the list of actions that can be considered stalking. Justin Thurber has continued to pursue an appeal of the court's decision since his sentencing. His attorneys are attempting to establish Thurber's mental retardation. The Kansas Supreme Court postponed Thurber's death sentence in 2018, citing a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that executing defendants, even those with mild developmental disabilities, is unconstitutional. The Sanderholm family stated that a competency hearing was held during the original trial, and Thurber was found to be fully competent at the time. Cindy Sanderholm, Jody's mother, sat in court 11 years after her daughter died. She stated that Thurber had written letters to other girls while in prison, which should demonstrate his competence. That is sick. It's simply sick. It's simply sick. It's simply sick. It demonstrates that he is capable of communicating with others and writing letters. He knows what he's doing. I'm sure Jody pleaded for her life, but he denied it to her. She did not get a second option. She didn't get a second chance, she explained. In August 2021, the Kansas Supreme Court issued an opinion announcing that a state law passed in 2020 allows Thurber, who is appealing a death sentence, to request that an attorney be appointed by the Cali County District Court to assist with post-conviction DNA testing. Thus, 16 years after Jody Sanderholm's death, the final word in this case has yet to be spoken. It is also worth noting that no one has been executed since Kansas reinstated the death penalty in 1994. The last execution in Kansas was in 1965. Since then, nine other people, in addition to Thurber, have been sentenced to death, but no execution has occurred. We have not executed anyone within that time frame. There is no timetable for future executions, according to Adam Fannin-Steele, the Kansas Department of Corrections communication spokesperson. I find it shocking that Kansas reinstated the death penalty more than 20 years ago, Jennifer Aldridge said there is no plan yet. Jody's older sister. I assume this would have been discussed 20 years ago when it was reinstated. As a result, even if a 30-year death sentence is upheld, it is highly unlikely to be carried out. Justin Thurber, 39, is still incarcerated at the Maximum Security El Dorado Correctional Facility in Butler County, Kansas. According to a Kansas Legislative Post Audit Committee report published in 2014, each inmate serving time and administrative segregation at El Dorado costs nearly $49,000 per year. Furthermore, taxpayers pay nearly four times the cost to prosecute a case where the death penalty is sought, which is $395,000 per case, compared to $100,000 per case when the death penalty is not sought. For Sander Holmes, taxes are an added insult to an already painful injury and a long wait for justice in the case of their daughter Jody. Every week when I see my paycheck, it hurts so badly. Brian Sanderholm said, and I know I'm paying taxes to feed him. Death is what he deserves. That's what the law said, Cindy Sanderholm. So we need to fix the law so that we can use it. If it was your daughter or son, it was our daughter. What do you want to happen? How about Brian Sanderholm? Most regrettably, Cynthia and Sanderholm Jody's mother died on December 2, 2022, at the age of 63. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On the eve of Christmas, a young woman was abducted from the apartment where she lived with her boyfriend. An unknown criminal tied up the young man and took the young woman out through the back door, disappearing without a trace. The police were unable to identify the perpetrator and the caveman for 36 years until an unexpected truth came to light. Leslie McRae was born on April 14, 1968, in Jacksonville, Florida. She was kind-hearted, determined, outgoing, loved to have fun, had a sharp mind, and had a great sense of humor. Leslie grew up in a loving family but was particularly close to her four-year-old cousin, Joey. Despite living in different cities, the girls tried to spend as much time together as possible. Leslie even considered moving to her city when she turned 18. After graduating from high school at the age of 17, Leslie enrolled at the University of North Florida, dreaming of building a career in the modeling industry. She moved out of her parents' house and into an apartment complex with her 21-year-old boyfriend, Edgar McQuarrie. On the night of December 24, 1985, they were sleeping in their apartment when Edgar woke up around 3 a.m. to a noise to his horror. He saw a man with a knife above their bed. The unknown criminal tied Edgar's hands and fed him with ties, threatening him with a weapon to prevent him from resisting. He then tied up Leslie in the same way and took her out through the back door of the apartment. Edgar, still tied up, could only watch in horror as the kidnapper took Leslie away. He took him three hours to free his hands, and around 6 a.m., he called the police. The taxes arrived at their apartment, took Edgar's statement, and began searching for Leslie, considering that the room was almost pitch black at the time of the abduction. Edgar could not see the perpetrator's face or any other distinguishing features except for brown hair. The police also did not know what kind of vehicle the kidnapper had used, although it was evident that he had used some form of transportation to abduct Leslie. They received a call at their station three hours after the kidnapping. A man went out for a morning run and noticed a female body lying in a ditch next to the road, eight kilometers away from Leslie's apartment. The investigators arrived at the scene and immediately identified the young woman. Her body was covered in various injuries, some of her clothing was torn or missing. Medical experts determined that the young woman had received more than 20 sharp object wounds and there were also many bruises on her body. In addition, the killer had subjected the victim to violence and experts were able to extract his biological material. Considering the DNA analysis was not yet used in those years, this evidence could not help the police identify a suspect. There were no other useful clues at the scene, so the investigators decided to focus on examining the victim's apartment. Soon they had serious doubts about what had happened that night. According to the victim's boyfriend, the criminal had quietly entered the apartment, but no signs of a break-in were found and there were no signs of a struggle in the rooms. In addition, the back door through which Leslie was allegedly taken out was covered in cobwebs and no fingerprints were found on it. There were no shoe prints, despite a thick layer of dust around it. All of this suggested that the boyfriend's story may have been fabricated, and in that case, an obvious question arose, does he have anything to do with the murder? The investigators doubted that the boyfriend could have taken out and killed his girlfriend then returned to the apartment and called the police. Experts suggested that her body was dumped on the street after Edgar called 911, so he was no longer considered a suspect. Over the next few months, the detectives tried to find new leads. But each time they hit a dead end, the investigation was finally suspended in 1986. The criminal's biological material, which was the only serious evidence in this case, could not help the investigators at that time and they hoped that in the future this clue would lead them to the killer for many years. This case sat gathering dust in archives. Leslie's relatives never lost hope of finding the culprit. They reached out to various authorities and gathered information themselves that could be useful in solving the case, but their resources were limited, so they were unable to find any new leads. In 2010, Leslie's mother, Sarah Adams, was diagnosed with a serious nervous system disease that practically robbed her of her ability to speak. Despite this, she continued to maintain contact with investigators through nodes. After that, Leslie's cousin Joey became the most active in the search for the truth. Although she and her family lived two hours away from Jacksonville, she regularly traveled there to speak with investigators or help Leslie's mother. However, attempts to reach out to the police practically led nowhere. 
Detectives were not eager to reopen the investigation considering the lack of new evidence. Additionally, they were occupied with ongoing criminal cases, so they were in no rush to take on a decades-old murder case. As a result, Joey began to accuse the detectives of being negligent in the early stages of the investigation or even covering up the perpetrator. She even suggested that the killer may have bribed investigators, but she had no evidence to support this. Theory Joey also regularly gave interviews to local news channels trying to draw public attention to the case she recalled the time spent with her older sister and described Leslie as a cheerful and positive person she also regretted that her two children never got to know what a wonderful aunt. Leslie could have been to them in late 2018. Her relatives' persistent efforts produced the first results they contacted representatives of the Cold Case Files Project, and they became interested in Leslie's case, this non-profit organization which began in 2015 focuses on unsolved murders in which police have been unable to find the perpetrators the organization collects and disseminates information engages in dialogue with investigators and the media in addition they provide support to the victim's relatives advising them on. Its communication with the police and journalists the organization's employees posted information about Leslie's murder on various resources, trying to attract as much attention as possible to the case. In such cases, when investigators have now been able to solve the case, Public interest can play a key role. First, the more people hear about this crime, the more chances there are that potential witnesses to the events will be among them. Sometimes people, without realizing it, may have seen or heard something that could lead the police to the killer. Second, under pressure from the public and the media, the chances of detectives reopening the investigation increased throughout this time. They had the perpetrator's biological material, but wanted to study it. They needed to reopen the case, which police officers often do not do due to a lack of personnel or funding the organization worked together with Leslie's relatives for several months, and they really managed to draw attention to this case they wrote in the news and talked about it in reports and in. June 2019 representatives of a popular local TV channel contacted the family they offered to record a large-scale interview in which relatives could talk about Leslie and their years-long attempts to seek the truth her cousin and mother accepted the offer and met with journalists they told them about who Leslie was as a person showed her photos and were dismayed by the fact that the police had not been investigating the case for over 30 years in addition in the interview relatives mentioned. They believed that the boys Leslie mentioned were her killers and in their opinion, her story about a man with a knife was not trustworthy the boy himself could have killed her. But the journalist decided to cut this moment out as Edgar was not a suspect in this case and there was no evidence against him. Representatives of the TV channel contacted the sheriff's office hoping to get some additional information, but the police refused to comment they referred to rules that prohibited them from discussing with journalists cases that were not currently under investigation. Leslie's family was disappointed with this outcome, but they were not going to give up. Joey continued to write letters to investigators demanding that the case be reopened, and ultimately it paid off. The family was able to organize a meeting with law enforcement representatives and detectives indicated their intention to revive the investigation. The Leslie family was interviewed again, and the police began to re-examine the evidence. In April 2020, they sent biological material from the victim's body to a laboratory, and soon experts extracted a DNA profile that was entered into the FBI's national database and immediately received a match. Almost 35 years later, the investigators finally had a possible killer's name. He was 58 years old. David Nelson Austin after studying his biography. The detectives found many interesting moments. His DNA was in the FBI database, not just by chance. Since 1991, the man has been serving a sentence for two sexual crimes committed in 1988 and 1990. At that time, he lived in Michigan, where he moved from Florida. Detectives determined that at the time of Leslie's death, he was living in Jacksonville and was 24 years old. Two months before the murder, he attacked a mentally disabled young woman and attempted to assault her, but he failed. The man was arrested, but the justice system treated his act very lightly. Austin received no serious punishment and remained free. In addition to this, he had a whole series of less serious crimes, including drug possession, disturbing the peace, and more detectives had no doubt that he was behind Leslie's murder and began preparing the case for trial. Gathering all the necessary materials in early 2021, they went to the Michigan prison to interrogate Austin. For the first time, the man denied his involvement, but no one was going to believe him on his word. 
Investigators took his DNA sample to directly compare it with the biological material found on the victim's body. This had to be done as part of the standard procedure, and the result was expected to be a complete match in August 2021. Austin was officially charged with the murder of Leslie since then detectives have been working to have him transferred from Michigan to Florida, where the crime was committed the need for transfer was due to one simple fact Florida had the death penalty unlike Michigan and Austin could have. Received that sentence for the murder of Leslie the process took a year, until September 2022 when he was finally transferred to a correctional facility in Florida, he is currently behind bars awaiting trial and investigators have no doubt about his guilt. The only way for the perpetrator to avoid the death penalty is to make a deal with the prosecution and confess to. The murder in exchange for another life sentence during a press conference investigators admitted that Austin was never a suspect in the case and was never questioned. According to them, the man did not leave any clues that the police could use to pursue him and DNA analysis was impossible at that time. Furthermore, his DNA was only added to the FBI database in 1991. Six years after the murder, Joey also gave an interview in which she said that she had always believed that Leslie's boyfriend was the killer. It was only after investigators revealed the real perpetrator's name did she realize that Edgar was also a victim in the story. It is expected that she will be the main witness in the trial. Leslie's mother said she forgave her daughter's killer, which surprised her family members, but they all respected her decision. Interestingly, Austin has a son named Owen whom he has never met nevertheless. They regularly communicated via email. Journalists contacted Owen and learned that he was shocked by the charges against his father. Austin himself wrote to him about it, adding that he had nothing to do with this crime. At the same time, his son was well aware of other criminal episodes from his father's life but continued to communicate with him. Austin's trial is expected to begin soon. If there are no bureaucratic delays, he may receive his sentence in a few months. Despite the fact that the truth has finally come out, the victim's relatives still blame investigators for negligence, believing that if they had periodically reopened this case, the perpetrator's identity could have been established in the early 90s rather than 30 years later. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will look at the events that occurred in Ardmore, Pennsylvania, USA in August 2018. On August 22nd, at 9.15 p.m., state police received a call requesting that they check the condition of 36-year-old Christina Carlin Kraft, an ex-model for Playboy magazine. Her partner discovered something strange when he checked their apartment's security system. Furthermore, Christina was not returning phone calls or messages. When the police arrived, they discovered Christina in her bed, covered in a blanket. Christina Rose Carlin Kraft was born on November 11, 1983, on the southern coast of New Jersey, to Stuart Kraft, Dawn, and Carlin. She always enjoyed being photographed or videotaped. It ultimately shaped her life path. Christina graduated from Linwood High School in 2000 and spent several years working as a waitress in southern New Jersey and at the Borgata Hotel, Casino and Spa in a spa in Atlantic City. Christina's dream was to become a model, and her perseverance paid off. She eventually found success in this area. She stated in her promotional materials that she enjoys photo shoots, as well as exquisite underwear and swimwear. Christina's friend Eva Waltz, whom she met during a three-day shoot for Maxim magazine, described her as a sweet and charismatic girl. She is stunningly beautiful and has a great sense of humor. She had dark hair and blue eyes. She was the very definition of a fashion model. Christina has always wanted to be on the cover of Playboy while working as a waitress at Borgata Casino in 2003. Christina met Alex Sicatelli shortly after they began dating. Alex has always supported Christina's plans and has never been against her career. After a long-term relationship, they announced they were engaged. Alex and Christina were together until the latter's death, but Christina was still able to realize her dream. She won Cyber Girl of the Month in May 2009 and was invited to the Playboy Mansion. This success enabled her to attend parties at the mansion and gain entry into the world of glamour. It was the pinnacle of her career. 
and her ambitions were higher than ever, especially after meeting Hugh Hefner, whose attention was difficult to capture. Despite this, Christina was unable to secure a modeling contract with Playboy magazine. Thousands of girls submit photos there, but only one becomes a model. There are numerous reasons why Christina did not become the chosen one. She was already 26 years old at the time, which made her unsuitable for this magazine. She was viewed as a mature model rather than a young one. It shook her confidence, but she continued to work regardless. Her long list of modeling jobs included Redken, Maxime, Victoria's Secret, Vanity Fair, and many more, but she wanted to take her career to the next level, so she relocated to New York with her boyfriend Alex. However, not all brands were eager to work with the model featured in the explicit photo shoot. Christina's career began to decline following her appearance in Playboy, eventually coming to an end. It wasn't easy for her to get through this difficult time in her life, but she always felt Alex's support. Christina was known not only for her graceful appearance and alluring beauty, but also for her scandalous behavior. In 2016, she had an altercation with the staff of The Smith, a New York restaurant. Following this, the New York Post ran several articles about the incident. That's what the articles said. According to law enforcement sources and court documents, Christina Carlin Kraft, 34, and a male pal were dining at the Smith on March 6th when they got into an argument with manager Sergei Anakin over the bill. He did not want to pay. The manager intervened. A source claimed she was intoxicated and that the manager pushed her, but video footage of the incident showed she was lying. She allegedly hit Anakin in the neck around 10 p.m., causing redness and severe pain. According to the criminal complaint, Christina was charged with misdemeanor assault, attempted assault, and harassment. The DA then offered her a deal, and the charges were dropped on the condition that she remain out of trouble for six months. The DA made a reasonable offer, and we took it. Her lawyer said, Christina has always liked Philadelphia, particularly Ardmore, where she says she feels safe. With this in mind, Alex bought Christina an apartment in Ardmore and relocated to Pennsylvania with her in 2018, but Ardmore was not as safe as Christina had hoped. On August 18, 2018, she reported to the police that she had been robbed. Christina spent the evening at a bar in Philadelphia. The next thing she remembered was the following morning, when she barely awoke and realized she had been drugged with illegal substances. She didn't remember how she got home or who was with her. Alex was on a business trip at that time. She did not feel safe, and she kept expressing her concern. During the investigation, the police obtained CCTV footage showing a car driving up to Christina's apartment at around 3 a.m. Christina was unconscious in the back seat when the driver took the keys from her purse, entered her home, and stole over $50,000 in jewelry, designer handbags, pillows, designer sunglasses, a credit card, and personal documents belonging to Kraft. The perpetrator left for about an hour and a half before returning to the car and assisting Christina into her apartment. He opened the door, left her in the hallway, placed the keys in her purse, and drove away. The police were able to quickly identify the perpetrator using a credit card statement. Andre Melton, the driver who robbed her that night, had a prior criminal record. Melton was driving a rented 2018 Kia Sorento with a Virginia license plate. According to witnesses, police discovered the same car near Christina's house on August 17th. Police confirmed it, thanks to special license plate recognition software. While the police were searching for Andre Melton and returning Christina's stolen belongings, a far more serious crime occurred. Just four days later, on August 22nd, 2018, Alex Sicatelli called the police and asked them to check on his girlfriend, Christina Carlin Kraft. He was already on his way home and could not reach Christina. She was not returning any calls or texts. When he arrived home, he discovered that the apartment door was locked from the inside. He checked the security system and discovered that someone had opened the front and balcony doors at night. The police officers who arrived at the specified address had to break down the front door because it was locked from the inside. When the police entered the apartment, they noticed blood, which indicated that it was a crime scene. There was a body on the bed, covered in a blanket, lifting it. They noticed a severely beaten woman. 
Christina Carlin Kraft sadly had already died. There was no way to help her. There were marks of blows all over her body. Someone had broken her nose and left a strangulation mark on her neck. Later, someone strangled Christina with her sweatpants. As soon as they identified the victim, the detectives had to inform Alex, who was waiting outside, that his loved one had died. This news completely shocked him. Because those closest to the victim are frequently involved in such cases, the police did not rule out the possibility that Alex was the perpetrator. Christina and Alex have been together for a long time, so anything could happen between them. He was the one who called the police station and expressed concern about Christina, and she was later discovered dead. These two events may not have happened by chance. Perhaps Alex did it to deflect suspicion away from himself. The investigators invited the man to accompany them to the police station because they wanted to ask him a few questions. Alex consented without much hesitation. Alex informed the investigators that he needed to return to New York for work on August 21st. It was an urgent matter. And on August 22nd, at 2.30 a.m., he called Christina to wish her a good night, but she didn't answer. He knew Christina never slept at this time, so he became concerned. Alex called several more times, but received no response. He checked the security system and found suspicious activity in the apartment at night. As a result, he decided to postpone all business and return to Ardmore. After hearing his story, the police assumed Alex was not the one who killed Christina. After all, he could not be in two places at the same time. The police checked his alibi and removed him from the suspect list. But who was responsible for Christina's death? Who could wish her harm? Christina reported the robbery to police four days before her death. Investigators assumed that the two crimes were somehow linked. Thus, the primary suspect in this case was Andre Melton, the man who stole valuables from Christina's apartment. Maybe he returned to the apartment to steal something else. But his plan failed when Christina saw him. Perhaps he discovered that she had reported him to the police and decided to exact revenge on her for it. On August 22nd, the day they discovered Christina's body, police received an arrest warrant for Andre Melton. Investigators discovered where Melton lived, but when they arrived, he was gone. However, some of Christina's belongings were still present. The police obtained surveillance video from the night of the crime. It showed Christina exiting her apartment. After a few hours, she returned with an unknown man. It was 3.08 a.m. The police were surprised to learn that it was not Andre Melton. Further examination of the recordings revealed that the man with whom Christina returned to her apartment did not emerge. The police will eventually discover an explanation for this. Police officers used CCTV cameras on Ardmore streets to discover that Christina went to one of Philadelphia's bars after leaving the apartment. Investigators visited the bar and she was asked to review the CCTV footage. It showed her meeting a man who later hugged her. It was the same man who had accompanied her back to her apartment. Christina and her new friend left the bar and got into a taxi. For the next few days, the detectives collected data on all of Christina's movements on the day of her death. It was crucial to restore the chronology of events preceding the crime. The police immediately excluded Melton from the list of suspects since he was not with Christina that day. But what remained unknown was whether Christina's death was related to that robbery or whether it was just a coincidence. On August 25th, the police received another lead. Andrew Sanford, the taxi driver who drove Christina and the suspect that night, said that Christina and the man who accompanied her approached him. They didn't use the taxi app. After hearing the driver's price, they got into a taxi. According to Sanford, they were affectionate and sweet to each other, so they did not arouse any suspicions in him. Besides, the driver said that Christina took the initiative herself. When they arrived at the right place, it turned out that Christina had no cash with her. She offered to leave her credit card, but the taxi driver refused. Then, Christina's new friend offered him $100 on the condition that he would stay for 1,015 minutes near the house while the couple went to the apartment. Sanford left 20 minutes later, as neither Christina nor the man accompanying her returned. The couple entered the apartment around 3 a.m. An hour later at 4 a.m., Christina called her cousin. She didn't say a word 
but her cousin heard a man in the background telling Christina not to contact the police. The call ended before Christina's cousin could find out what happened. Why did the cousin not call 911? After what she heard, it remains unclear. Christina and Alex had door sensors in their apartment. It allowed the police to determine the time frame during which the crime occurred. The security system recorded the exact time of each door opening. As already mentioned, the first time someone opened the door was at 3.08 a.m. The next time was already at 5.10 a.m. The apartment was on the second floor. Apes, at about the same time. The system detected that someone opened the sliding glass door on the balcony. It explained why the surveillance cameras did not record the moment when the man whom Christina met at the bar left. After all, when the police arrived after Alex's call, no one except Christina was in the apartment. After learning this information, the police assumed the perpetrator jumped off the balcony. The next step was to seek help from the media. After posting the images from the surveillance cameras, they asked anyone who knew anything to share information. The pictures showed two people. The first was Andre Melton, and the second was the man who was at Christina's apartment on the night she died. Andre Melton, whose whereabouts detectives still couldn't figure out, called the police himself. He admitted that he stole some valuables from Christina but denied that he was involved in her death. The police were puzzled by this call. They have not yet been able to confirm or refute the connection between the two events that happened to Christina. Maybe this was just part of the plan of the two suspects. Melton was not going to surrender to the authorities. He called the police only to declare he wasn't involved in Christina's death. Soon after, on August 26th, the police station received an anonymous call. The man who called said he knew one of the suspects depicted in the pictures released by the police. We shared a room in a psychiatric clinic in Philadelphia, he said. As it turned out, not so long ago, the suspect chased a woman in Love and Park, Philadelphia. He followed her into the building of the local family court and started molesting her. Then he began to behave aggressively, shouting and destroying everything around him. The man had to spend 72 hours in a psychiatric hospital. The only problem was that he was admitted to the hospital without a name because no one wanted to deal with a not particularly dangerous person. The identity of the man remained a mystery to the police. But then the police heard even more crucial information. According to the caller, the suspect was proud that he had recently strangled a woman, and he felt great satisfaction and pleasure because of this. After hearing this, the investigators believed that it was most certainly the man who took the life of Christina Carlin Kraft. Later, the police station received another call. The man turned out to be a relative of the suspect from Philadelphia. He said that the name of the man in the photo was Jonathan Wesley Harris. He had previously served a prison sentence for robbery. Jonathan became a free man on July 15th, five weeks before Christina's death. After studying the entire biography of the man, it became clear that Andre Melton and Jonathan Harris had never crossed paths and were not familiar with each other. Therefore, the police ruled out the possibility of a connection between the two crimes. In addition, the police now had access to the messages Harris sent from his phone. On August 22nd, he texted a friend that he had met an attractive woman and was going to her apartment with her. On August 28th, when the police received an arrest warrant for Jonathan Harris, it was crucial to detain him as soon as possible. No one knew what else he could do. It wasn't an easy task since Harris left no trace. However, when investigators contacted Jonathan Harris's sister on August 29, 2018, she said he had recently bought a bus ticket to Pittsburgh. As it turned out, Jonathan was already on the bus when the conversation occurred. The Ardmore police couldn't do anything. The officers wouldn't be able to catch up with him. The Pittsburgh police were their last hope it was crucial to be in the right place at the right time. The police investigating Christina's death contacted the Pittsburgh Law Enforcement Agency and asked for help. They told them the exact time of the bus's arrival in Pittsburgh and sent a photo of Harris. The Fugitive Task Force set up an ambush, blocking all escape routes, and was ready to arrest the suspect at any moment. Soon, one of the employees noticed the bus approaching. They gave Harris time to calmly get off the bus so that he would not panic and take no action. 
About 10 minutes later, a policeman blocked his way. I saw his eyes darting. He was looking for an escape route, but it was too late. A Pittsburgh police officer later recalled when the officer asked Harris to introduce himself. The latter gave it a different name. He was arrested and taken to the police station. Detectives from Philadelphia came to Pittsburgh to interrogate him. They asked Harris to tell them everything that happened the night he met Christina. He said he had seen her several times in bars and nightclubs in Philadelphia. Christina Carlin Kraft misses the New York life. Such an abrupt change in life, rhythm, and environment influenced her. She often went to bars, cafes, and nightclubs. But she was always alone since Alex was constantly working, and she had not yet managed to make new friends. And of course, men at those bars and nightclubs often approached her because they saw she was alone. Harris was no exception. He said he was under the influence of illegal substances and alcohol that night. He met Christina. They chatted a little, had a drink, and she offered to go to her place. Harris claimed that Christina wanted to buy a banned substance from him. When they arrived, he asked the taxi driver to wait until he returned. He wasn't going to stay there. He stated they drank several bottles of wine together, entered into an intimate relationship by mutual consent, and used a prohibited substance, after which he told her to pay him $1,200. Christina refused to pay. It made him angry because he needed the money. They started quarreling about it. He said that Christina hit him with a bottle of wine, and the situation got out of control. In response, he hit her in the face, and she fell to the floor when she tried to call 911. He started strength wheeling her with sweatpants until she completely lost consciousness. Yet, there were several inconsistencies in his story. During a toxic, illogical examination, the experts found no traces of prohibited substances in Christina's body there was only alcohol. In addition, the suspect's statement that he hit Christina only once was also untrue. That meant Harris was lying. When the detectives informed him of the results of the toxicological examination, he admitted that he had lied. At first, he tried to convince detectives that he was not involved in her death because she was completely fine when he left her apartment. But at one of the following interrogations, he fully admitted his guilt. I panicked she was still breathing when I left. I covered her with a blanket because I didn't want to see her like this. I knew I had severely beaten her. In the end, Jonathan Harris confessed to detectives that he took Christina's life and then jumped off the balcony to avoid getting caught on camera. When the trial began, Harris, like many other criminals who confessed to crimes, declared that he was not guilty. However, the investigators did a lot of work, and there was plenty of evidence for Harris and his lawyer to lose. They expected the court to sentence him to 22 to 40 years for third-degree life deprivation and tried to avoid life imprisonment. However, the amount of evidence provided by the prosecutors easily convinced the court that it was an intentional crime. During the trial, the court heard the testimony of the man who shared a room in a psychiatric clinic with Harris. It was the same man who called the police earlier. He stated that Jonathan Harris had previously confessed to him of the crime by saying there is nothing like squeezing somebody and feeling their last breath leave their body. Christina's death had an unimaginable impact on her family. Everyone was furious at the way Christina was presented in the media. Harris lied about taking illegal substances. After the trial, Christina's stepmother said she was the absolute light in this world and he extinguished it. According to her father, Christina was a good person with a kind heart who made everything brighter. In August 2019, Judge William R. Carpenter sentenced Jonathan Wesley Harris to life in prison without the possibility of parole and gave Harris an additional sentence of 22 to 45 years behind bars. The judge tacked on the additional decades to send a message to future governors or pardon boards who might consider freeing him. When the judge announced the verdict, Alex Sicatelli turned to Harris and said, You're a coward. You strangled a petite woman weaker than you. Not only did you take my fiancé's life, but you muddied her name. You lied and said that she was using illegal substances. In December 2018, the police arrested Andre Melton in Philadelphia and charged him with the robbery of Christina Carlin Kraft's apartment in March 2020. The court sentenced him to one to four years. The judge also ordered Melton to complete three years of consecutive probation, 
meaning he will be under court supervision for a total of seven years. I would like to apologize to the family for any grief or pain that I caused. I am not the bad person like the district attorney is trying to make me out to be, Melton said before learning his fate. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video we look at a story from 2021 that involved two countries far apart. Shanae Brooke Edwards, 31, was an Australian citizen and a frequent traveler. One of her travels took her to the Eastern European country of Georgia, where she and I both enjoyed the frightening events that occurred to her. Shanae was born in 1989 in Warrnambool, Australia where she lived with her parents and older brother Tyson. There is little information available online about her youth and upbringing. However, this is how her loved ones described her. Shanae was an adventurer who enjoyed being in nature, a keen hiker, a motorcycle enthusiast, a genuine kind-hearted soul, and an animal lover. She was a happy, free-spirited person. She moved through life, making the kinds of deep, genuine connections that most of us save for a select few. She was generous, patient, loving, and kind to everyone who crossed her path, to name a few. The homeless she shared cafe leftovers with during her shifts and in Melbourne the orphaned children she taught in Colombia the Cambodian children she taught English to the Japanese students she tutored and, most recently, the pregnant stray cat who adopted Shanae and decided to become a mother on her terrace in Georgia. Shanae visited Georgia, which had long piqued her interest due to its natural beauty and history, and Shanae's boyfriend, Marielle Said, was also scheduled to visit this Eastern European country in 2019. He was a Lebanese national whom she met on one of her trips. They had broken up for a while, but when she and I moved to Georgia, they started communicating online and realized they still had feelings for each other, so they decided to reconcile. El Said wanted to fly to Georgia, but the country's borders were closed to unvaccinated individuals. Georgia is an ancient, proud and welcoming country known for its friendly people, the majestic beauty of nature and ancient temples, and its delectable cuisine. Shanai had high expectations for her trip to Georgia, and they were all met. She was content in the country and stayed there for nearly two years before her next trip. Winter I avoided. I lived in Tbilisi, Georgia's capital, and taught English which helped her earn a living while also allowing her to travel around the country and discover new and interesting places. She eventually made friends who shared her passion for travel. On July 29, 2021, she shared this photo on her social media account, captioned with the word joy. The photograph was taken during a scenic motorcycle ride. Shanae was a big fan of motorcycles. The next day, July 30, 2021, was sunny, so should I go hiking up M. Tatsminda? Please don't be too harsh on me if I mispronounce the name of this place. M. Tatsminda, which means holy mountain, is a major attraction in Georgia's capital. The Temple of Saint, David M. Tatsminda, located on the mountain's slope and surrounded by dense evergreen vegetation, is a popular tourist and city resident destination. On the 730-meter high mountain, there are observation decks that overlook Tbilisi, an amusement park, a Ferris wheel, and a restaurant. Shanae has rented a house near the mountain for the past 11 months. According to her friends, she frequently took walks in the woods and never encountered any problems or threats to her personal safety. On July 30, 2021, she left the house around 3.30 p.m. Surveillance cameras caught her walking leisurely through the city streets toward the hiking trail. She was last seen near the Church of St. Michael of Tavir, which sits at the foot of Mount Matata Minda and serves as a starting point for hiking. In the evening, she was supposed to meet some friends at a cafe in the capital, but she never arrived. Attempts to contact her by phone failed. She then denies that friends decided to file a missing persons report with the police. Around the same time, Shanae's friend in California sounded the alarm at 4.32 p.m. Shanae called her, and when she answered, she could hear her screaming, Please let me go. Okay, just let me go. You could tell Chennai was being attacked and wanted to be left alone. 
The call was disconnected. When her friend attempted to call back, no one answered. Different sources describe it differently. Shanae, a friend from California, did the following. Some news is out. Let's write that she posted to a Facebook group with members from various countries who are currently living in Georgia, asking someone to contact the police to report the disturbing call. Other sources claim she denies that her friend contacted the Georgian police and told them everything. Whatever the case, it is certain that within hours of Shanae's terrifying phone call, Georgian police became aware of it and immediately began to investigate the information they had obtained. Several hundred police officers and volunteers participated in the search. The search area was large, so numerous groups combed the slopes of Mount Antatsmunda. Police used search dogs and drones. Shanae could not be located before sunset. She hadn't returned home, her phone was turned off, and she hadn't gone to any of the nearby hospitals for assistance. This was not a good sign, as was confirmed the following day. Unfortunately, Shanae Brooke Edwards, 31, was discovered dead near a hiking trail on July 31st, following an extensive search. The perpetrator attempted to conceal the evidence of the crime, so we hit the body under tree branches while leaving the crime weapon. A knife was discovered not far from the body. Shanae's phone was eventually discovered on the mountainside. Upon further examination of the crime scene, police discovered an old, rusted shovel, a fireplace used needles, and numerous empty bottles. George's interior minister told local media that the police had some information that needed to be kept private in order to conduct the investigation. The ministry and police officers are doing everything possible to find the perpetrator. He stated that during the forensic examination of Shanae's body, 13 stab wounds were discovered, five of which were in the neck area, which indicated only one thing to the police. The perpetrator clearly intended to kill the young woman. Her neck showed signs of strangulation. Following her denial, authorities officially confirmed her death. The media reported that the crime was motivated by lust. The Georgian police, however, denied this information, stating that the forensic medical examiner found no evidence of a crime against the woman's integrity. Shanae's enraged boyfriend, Mayoriel Said, has vowed to find the perpetrator and exact revenge, no matter how long it takes. Right now, I only have one mission in life, vengeance. He stated, I don't care if I spend the rest of my life behind bars, justice will be served and the criminal will suffer as much as Shanae did. Shanae's death devastated her friends and was especially difficult for her family, who lived on another continent. The relatives had to deal with the issue of transporting the body home, while the police had to find the perpetrator. There is no doubt that the police are directly responsible for crime prevention and criminal investigation. However, in this case, there was another significant factor. George's tourism revenue exceeds $1 billion per year, and the fact that one of the travelers died in a popular location in the state capital may have had a negative impact on the entire tourism industry. The police interviewed over 200 people, including friends, co-workers, Shanae's neighbors, and park employees, and they investigated visitor routes as well as video footage of her movements that day. One local woman reported to an expat Facebook group that she heard a woman screaming on the trails below Metal Man to park about an hour after she and I left home. Another woman in the group reported seeing a disturbing sight on the mountain. She claimed that she and I went missing the day before. She had seen a man aggressively copulating with a woman near the crime scene. At the same time, the laboratory investigated the crime weapon and discovered a male DNA sample on it. There were no matches in the Georgian police database, so the samples were sent to 194 Interpol member states to be checked in their databases. Interviews with witnesses revealed that Shanae had no enemies, no conflicts with anyone, and no contact with people of questionable reputation. This could indicate that she was a random victim of a crime with an unknown motive. The police worked meticulously. Genetic samples were obtained from several dozen people who could have been involved in the crime. All were rigorously analyzed. As a result of extensive and multifaceted investigation efforts, the list of alleged perpetrators was narrowed until a DNA match was discovered. 40 days after Shanae's death broke Edwards, Georgia, police released the following statement based on evidence gathered during the investigation, which included testimony, surveillance tapes, genetic tests, and other evidence. 
According to the court's decision, the defendant, a man born in 1988, was arrested on September 8th of this year. Rafael Mursakalov, a Georgian citizen, was detained. His lawyer told reporters that Miraculous denies all of the charges against him, including robbery and taking Shanae's life, Brooke Edwards. He pleads not guilty. He had no involvement with the case. I have already seen him. We talked and decided on a position. He is exercising his right to remain silent. According to the lawyer, when information about the suspect's identity leaked to the press, Mursakalov's image was broadcast on television. Following that, a woman from Georgia and the Capitol posted on her Facebook page that her friend had been attacked by two wild beasts on Mount Emtats Minda a few months prior. Even though the police knew who the perpetrators were, the case was shelved. According to the woman's post, one of the attackers was Rafael Mursakalov. The author of the posts suggested that if the police had done their jobs properly, the Australian girl would still be alive. Rafael Mursakalov, according to the information he publicly shared on his Facebook page, was an activist for the ruling Georgian Dream Party. On September 10, 2021, a Tbilisi court refused to release Mursakalov on bail. While he was in custody awaiting trial, police officers obtained a testimony that was equally important to the irrefutable physical evidence. Following the attack on Shanae, Brooke Edwards, Mursakalov returned home and informed his brother and wife of the crime, warning them that if they told anyone, their young child would suffer the same fate as Shanae. In October 2021, the Edwards family released a letter describing Shanae and thanking everyone for their support. They expressed gratitude to Georgia for their financial assistance in repatriating Shanae's body, as well as the Georgian people for their ongoing attention, love and support during this difficult and tragic time. The first hearing on the case occurred in February 2022. According to Georgian law, Mursakalov faced 16 to 20 years in prison. He chose not to exercise his right to remain silent and pleaded guilty to robbery during the trial, but he denied that he killed Shanae on purpose. However, the prosecutor did not believe so. In his opinion, the number of stab wounds indicated that the defendant intended to kill the victim. He stabbed Shanae Brooke 13 times, including five in the neck, indicating that he intended to kill her. Furthermore, the prosecutor stated that after breaking his knife, the defendant strangled the victim. In turn, the defense insisted on classifying the offense as robbery. Mursakalov pleaded guilty to robbery, which was his motive. His lawyer stated that he had repented for his actions. In addition, the defense claimed that Miracle had mental problems and acted abnormally. Meanwhile, the examination found him miraculously sane, so the court had the authority to impose a proper punishment on him, depending on the nature of the crime. According to the prosecutor, Traces of potent drugs were discovered in miraculous blood following the arrest, but this in no way mitigates his guilt. More sacrilege, in his final statement, admitted guilt and apologized to the Shanae Brooke Edwards family. I sincerely apologize to the people of this country. I apologize to the woman's family. It's a loss I can't compensate for. Please forgive me. Whatever the sentence, I will remain silent and will not appeal it. I apologized, said more sackcloth, and wept. The alleged motive was the defendant's desire to take Shanae's iPhone 12. He was unable to do so because she threw the phone into a ravine. In any case, only two people knew what happened that day, and one will never speak again. The prosecution requested that the sentencing be postponed because Tyson Edwards, the victim's brother, wanted to be present. The family of Shanae Brooke Edwards issued a statement urging Georgia's justice system to sentence Rafael Mursakalov to life in prison. We lost our lovely girl. Tragically, she disappointed and devastated many of her friends and family. We are proud of Chennai's accomplishments in many countries during her short life. According to the Shinai Brooke Edwards family statement, Rafael Mursakalov was found guilty during the March 9, 2022 trial. Shanae, Brother Tyson, on behalf of the family, again requested that the defendant be sentenced to life in prison. Mercer Acula has apologized to Tyson Edwards, stating that he is not that type of person and that he simply got into this situation. As a result, Rafael Mursakalov, 33, 
received a 20-year prison sentence. According to Georgian law, the maximum sentence he can receive is 20 years. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On the night of December 1st, 2010, Staff Sergeant Nathan Payett was rushing. He arrived late for duty at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. By a strange coincidence, his alarm clock, which never failed to sound, did not ring today. Nathan awoke at 11 p.m. He woke up his wife, Michelle. He showered and said his goodbyes to his family. Then he went outside to the garage. He was just about to put on his uniform and start the car. Suddenly, loud shots rang out from behind. Mr. Payet's children and wife rushed to the noise on the doorstep, where Nathan was bleeding and staggering from side to side. It was clear he was about to fall. Michelle was terrified and rushed to pick up her husband, but not on time. Around 11.30 p.m., the father of the family collapsed on the floor. 911 received a call. My husband has been shot. He is bleeding. Help him, Mrs. Payette screamed into the telephone. The dispatcher immediately taught the woman how to administer first aid. Michelle attempted to administer artificial respiration to her spouse. However, it did not provide relief. After rescuers arrived, he was transported to the nearest hospital. The doctors did everything possible to save the patient. Despite this, the young man could not be brought back to life. Nathan Payette, 28, died as the result of a neck wound. Mrs. Payette was informed about her husband's death. Her life was divided between before and after an exemplary family man, a valiant serviceman, was murdered on the front steps of his own Las Vegas home. His death sparked a public outcry. Relatives, acquaintances, and concerned citizens awaited explanations from the police, who could decide such lawlessness. Motives drove the criminal, who was eventually brought to justice. We will try to analyze these and other questions with you. Nathan Joseph Villa Gomez Payet was born on February 12, 1982, in the village of Taumun in Guam. The island's territory does not belong to the United States of America, but it is a possession of the United States. At the same time, the United States sets foreign policy and does not interfere in domestic affairs. Guam is a small island in the Pacific Ocean known for its natural beauty and historical significance. This area is particularly popular with tourists. Nathan was not only born in a beautiful region, but he was also fortunate to have a large and loving family. He had three brothers named Matthew, Anthony, Eric, and Carmela. The children were very friendly and assisted their parents with everything. Nathan, unlike the others, never caused trouble. He was a caring child at home and a conscientious student in school. The boy was very sociable, so he quickly made friends. He was the company's soul. His name was frequently mentioned in rumors. Perhaps no one refused to communicate with him, recalled his brother Eric. Nathan grew up near the ocean and enjoyed swimming since he was a child. Later, he started surfing. He spent all of his free time at the beach, enjoying the sun and life. Nathan met his future wife while studying at South High School. Michelle Antoinette said the educational institution was in the neighboring town of Santa Rita. Chuck was drawn to him at first sight. Young people started to spend time together. Their affection for one another grew stronger with each passing day. They never separated. They studied at school, prepared for classes, and assisted with household chores. Tender love replaced strong teenage friendships. Michelle's family experienced terrible grief when she was 16 years old. Her mother died. As a result, the girl spent all of her free time assisting her sister Melissa, the eldest member of Chuck's family, in her role as mother and mistress of the household. Nathan encouraged her in everything she did and helped to care for the younger children in 2000. After graduation, Nathan decided to propose to Michelle, who gladly accepted. Their families did not have the opportunity to celebrate a wedding. As a result, the couple, with their parents' approval, decided to move in together to earn a living. The guy got a job as a receptionist at a nearby hotel. He didn't make a lot of money, but it was enough. Nathan and Michelle, like most young people, were ambitious. They planned for their own home and independence. Soon after their son Dion was born into the pilot family, their income was insufficient to cover the necessary expenses. 
As a result, the man considered a job that would allow him and his family to live comfortably. This desire drove Nathan to join the Air Force. Nathan was stationed at Elmendorf Air Base in Anchorage, Alaska, following graduation. Michelle was left alone with the baby, but the family was financially secure. Furthermore, the young people's dream became a reality after some time. They built their own home. It produced a second child, a daughter named Nayara. The family patriarch was a successful military officer. This fueled his desire to obtain everything that he and his wife had previously been denied. Michelle and Nathan married six years after they first became engaged. My mother was overjoyed that her youngest son was the first to go out and accomplish something Eric mentioned. In 2006, Nathan was assigned to the Davis Monthan military base in Arizona. He was promoted to weapons loading team leader for an SX Squadron's A-10 Thunderbolt attack aircraft. He was also trained in logistics, training and material management. Nathan clearly enjoyed and worked hard at his job. Most importantly, he acted with the best of intentions. He was a son of his country. One of his co-workers described him. In 2007, Nathan and his family relocated to Nellis Air Base. The new job was located near Las Vegas, Nevada. The young man was assigned as an assistant junior officer in charge of the supply section responsible for combat aircraft maintenance. The protagonist's family expanded alongside his professional development. The Payets soon had two more sons Drosten and David. Michelle fell in love with Las Vegas and believed it was the best place to live. So, Nathan decided to make her happy by selecting the most appropriate house for a large family one that was both spacious and bright. Furthermore, the future family home was 30 to 40 minutes away from the military base. Nathan used his savings to cover the down payment. The only thing left to do was carefully divide the family's income and expenses. Perhaps he could save some money for now, at least until Mr. Payets. Next prospects. She talked about organizing her daily life in the new house. However, the couple's demands gradually increased. The family spent more than Nathan earned, and the joy of purchasing a new home began to fade. It is well known that financial difficulties have ruined the relationships of numerous couples. Nathan and Michelle were no exception to this rule the man recognized that the deplorable situation needed to be addressed. So, in mid-2009, when the United States was at war with Iraq, Nathan enlisted as a volunteer his departure took six months. During this time, the family's situation improved dramatically, which Nathan couldn't help but appreciate. Sergeant P.I. made the decision to return to Iraq after a brief rest at home. Michelle was overcome with anxiety as Nathan put his life at risk. She had intrusive thoughts and the prospect of being alone with four children scared her. She was accustomed to a certain level of living and found it difficult to imagine otherwise. Mrs. Payette took up a job to distract herself from her worries. The new hire joined a corporate credit card telemarketing firm. Employment added variety and new acquaintances to the woman's daily routine. Michelle wanted to have her own safety cushion. She has not ruled out starting her own business in the future. So she actively pursued self-development and enrolled in the School of Aesthetics. Everything went as usual while Nathan was at home. When he left, Michelle became bored. The birth of the children. The couple's relationship cooled as a result of her husband's service and their constant travel. Nathan was away for extended periods of time and Michelle craved love and desire. So she took a lover. It was her colleague, Michael Rudolph Rodriguez, a 31-year-old handsome man and local womanizer. Additionally, the man was devious and dishonest. He spent 2007 in prison for forgery and attempted theft. Michelle was unable to resist sweet Rudy. They jokingly called Michael that behind his back. By the end of 2009, Nathan had returned home. The distance and ordeal seemed to benefit the family relationship, but this was not the case. The wife was playing a doubles match. She didn't want to lose her husband, who was having an affair on the side. As a result, she went to great lengths to please him. Nathan was fascinated by the changes that had occurred in her appearance and personality. The children had been raised without a father for a long time, which had a negative impact on their academic performance. He decided not to leave his family for an extended period of time. It never occurred to him that Michelle's dramatic changes could be linked to treason. Nathan was incredibly pure and faithful. To get double pay, he began working night shifts. In addition, Nathan began private teaching and created training for simplified baseball for young children. Michelle's pretense didn't last very long. 
When the usual standard of living began to fall, the spouse's attitude shifted to the opposite. The couple's relationship problems eventually escalated. Brother Eric and his wife Veronica paid the young family a visit during Thanksgiving 2010. For the first time, the guests strained relations between the payets. They had changed beyond recognition. Michelle and Nathan's former feelings appeared to have vanished entirely. Outsiders could see the couple's personal and financial problems, as well as an almost empty pantry and refrigerator. One week later, at 11.12 p.m., on December 1, 2010, Mrs. Pay and Mr. Rodriguez exchanged an unusual message. Michelle got a text message from Michael. I hope you're feeling better. The man wrote, the Van Dyke's contract for tomorrow is almost final. Two minutes later, he sent another message. If you're not feeling well, please let me know. I will give you a few days to rest. Remember, I appreciate your assistance. At 11.19 p.m., Michelle responded, my husband just woke me up. He is currently attempting to leave the house, but I believe he will be late today. I apologize the contract is causing you so much trouble. Several months before the tragedy, Michelle did not want to be with Nathan. She wasn't going to leave him because she realized breaking up would only result in headaches and empty pockets. I do not believe he will forgive and support me after the divorce. Michelle thought the alimony would be insufficient for a normal life. Furthermore, Mrs. Pay was aware of her husband's military insurance. If he died, the wife would be entitled to approximately $65,000 in payments. These sinful thoughts did not calm the sick woman's mind. She eventually shared them with Michael. He was surprisingly intrigued. Nathan's former lover's terrible idea evolved into a cunning plan. Rodriguez understood that Michelle and he couldn't do it alone. It was overly complicated. So he enlisted his friend, Corey Alexis Hawkins, in the criminal enterprise. The 33-year-old mercenary had approximately nine convictions, each of which involved theft or fraud. Corey, a hardened criminal, agreed to help in exchange for a large reward. He estimated his participation at $20,000. Michelle and Michael reached an agreement after careful consideration. A few minutes later, two more people joined their group. Korea's girlfriend Jessica Austin and her friend Shannon are both 23 years old. By the way, Jessica's friend was not very bright. She made a living by starring in adult films. Shannon was offered 5% of Korean Jessica's royalties in exchange for her assistance, and the generous payment turned the woman's head. The original plan was to shoot Nathan in his Chevrolet Tahoe. Following that, the criminals planned to drive the car containing the man's body and abandon it in the parking lot of one of the apartment buildings. Jessica had to purchase the necessary items for the crime men's gloves, a car cover, and fragrance. Shannon's job entailed confirming that Michael was with her on the day of the murder. Michelle felt ill on December 1, 2010, so she deviated from her usual schedule and returned home around 5.30 p.m. Michelle did not usually arrive this early. Her beauty school classes were ending late, around 10.40 p.m. Mrs. Pious Foot crossed the threshold of the house only five minutes before Nathan left for work. Michelle noticed her husband sleeping on the sofa that day. She awoke him and suggested they go upstairs to lie together. He did not object. That was the couple's last night together. Nathan, who was late for work, went downstairs. Michelle was corresponding with Michael right then. In order to avoid suspicion, the accomplices communicated using code words. The instigator and his accomplice were sitting in a black Cadillac SRX, parked just ahead of the future victim's house. The perpetrators wore latex gloves to avoid leaving any evidence. Michael realized that the sergeant's military training could work to his advantage, so he decided to surprise him and approach him from behind. Michael drew his pistol and shot Nathan five times in the rear. Michael quickly exited the garage, got into his car, and drove away. The perpetrators then fled to a previously designated location. They burned the clothes in the fireplace and disposed of the remaining evidence. After that, Michael and Shannon went to their hotel. In this way, the couple intended to create an alibi. In the meantime, Jessica worked on a thorough cleaning of the apartment where they were staying with the emergency services. Police officers arrived on the scene. They were stunned by what had occurred. The Payette family lived in an exemplary neighborhood. Detective Todd Williams first decided to investigate the shooting scene. The garage door was unlocked, and there was a strong odor of iron in the room. The walls of the car were smeared with blood, 
and traces of it could be seen on the floor next to Nathan's uniform, where his keys and wallet were. Because the valuables remained untouched, a robbery murder was ruled out. After examining the scene, Detective Lori Anderson decided to speak with the victim's wife. Michelle described what had happened. For some reason, she mentioned that the family was struggling financially. This gave the cops some ideas. Nathan may have been hiding something from his wife, such as gambling debts or an extramarital affair. At the very least, this would have resolved the attack. Furthermore, all evidence pointed to Nathan being deliberately set up. The police examined the victim's cell phone. It only included pictures of his wife and children, this convinced the officers that Mr. Payet was a decent person. The investigation continued. The next step in the search for the perpetrator was to canvas the area. Statistically speaking, there is always someone who witnessed or heard something. This was the case for Nathan. Some neighbors said they saw a car parked near the Payet house. The car was driven by a man in a brown sweatshirt. After the shots were fired, the vehicle immediately drove away. The detectives had finally found a lead. Nathan's family was shocked to learn what had occurred. His family was aboard the first flight out of Guam. They were waiting for responses. His mother, Carmelita Pei, cried the entire way. The woman could not believe her son had died so young. When the relatives arrived at the victim's home, Michelle threw herself into her mother-in-law's arms and passed out. Nathan's mother noticed something unusual in her daughter-in-law's reaction. For some reason, the fainting appeared fake. The investigators decided to speak with Mrs. Pay it again. They questioned her about the car that the witnesses had seen unexpectedly. She mentioned that her colleague, Michael Rodriguez, owned a similar vehicle. It's unclear why Michelle gave out this information. However, thanks to her, the puzzle started to take shape. Police later determined that Michelle had simply told the truth or that the perpetrator's plan was flawed. Detectives investigated Michael's identity and his criminal record raised suspicions. He was brought in for questioning and he responded calmly. Mr. Rodriguez stated that on the day of Nathan's murder, around 9 p.m., he went shopping at the supermarket and met an interesting girl named Shannon. They had a long conversation based on his words and then decided to continue their acquaintance in the hotel room. She confirmed the romantic encounter, however, the detective detected something to investigate, so the next step was to examine the information in the missing pilots. Phone specialists were able to recover Michelle's year-long correspondence with Michael. Their communication was interesting. On the day Nathan was murdered, the couple discussed a contract with a specific Van Dyke. The conversation was more akin to encryption than a business transaction. It was likely how the two men planned the crime. Investigators were almost certain that both were involved, but not enough evidence had been gathered. So they decided to let Michael go until the facts of the case were clear. After inspecting Michelle's cell phone, the detectives summoned her for questioning. She was clearly agitated and appeared to be hiding something. Michelle realized the officers knew more than she cared to know. So she informed them of her affair with Michael. She later admitted that a few months before her husband's death, she and her lover had planned to kill Nathan. The woman explained that she planned the action in order to collect insurance payments. Mrs. Payet justified herself, telling herself that she had repented and changed her mind. She seemed to have changed her mind during the crime's planning stage. She felt sorry for her husband and attempted to disrupt the plan. She turned off her husband's alarm clock. Michelle was counting on her accomplices to not wait for Nathan because they were missing him. However, the investigators did not believe in the woman's remorse. Her correspondence clearly demonstrated otherwise. She also sent Michael a cute smiley face immediately after learning of her husband's death. Shannon eventually came to the police station and confessed. The woman must have realized her situation. However, her role in the case was clearly exaggerated. She explained that Michael had forced her to give an alibi. Jessica asked for my assistance. Her friends wanted to teach a big lesson to the drug dealer. My sole responsibility was to conceal the involvement of one of the attackers. I thought it would be a way to get justice, she said. She went on to say that on the night of the attack, Michael told the entire truth. Shannon assured the police officers. When I realized I was being used, I immediately went to the police. In addition, I feared for my life. There's no telling what they would have done to me. The woman's statements were confirmed by the hotel's CCTV footage. It became clear that Michael and Shannon arrived at the hotel at 11.40 p.m. rather than 11 p.m., as Michael claimed. Her testimony led detectives to Jessica Quarry, 
who had previously denied any involvement in the case. He was aware of the consequences of pleading guilty as a repeat offender. Jessica did, however, reveal her role in the sinister plan. To honor the young sergeant's memory, Nathan's family and friends gathered on December 7, 2010. Michelle decided not to attend the ceremony in the chapel at the Nellis base because she was clearly not in the mood. Many comrades recalled the man's stamina and military prowess. The squadron commander spoke about his accomplishments for his country and family. Everyone regarded Nathan as a dependable comrade in arms. At the same time, they noticed his modesty and dignity. In his speech, Eric Payet mentioned how my brother has always served as an example for me and the rest of my family. He genuinely enjoyed life and was deeply committed to his wife and children. Nathan did everything for his homeland, love, and friends. On December 9th, the slain man's remains were transported to Guam. On December 15th, a requiem mass was held at St. Francis Church in Tamuning. The sergeant received military honors at Guam's PD City Cemetery. His funeral was spectacular. The cortege consisted of 36 motorcycles. Upon arrival at the burial site, six officers carried a casket draped in a U.S. flag. Then, 21 shots shook the sky. Nathan Payet received a hero's farewell. Michael Rodriguez, Corey Hawkins, and Jessica Austin were arrested without bail on December Hawkins, 2010. The next day, Michelle Eight faced the same fate, and the police were concerned about the accused's mental state. She was put under surveillance to keep her from committing suicide on January Payet. 2-0-114. The four accomplices appeared in Clark County District Court. They were charged with conspiracy to commit murder, armed robbery, and murder with a firearm. Michael and Corey were also charged with possession of a firearm. The trials lasted three years, and some of the defendants denied involvement. With a strong defense team, the defendants filed multiple motions. Their goal was to exclude specific evidence and proofs from the case. However, the court rejected all of the applications. They only delayed the inevitable punishment by moving the sessions from one day to the next. Nathan Payet's murder trial took place on September 21, 2015. Michael Rudolph Rodriguez was the first to stand trial in an attempt to avoid the death penalty. He pleaded guilty. Michael's appeal of his sentence was denied. The defendant showed no emotion as the sentence was announced. Apparently, he had no regrets about his crime. Michelle Payet's trial took place in a Las Vegas courtroom a month later, and the woman insisted that she had changed her mind about killing her husband. When the judge allowed Michelle to speak briefly in her defense, she addressed the murdered man's parents. With tears in her eyes, she apologized to them. I adored Nathan and our children. I was confused and made a big mistake, Michelle said, and I fainted again. The prosecutor stated that she did not believe the defendant intended to thwart the conspiracy. There was plenty of evidence to the contrary. No one could fathom how a woman, a mother of four, could become so cold-blooded. The judge agreed with the prosecution. Michelle was clearly involved in the crime, at least more than she admitted in court. Michelle eventually pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder with a firearm. This helped her avoid the death penalty. The Pirate family also asked the court not to impose the death penalty on their former relative. At the end of the hearing, the judge described Michelle's crime as incomprehensible and unfathomable. Corey Alexis Hawkins, a third defendant, took the stand in October 2015. In addition, to avoid the death penalty, the man agreed to a plea bargain. Corey was sentenced to life in prison. His attorney's request for parole was denied by the judge because the defendant helped plan the crime and was present at the time of the shooting. Jessica Austin also entered a plea agreement with prosecutors. She was eventually charged with conspiracy to commit murder. When Michelle was sentenced in March 2016, she again cited her unstable emotional state as the driving force behind the crime. She begged Nathan's family to ever forgive her. Carmelita Payet was a deeply religious individual. She could see that her former daughter-in-law was sorry for what she had done and was truly tormented by it. Her soul required forgiveness. As a result, Nathan's mother forgave Michelle in court. She went on to say that Michelle had already received the most serious punishment of her life. Your children do not want to see you anymore. Carmelita explained that they are afraid you will treat them the same way you treated their father. Eric Paid informed her that I believe Michelle was shaken by her mother-in-law's words. Her family will carry on without her, and the children will grow up knowing their mother was a murderer. 
Eric's wife, Veronica, also requested to speak out. She told Michelle that she despised her, and she went on to say that the relative dishonors the family name she carries in pursuit of greed and the love of a man she has never met. She became the murderer of the man she once loved deeply, with whom she shared a bed and planned a future. Could Michelle have imagined how her unbridled ambition would play out? Hardly. This group of people is constantly on the lookout for happiness while failing to appreciate what they already have. Nathan, unlike her, had spent his entire life giving of himself he was frequently sleep-deprived and jeopardized his health and life. Because of this, the man fulfilled his beloved's dreams but never received her recognition. The Payet children will suffer lifelong trauma. They will struggle to form strong families and socialize because their parents' painful experiences will be in front of them for the rest of their lives. There was only one positive aspect of this story. The four criminals will remain where they belong. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A young girl was found dead in her own apartment in an upscale apartment building that was under 24-hour security. The police tried to solve this gruesome mystery for two weeks, and only dozens of surveillance tapes helped them discover the sad truth. Sasha Simsurian was born on July 4, 1988, in New York City. After high school, she moved to Florida, where she graduated from a local university. After receiving her degree, she took her job as a social media manager for a real estate agency in Orlando. Her career took off quickly, and she received solid bonuses and awards for her good work. Sasha's friend spoke of her as a friendly, sweet, and outgoing girl with a big heart. She was a member of several charitable foundations, taking an active part in their activities. On October 16, 2015, it was the last day of the soccer season in Orlando. Sasha and her friends went to the stadium to support their favorite team. The match ended in victory, and the company went to the popular Attic nightclub downtown to celebrate. After spending there a few hours, Sasha left the club around half past one. As it turned out later, she hadn't told her friends where she planned to go. She could have gone home or to another bar. Before she left, she arranged to have breakfast in the morning with her friend Anthony, who was at the club that night. The next day, he arrived at the cafe at the appointed time, but the girl never showed up. She also did not answer her cell phone or social media messages. Such behavior was not typical for Sasha she was always in touch and would not ignore Anthony, especially when they had agreed to meet in advance. At first, he thought she was just slipping it off after the party last night, but several hours passed and there was no answer. Then the young man began to seriously worry about Sasha. Anthony, along with two of Sasha's closest friends, went to her apartment in the secure Uptown Place apartment complex, where she had rented an apartment for the past six months. When they drove up to her house, they found the girl's car parked in the parking lot inside the car. The friends noticed a box of children's toys on that day. Sasha was supposed to go to a baby shower at her acquaintance's house, but the gift was still in the car. When they got to the door of the apartment, they started knocking and calling out for Sasha, but all they got was silence. It all looked extremely disturbing in the... Friends decided to call 911. The squad arrived at her house around 8 p.m. The cops asked the guards to open the apartment door with the spare key and went inside. At first glance, there were no signs of a struggle in the apartment, but as soon as the officers entered the bedroom, a gruesome discovery awaited them. Sasha's arm and hair were sticking out from under the blanket of the bed. It was clear almost at once that the police were dealing with a murderer. There were clear signs of strangulation on her neck, in addition, her torn t-shirt was lying nearby, the same one the girl wore to the stadium. This could indicate that the attack took place immediately after Sasha came home. The pendant she always wore was also torn from her neck for Sasha's relatives and friends. This event came as a real shock. She had always been a kind and cheerful person, and it simply didn't make sense that someone would hurt her in such a cruel way by talking to the police. Her family and friends couldn't name a single person with whom Sasha might have had problems. Detectives began their search for evidence, and the first thing they noticed was the persistent smell of detergent in the apartment. He only partially succeeded, however. Detectives also found an empty contraceptive wrapper in the hallway and a shoe print near the girl's bed. Once in the bathroom, they found that the toilet seat was up, 
Despite the fact that the girl lived alone, experts found a fingerprint on it that didn't belong to Sasha. Clues were found in the apartment, and in addition, there were no keys. No smartphone and no purse belonged to Sasha. Soon after came the report of medical experts. They confirmed the girl died of strangulation. One of the doctors said he had never seen such severe injuries to the neck, as in this case this would seem to indicate that the attacker was physically well prepared. In addition, the experts determined that Sasha had been abused. They were also able to find a DNA sample from an unknown male on the girl's body. Unfortunately, there were no matches with him in the databases. In the meantime, the detectives began searching for witnesses and first questioned the security guard who was on duty that night. He was 33 years old. Stephen Duxbury, a former Marine, said the management of the apartment complex had hired men with impressive experience in the police army and other specialized services, but even that did not help Sasha. Stephen said he saw the girl that night. He said she was very drunk and tried to get into the building, but she couldn't. The girl was missing her case badge and smartphone. According to the rules, the security guard could not open her door without a pass ID or proof of her residency for this reason. Stephen refused to let her in some time later he went on a routine patrol and saw that Sasha had somehow made it onto the compound after all he assumed that the girl had entered the building with another resident who opened the door with her pass, but the girl ran into a new problem to get into the apartment she needed a key which she did not have each door in the complex also opened with a code lock but Sasha couldn't remember the right code should turn to Stephen and ask him to walk her to her car to look there for the keys again without the guard with his pass she would no longer be able to get into the complex. Steve went with her, but there were no keys in the car Sasha suddenly stated that she remembered the code to the door and they went back to her apartment, but there again the girl was unable to enter the correct password after the guard said he had to go back to his post he promised to help her. Solve the problem if at the time of his next round Sasha still could not remember the right code however the next time he went to patrol the area Sasha was nowhere to be found it was not until the morning that Stephen noticed her in the company of a man he had not seen in the complex before the guard failed to describe his appearance in detail so the police had to look for this unknown man practically at random. We could only hope that this man might have been caught on one of the 15 security cameras set up on each floor of the building and near the exit. In addition, the detectives requested footage from cameras located along Sasha's route from the club to his home a 10-block stretch on such a stretch that was almost 100 chance that the girl was caught in the lens of at least a few cameras after starting the footage from the club and the surrounding area investigators immediately spotted Sasha. They could see her leave the establishment and head in the direction of the house she stood out with her. Brightly colored outfit she was wearing white pants a purple t-shirt and flip-flops you could see these dark shots that the girl was stumbling and staggering slightly this indicated that Sasha had been drinking quite a bit of alcohol in the club which matched the security guard's testimony. It was also apparent that Sasha left the club alone a little little later another camera caught her and this time she was working in the company of two girls the police showed her pictures to Sasha's friends but no one recognized them they sled the detectives to believe that the three met on the street. It was important for the detectives to find these girls because they might have valuable information to do this. They sent their photos to the local media, and soon the women were identified during the interrogation. The girl said that they saw Sasha on the street at that moment. Two men approached her and tried to get acquainted with her given that it was late at night. The girls were afraid for Sasha and decided to walk home with her. This helped get rid of those annoying men. After walking some distance, the girl suggested that Sasha call her an Uber since she didn't have her fur phone or any other personal belongings with her. They went with her to her house and awaited until she got into the house. Even though you didn't have a pass, Sasha had to wait for some other gas to open the door. At 1.46 a.m., the cameras caught a man approaching Sasha and talking to her about something. It turned out that it was a resident of the complex who opened the door for her with his pass. Thus, investigators learned the exact time when the girl was able to get into the building. The man was no longer on camera, so the detectives did not consider him a suspect. The cops continued to study the footage, and 20 minutes later, they noticed something else interesting. All the cameras in the building also recorded sound, and at one point outside the camera's field of view, they heard footsteps. The investigators concluded that Sasha was walking next to this camera in the corridor of the building the next time she was spotted, was at 2.25 a.m., but already in the company of a security guard they headed in the direction of the parking lot, and then returned to the compound this also coincided. With Steven's story after that Sasha was not caught on any cameras and the detectives were at the standstill again, the police decided to question the guy Sasha had been in a relationship with in the past. This idea had to do with the method of murder more often than not strangulation is motivated. 
By passion, and the culprit is someone close to them, the first guy's name was Taylor again. Sasha broke up a long time ago, but continued their friendship. He worked as a bartender and was on duty until 9 p.m. On October 16th, he voluntarily provided the detectives with his DNA sample, which did not match the sample found on Sasha's body. A man named Ben was called next for questioning in addition to being in a relationship with Sasha, he was also the last person she wrote to before she died. Detectives discovered that at 5.12 a.m. Sasha had sent him a text message that only included his name, Ben. This was very strange, especially when. You remember that according to the story of the security guard and the two girls, Sasha didn't have her phone when she returned from the club. Investigators also learned that Sasha had planned to meet Ben this weekend. However, the man had an alibi on the night of the murder he was with France. In addition, he voluntarily provided a DNA sample, which also came back negative by that time the detectives had finished examining all the available camera footage and noticed something strange when questioned security guard Stephen Duxbury said that his shift ended at exactly 6 in the morning, after which he went home but one of the cameras captured him leaving the building at 6.36 a.m., and that was not all he was holding two large trash bags with red handles exactly the same ones were lying in Sasha's apartment, after speaking with the management of the apartment complex, the police learned that it was not the responsibility of the security guards to take out the trash. A logical question arises, why was Stephen late for work for almost an hour hiding this fact from the police and carrying garbage bags allegedly taken from Sasha's apartment, given all the suspicious points? Investigators offered the security guard a polygraph interrogation. When asked if he had ever entered Sasha's apartment, Stephen answered in the negative, and the machine recorded the lie. Next, he was asked if he knew how Sasha died. Three different questions came up. Was she poisoned, attacked with a sharp object, or strangled? Stephen's post jumped sharply. Information about the girl's cause of death had not been released anywhere, and the guard simply couldn't know. Even when the police came to Sasha's apartment with the other guards, they were not allowed inside. It turns out that Stephen could only know the correct answer if he was in the girl's apartment at the time of the murder. Despite all this, it is almost impossible to convict a person on the basis of a polygraph reading alone, so the police had to look for additional evidence. Investigators asked Stephen to show them the shoes he was wearing that night. He provided them with a pair of shoes and their soles did not match the footprint found in Sasha's apartment. However, the detectives also obtained a search warrant for his apartment where they found other shoes and they showed an exact match. Moreover, the fingerprints from the toilet in Sasha's apartment matched the events by taking his DNA sample. Experts quickly found a perfect match with a sample found of Sasha's body. Police learned even more gruesome details after examining Stephen's phone at about 5 a.m. He was searching on Google for how to quickly pick a combination locked door. The same one had been installed on the door of Sasha's apartment. Detectives finally found a severe bite mark on Stephen's arm, as well as numerous scratches on his body. All this was enough to arrest the man and charge him with murder. Goal. With that set of evidence, no one had any doubt about the conviction anymore. According to the investigation, Stephen saw that Sasha was heavily intoxicated and decided to take advantage of it. After waiting for some time after the girl entered her apartment, he opened the electronic lock and then he abused and killed the girl. Only one question remains unclear. Judging by the bites and scratches on Stephen's body, Sasha struggled to fight back and most likely screamed how come none of the neighbors heard that the house she lived in was quite old and the noise insulation there must have been. Extremely mediocre after Stephen had finished with Sasha, he began to cover his tracks. The man took cleaner from her closet, spilled it all over the apartment, and even on Sasha's body, he then collected all the evidence into bags which he later got on camera, with apparently he either didn't think about the fingerprint on the rim of the toilet bowl, or he forgot. Stephen's trial began in November 2017. His lawyer immediately demanded that several key pieces of evidence be excluded from consideration, because his client had allegedly been misled this included boots found in his apartment, as well as polygraph evidence the news media hyped the story, as if the judge was ready to honor the request, but that never happened all the evidence remained in the case file however even without it Stephen's chances of an equator were too small the lawyer also tried to play on the fact that the investigation did not have any camera footage showing his client entering. Sasha's apartment but this attempt was developed by the fact that his fingerprints and DNA were inside the apartment. Finally, the lawyer stated that there may have been voluntary sexual intercourse between Stephen and Sasha that night, and when the security guard left someone else broke into the apartment and killed her, of course this attempt also went nowhere. The trial lasted only a week, which is very short by U.S. standards. After a four-hour deliberation, the judge handed down a verdict life in prison for the murder, 
and an additional 15 years for the breaking and theft after the verdict was pronounced, Sasha's parents made a speech they thanked the police for their quick and high-quality investigation, expressed their condolences to Stephen's mother who was present at the hearing they noted that Stephen's parents had also lost their child that day shortly thereafter. Sasha's family sued the management of the complex, which was responsible for selecting security guards as well as the manufacturer of the code locks. During the proceedings, it emerged that other residents of the complex had repeatedly complained about Stephen's mobile station, but management took no action. As for the lock, lawyers for the Samsudian family insisted that the model did not meet security requirements. They cited as evidence an article that described how to open such a lock with a simple screwdriver in seconds in February 2019. They even tried to appeal his conviction, but the court dismissed his claim in memory of their daughter. Sasha's parents decided to help the families of other victims cope with their grief. With such a tragic experience under their belt, they could find the right words and phrases to ease their suffering. The outcome of this story is very sad. The man who had been tasked with guarding people turned out to be a murderer. Just a few queries on Google helped him open the door of someone else's apartment without too much trouble. The two girls who met Sasha that night deserve special mention. They didn't just call her a cab on their own account, but drove with her to make sure she got home and was safe. Unfortunately, it was within the walls of her own home that the main danger was such an alert. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys. Welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In February 2018, the quiet town of Deltona, located in eastern Florida off the Atlantic coast, was shaken by the brutal murder of a young man named Patrick de la Cerda. The 25-year-old man was discovered dead in his home, and the severity of his injuries indicated that the perpetrator harbored a personal grudge against him. The Patrick de la Cerda case is an example of a near-perfect, elaborate and planned crime that may have gone unsolved. Although the murderer was identified almost immediately, there was no direct evidence to prove his guilt. As later claimed, investigator Chad Weaver, who investigated the case, knew from the start that it would be a true detective worthy of a screen adaptation. What happened? Who is Patrick de la Cerda? Patrick de la Cerda was born in June 1992 in Miami, one of Florida's most picturesque cities. His mother, Patricia Runza, was born and raised in France, while his father, Max de la Cerda, was a native of Spain. But in the 1980s, he moved to the United States, where he married and had a son. The de la Cerda family was extremely friendly and cheerful. Patrick grew up in an environment of love, caring, and mutual respect. He was a very nice, intelligent, and sociable guy who did well in school, could easily become the soul of any company, and had a lot of friends. Furthermore, the boy was very close to his parents from childhood, and they spared no effort or money to ensure that their son received a good education and grew up to be a worthy man. The family patriarch had spent his entire life working in the construction industry and was a highly skilled professional. The family was not wealthy, but they were well off by city standards. After graduating from high school, Patrick decided to pursue a career in construction to continue his father's legacy. When the young man was in university, his parents decided to divorce after nearly 25 years of marriage. It should be noted that they parted in a quiet and peaceful manner, with no scandals, property division, or other issues. The mother relocated to the quiet town of Deltona in the state's east and remarried shortly thereafter. The adult son decided to stay in Miami with his father, where they both work and are well known in the construction industry. Despite the divorce of the parents, all family members remained close and friendly to one another. They were constantly in contact with one another, calling and communicating on a regular basis, and we were always available to assist when needed. Patrick paid regular visits to his mother in Deltona, where he told her about everything going on in his life, including his joys and experiences meeting the girl of his dreams, due to his French and Spanish heritage. Patrick had a bright appearance and enjoyed great success with fair sex from a young age, but it had always been an example of the family in which he grew up so he did not seek frivolous and fleeting affairs. He dreamed of a bright mutual feeling in his own strong family. De La Cerda met the girl of his dreams by chance on the internet, on one of the popular sites where lonely hearts find each other. He registered and created an account at the suggestion of a friend. 
but he didn't fully believe that he could meet his soulmate there. One June evening in 2017, he was browsing the site's girl profiles without much enthusiasm when his attention was drawn to a photo of a searing brunette with an unusually bright appearance. She had big, bottomless eyes and a lovely smile. Patrick was completely enchanted and decided to write to the stunning stranger. She responded to his message, and they began to communicate more comfortably. The girl's name was Jessica Devnani. She was born in 1988 in Orlando, Florida, which is located in the state's central region. After graduating from high school, she enrolled in one of the local universities to study banking, and after graduation, she worked at a bank branch in her hometown of Orlando. Jessica was also immediately drawn to the handsome young man. They exchanged phone numbers after a few days of active correspondence on the website. For the next few weeks, they called each other every evening and talked for hours about anything. The couple quickly established mutual sympathy and trust, so the young people decided to meet in person. Because they lived in different parts of the state, they chose a location about halfway between them for the meeting. Already on the first date, Patrick realized Jessica was the girl he had been looking for and now refuses to let go. She liked him right away, and Jessica was perplexed by the age difference because she was four years older than Patrick. On the way home, Patrick called his mother and told her that he had met the girl of his dreams, whom he wanted to marry and start a family. Patricia recognized the joy and excitement in her son's voice and knew he was serious. She was happy for him. This long-distance relationship lasted several months and posed a significant problem because the couple could only see each other on weekends and in neutral locations. Usually, they rented a hotel room in a cozy, secluded location and simply enjoyed each other's company. However, everyone flew home on Sunday night because they had work the next morning. Marriage proposal. To be closer to his sweetheart, Patrick relocated to Deltona, where his mother lived, in December 2017. He purchased a house in a quiet neighborhood and began repairing it, preparing a cozy nest for his chosen one's move. Jessica couldn't leave work right away, so they planned a housewarming party for early spring next year. On New Year's Eve, when the couple met, the young man decided to surprise his girlfriend. He set up fireworks in the backyard of the house, and, as Jessica watched the fireworks, she got down on one knee and held out a box with a ring, asking her the most important question. Will she become his lawful wife? Jessica was overjoyed and unsurprisingly agreed with him. Patrick admitted that he had been looking for an engagement ring for a long time, but had not found the right one in any of the jewelry stores. He believes that none of them are attractive or refined enough for such an occasion. He chose the best of what was available in order to make a proposal before the new year, but then ordered another from the jewelry workshop an exclusive ring designed by the young man himself. Something had happened to Patrick. Two months have passed since the engagement. Preparations for the wedding and upcoming housewarming were underway. Their parents approved of the couple's decision, and they were ecstatic to be embarking on a new chapter in their lives. The young people intend to hold a lavish celebration in Miami on the Atlantic Ocean's shores, or in France, the groom's mother's homeland, on February 27. 2018, Patrick's father, Max de la Curta, got a call from a courier. The father's phone number was added as an additional contact. The courier confirmed that his son's order had been delivered to the specified address, but the customer does not open the door or answer the phone. This was so unlike Patrick, so the father was immediately concerned. However, because he was at work at the time, he was unable to pick up the order while also checking on his son's well-being. Max decided to ask his future daughter-in-law. He called Jessica and his voice was filled with anxiety as he explained that he could not reach his son. Jessica had attempted to contact her fiancé since the morning, but he did not return messages or make calls. When she mentioned this to Patrick's father, Max concluded that something had happened to Patrick. Jessica immediately dropped everything and dashed to the groom's house. When she pulled up, she immediately noticed Patrick's car in the driveway, indicating that he hadn't left. She had her own key. Jessica entered the yard and called out to her lover several times. However, there was no response. Jessica carefully opened the front door and discovered a terrifying image. Her fiancé lay practically at the entrance in a pool of his own blood. He showed no sign of life. Jessica immediately called 911, but when paramedics arrived, they were unable to help Patrick and declared him dead. By the time the cops arrived, 
Jessica was sobbing in the backyard of the house where Patrick had proposed two months prior. When one of the officers approached her, she simply looked at him and told him she knew who had murdered her lover and destroyed her entire life. A wealthy and powerful ex-boyfriend can help you understand this difficult situation and to understand who would want to kill a young guy who appears to have no enemies or ill wishes, you must go back in time to when he and Jessica first met. The girl was then in a relationship with Gregory Bender, a wealthy businessman who ran his own investment fund. Jessica met Gregory while she was a student. He was 20 years older than her, and he literally turned the young lady's heads. The businessman wooed her beautifully, gave her expensive gifts, and took her to luxurious resorts. Jessica believed she had found her one and only love, but she soon noticed some oddities in his behavior. Gregory sought to exert control over his girlfriend by closely monitoring where she went and who she communicated with. If Jessica had an admirer, he quickly got rid of him with threats and intimidation. At the same time, he told her very little about himself. This relationship lasted nearly eight years and Gregory never revealed his chosen one to his family or friends. Gregory rarely invited his girlfriend to his house, and they only met, spent time together, or went on vacation when he wanted to. He argued that he was extremely busy. Jessica, of course, wanted to have a normal family and have children. But Bender insisted that it was not yet time for that, and when she tried to end the relationship, Gregory gave her a ring and proposed marriage. Jessica agreed, but nothing had changed. They continued to live apart and only saw each other when the groom said so. Gregory was involved in a car accident that left him in a hospital bed. Jessica rushed over to him when she heard about it, but first she stopped by his house to get some items for Gregory. Jessica encountered a woman she had never seen before and inquired as to her identity. Rather than responding, the stranger asked her a similar question. Jessica showed the ring on her finger and announced that she was the bride of the house's owner. The woman then laughed and showed her the ring, claiming to be Bender's legal wife, Damara Sanchez. Bender... After such a shocking revelation, Jessica decided to immediately end her relationship with the businessman who had cheated her for so long. However, the boyfriend began to literally pursue Jessica, begging her to return and promising to divorce Daymara in the near future so that they could marry. She renewed her faith in this man. But time passed, and nothing about their relationship changed. Jessica became tired of this affair and filled out a questionnaire on a dating site where she met Patrick. After beginning to communicate with him, she made the firm decision to end her relationship with Gregory, which she informed him of, but he refused to let go. Obsessive stalker. Bender initially persuaded Jessica to return to him and try to restart their relationship, promising to divorce his wife. He then proceeded to make threats and harass others. When he realized that all of this was pointless, he decided to look for a rival about whom he knew nothing. He had to hire professionals to hack into Jessica's account and discover who she was communicating with. Gregory began sending Patrick threatening messages and demanding that he break up with Jessica, whom he referred to as his fiancée after discovering his identity and obtaining his contact information. Patrick did not react to the threats and remained calm, believing that the situation would not escalate beyond threats. But Jessica was terrified because she realized her ex-boyfriend could expect anything from her. He was a wealthy and well-connected man, with an extensive collection of firearms at his disposal. Jessica suggested that Patrick end their relationship before anyone was hurt, but he refused. Then they decided to contact the police, providing evidence that Bender was stalking and threatening them. The couple obtained a restraining order against Gregory, preventing him from approaching them or attempting to make contact in any way. Gregory was also ordered to surrender all firearms stored in his home. Things settled down for a while, and the lovers began to believe that the stalker had left them alone. Jessica, on the other hand, persuaded Patrick that it was necessary to install CTV cameras around and inside the house because she was concerned that Gregory would break the bane, conduct a crime scene investigation, and test the first theory. But let's return to the tragic events of February 27, 2018. During the initial examination of the crime scene, the criminalist immediately ruled out the robbery theory and stated that, Based on the nature of the mutilation, this murderer had a personal motive and literally despised his victim. A 25-year-old man was found with gunshot wounds in his thigh, chest, and head. The experts also discovered injuries and bruises consistent with a fall from a ladder. 
The body was lying on the floor between the front door and the stairs to the second floor. Investigators suspected that the killer had snuck into the house and was waiting for the owner on the second floor. When an unsuspecting Patrick entered and climbed the stairs, the intruder stepped out to meet him and fired the first bullet into his leg. The wounded young man rolled down the stairs and the perpetrator followed him down, firing another bullet into his chest before killing the victim with two follow-up shots to the head. The murder weapon was not discovered, but it was a rather uncommon model of pistol that was difficult to obtain. The first shell casing was discovered on the second floor of the house. Two more similar shell casings were discovered downstairs, but the fourth casing was not present, so it was assumed that the perpetrator took it with him, possibly as a trophy. Despite Jessica's claims that she knows who killed her fiancé, the first person suspected was the murdered man's neighbor, with whom he had a serious disagreement a few months prior. The man was a combat participant and veteran of the United States Army who was injured and severely concussed during the war, resulting in a mental disorder. He was an expert with firearms and could easily obtain a rare model of gun in December 2017. The veteran mistook his new neighbor for a burglar and opened fire. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but the neighbor was admitted to a psychiatric hospital due to an exacerbation of his condition. After he returned home, he continued to follow Patrick, calling him a spy and promising to expose him. The mentally ill neighbor may have a motive based on his unhealthy imagination. So the man was detained and decided to interrogate Patrick. He made no secret of his dislike for him. However, at the time of the murder, he had a complete alibi, which was confirmed by several people looking for evidence and attempting to provoke the perpetrator. So the original version of the robbery was canceled because everything in the house was in his proper place and the money and valuables remained untouched. Only hard disks containing recordings made by video surveillance cameras were missing, making it impossible to determine who entered and exited the house that day. In addition, no evidence was discovered at the crime scene. Forensic experts were unable to locate a single fingerprint, shoe print, or DNA trace. The murder was meticulously planned, and while the investigation had little doubt that Gregory was responsible, it appeared at the time that he would get away with it. The police decided to go undercover and ask Jessica to call her former lover and invite him to a candid conversation. Jessica agreed without hesitation, dialing Bender's number and making a spectacle of herself. She blamed him for what had happened, cried, and repeatedly asked why he had done it. However, Gregory appeared to have figured out what the investigators were up to from the start and persisted in pretending he didn't know. When Jessica revealed that he had killed her fiancé, the businessman pretended to be surprised, and after expressing his condolences to the ex-girlfriend, he attempted to persuade Gregory to confess in order to enrage him or force him to make a mistake, but it never worked. The police had no reason to stop or question the man. He could only be called to testify, but he followed the restraining order and appeared to have let his ex-girlfriend go long ago. The Killer's Notes while the investigation was treading water looking for leads, the police received a call from Daymara Sanchez Bender, who claimed to have important information about the Patrick de la Cerda case. The woman was immediately invited to the station for an interview, during which she stated that shortly before the crime, she noticed a strange notebook on her husband's desk in his office. Looking into it, I discovered a detailed plan of some stranger's house, along with a strange algorithm of actions. She had not paid attention to it at the time. However, when Daymara saw a news report about a young man's brutal murder and the story showed the plan of his house, she immediately remembered the sketches of her unfaithful husband, with whom she was on the verge of divorce, and decided to tell the investigators that this information gave the uh, police enough reason to search the alleged perpetrator's home. The mysterious notebook about which the businessman's wife spoke was found in the office, but the pages containing the house plan and other records had been removed. However, they were quickly discovered in the office, but in a trash can that Gregory had apparently failed or forgotten to empty, he simply ripped out the pages, crumpled them up, and tossed them away. Apparently, he was confident that his house would not be searched because the sheets of paper contained no evidence against him. In addition to the layout of the house, there was a detailed plan of the crime itself, indicating that the criminal had planned extensively and thoroughly, working out every detail. It was specifically mentioned that the phone should be turned off, gloves should be worn, and shoe soles should be lubricated with a special compound to avoid leaving traces on the floor. 
The records revealed that Gregory followed his victim, knew when Patrick returned home and was aware of the presence of surveillance cameras in the house and yard. In addition, Gregory disposed of the crime weapon, dirty clothes, shoes and gloves. He was only disappointed because his own records had not been destroyed in time and by his wife's curiosity. In addition, a fourth missing shell casing was discovered on the table in a cigar box that the gunman was supposed to have taken as a trophy. Forensics determined that it was the same shell casing from the crime scene. The trial and defense attorneys attempted to shift the blame onto Jessica, but the evidence was sufficient to arrest Gregory and begin the trial. The main issue was that all of the evidence found could be considered circumstantial because the criminal weapon was never found. There was no evidence that the accused had ever visited the victim's home and there were no witnesses. Bender's trial didn't start until May 21, more than three years after the atrocity. During this time, he hired the best lawyers who had enough time to fully prepare for the case. The businessman was upbeat and appeared to believe he'd get away with it. Jessica was a key witness. She detailed her long-term relationship with Gregory, including how she discovered he was married and attempted to end it, as well as the harassment and threats he made against her and Patrick. She provided saved screenshots of correspondence and phone records. In response, Bender's attorneys attempted to shift all of the blame to Jessica. The defense claimed that Jessica provoked Gregory with her behavior by registering on a dating site and beginning a new relationship while still in a relationship with Gregory, which hurt his pride and ego. Jessica was also accused of mercantilism, with some claiming that she enjoyed receiving expensive gifts from wealthy suitors. In the main evidence sheets containing records of the murder plot, the lawyers described it as a fantasy of a wounded man seeking vengeance on his rival. At the same time, the defense claimed that the defendant's involvement in the crime was limited to plans and fantasies, so no traces of him were discovered. Furthermore, the lawyers claimed that the search of their client's home was illegal and violated, so the second evidence was a shell casing that he could simply plant in the process. The crime weapon was also not discovered, and Jessica identified the model of the gun from a picture, claiming that she had previously seen it in her boyfriend's collection, but she could be mistaken because she was not well-versed in weapons, according to her ex-wife's testimony and final verdict. At one of the sessions, the defendant's now ex-wife, Demara Sanchez, was called as a witness. The man who had previously appeared indifferent suddenly became animated and confessed his love for her. The ex-wife was moved by this confession and appears to have changed her mind about testifying against Gregory. She erred in her testimony, citing forgetfulness, and finally stated that she had lived with the man for many years and doubted his ability to commit murder. Despite defense attorney's attempts to challenge the legality of the defendant's home search, his ex-wife's unexpected statement, and a lack of direct evidence, the jury found Gregory Bender guilty of first-degree murder after hours of deliberation. He received a life sentence and will never be eligible for parole. As the judge read the sentence, the defendant stared at Jessica, seemingly without blinking. He was literally glaring at her, making her feel sick and nearly causing a panic attack. She sat next to her late fiancé's mother and, at one point, started sobbing and choking. Despite numerous attempts by Bender and his well-paid lawyers to appeal the verdict and have the case reviewed, all of their appeals were denied. Not least among these factors was the case's widespread societal resonance. Because a wealthy millionaire businessman murdered a simple working man in cold blood and attempted to evade justice. Patrick de la Cerda's story received widespread media coverage. Gregory Bender is still behind bars at the moment. Jessica Devnani says she feels safe and will continue to live for Patrick and honor his memory. She wears the ring that he gave her as a gift. In addition, Patrick never gave her the exclusive piece of jewelry he promised. Jessica has a close relationship with her deceased fiancé's parents who treat her like their own daughter. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will discuss the events that took place in Texas. On April 4, 2011, Robert Frisbee arrived at the police station because he couldn't find his 17-year-old daughter, Bridget. Robert assumed she had spent the night at her friend's place, 
But when Bridget did not return home, he became concerned and attempted to contact her via phone. All of his attempts were unsuccessful. So Robert headed to the police station. Bridget was born December 17, 1993. There isn't much information about her early life because she was raised in an orphanage before being adopted by Catherine Randall Frisbee and Robert Frisbee at the age of 18 months. When I mention Robert and Catherine, I'll refer to them as Bridget's father and mother, not her adoptive parents. Bridget grew up to be a cheerful, energetic, and inquisitive young lady. She enjoyed poetry, painting, and horseback riding. Unfortunately, the difficulties that had followed Bridget like a shadow since birth did not fade as she grew older. Catherine Frisbee, Bridget's mother, died from a long illness when she was six years old. Her passing was heartbreaking for both Bridget and her father, Robert Frisbee. Catherine died at age 49. Robert tried everything to make his daughter happy. They had a warm, trusting relationship, but Bridget was getting older and her rebellious side began to show. On April 3, 2011, teenagers riding motorcycles through the woods on the outskirts of Katy, Texas, noticed something suspicious on the ground among the trees. They decided to stop and take a closer look at what they saw. As they approached, they discovered a young woman lying on the ground. She was clearly dead and had been lying there for quite some time. They reported the discovery of the body to the police. The police officers who arrived at the crime scene quickly determined that the location where the teenagers discovered the young woman was the site of her death, but she didn't have any identification with her. The detectives had no idea who she was or how she ended up in the woods. Thus, one of the detectives' primary responsibilities was to identify the victim. She looked about 20 years old. When the expert examined the body, he discovered an entry bullet hole in the back of the victim's head. The bullet passed through and through as evidenced by the exit wound on the forehead. Police discovered a 9mm pistol shell casing next to the body. At the time, the shell casing was the only clue that could be used to solve the case. When investigators examined the crime scene, they discovered another suspicious detail. There was a small hole a few yards away from the body. It was clear that someone had removed the topsoil, but it was unclear whether this was related to the crime. In search of answers, the police began interviewing residents near the crime scene. It was a quiet, wooded area, and residents became concerned about their safety after learning about a brutal crime committed near their homes. The police wanted to know if they had seen anything strange. Perhaps someone noticed strangers or unfamiliar cars near their home. Any clue was valuable. The officers went door to door, but no one reported seeing anything unusual. However, one of the locals stated that she had heard something strange. She spent the night before with friends in the backyard. At approximately 2 or 3 a.m., they heard a loud bang, like a gunshot. They paid little attention to it and did not call the police. At the time, this was not a major concern. However, learning about the discovery of a dead young woman nearby has raised serious concerns. Thus, the police estimated that the crime occurred between 2 and 3 a.m. No other residents have provided significant information to the police. To solve this case, Detectives first had to identify the victim. In most cases, the perpetrator and victim know each other's names, occupations, social circles, and enemies. The police were able to track down the criminal detective, who began reviewing missing person reports in the hopes of finding someone who matched the description of a young woman found in the woods, but no one did. The following day was April 4, 2011. Robert Frisbee visited the police station. He became concerned after learning that the police were investigating the death of a young woman whose identity had not yet been determined. Robert couldn't contact his 17-year-old daughter, Bridget. He informed detectives that he had last seen his daughter two days ago. She thought she was spending the night with a friend. He began to worry when she did not return home. Robert's worst fears were confirmed when the detective showed him photos of the crime scene. He recognized Bridget among them. And this, of course, caused him unimaginable emotional distress. Many years ago, he lost his wife, and now he's lost his daughter, whom he loved despite her rebellious nature. The investigators asked him to describe everything about the last time he saw his daughter and the events leading up to his visit to the police station. The police now knew the victim's name, giving them hope that they would be able to find the person who killed Bridget quickly. Robert Frisbee testified that he had last seen his daughter on April 2, 2011. That day, he bought her a new rave outfit, including blue, green fox fur leggings, a skirt, and a top. Kendall Suto, Bridget's friend, visited them in the evening and stayed for dinner. 
Robert drove Bridget and Kendall to a rave party, but it was closed, so they returned home shortly after 10 p.m. Kendall's ride was supposed to pick him up at midnight, so he and Bridget settled in to watch a movie. Bridget was still dressed in her new rave outfit when Robert went to bed and set the alarm for midnight. When he awoke, Bridget informed him that the candle ride had not yet arrived. When Kendall left, Robert wanted to lock up the house. When Robert awoke at around 3 a.m., he discovered the back door and garage door open. Bridget could not return without the man's knowledge because he was locked up. Then he realized his cell phone was missing. He had recently taken away Bridget's phone, so he assumed she had taken his when she went out. Robert repeatedly called his cell phone and searched the internet for its GPS location. He gave up waiting for her to return after being unable to contact her or locate the phone. The next day, he called several of Bridget's friends, but none of them knew where she was. Later that evening, April 3, he read on the internet about a body discovered nearby and began to suspect it was Bridget. He therefore decided to contact the police. Thus, based on Robert's information, investigators had their first potential suspect, Bridget's friend, Kendall Sudo. But Robert Frisbee didn't think Kendall could hurt Bridget. He claimed that only one person could have personal motivations to harm her. Bridget's ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson, with whom she had a complicated relationship, became the second potential suspect. Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, was also considered a suspect by investigators. They needed to know what these three people were doing and where they were during the crime. The first person investigators decided to speak with was Bridget's friend, Kendall Suto, who was at Frisbee's house and may have been the last person to see her alive. Kendall had no prior issues with the law. When the police called, he agreed to meet with them. During a conversation with detectives, he admitted to watching TV with Bridget on the night she died. However, Kendall allegedly left Frisbee's house shortly after Bridget's father went to bed. He denied involvement in Bridget's death, claiming they were friends, and he had no reason to harm her. The man was prepared to provide the investigators with any assistance they required. He mentioned it while he and Bridget were watching television. She was upset due to a disagreement with her ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson. They were together for several months, but the relationship was troubled and they eventually split up. Investigators checked Kendall's alibi, which appeared to be confirmed. Nonetheless, he was not removed from the suspect list because the case was still unclear. Next, the investigators decided to approach Jonathan Larson, whose name they had already heard from several people, in the hopes of catching him off guard. They showed up at his house without warning. However, they were not expecting a pleasant surprise. The house was empty. Larson's family apparently left the house quickly. The most surprising thing, however, was what the investigators discovered outside the windows. The front door and walls were bullet, ridden, as was revealed three weeks prior to the police visit. Someone fired all of those bullets at Larson's family home in a drive-by shooting. The police department investigating the murders was unaware of the shooting because no one was injured. When someone shot the house, the owner called the police, but the case remained unsolved. The police only had shell casings and bullets, but they had no idea who was responsible for them. After interviewing the neighbors, the investigators discovered that the next day after the drive, they shot Larson and fled because they felt unsafe. Detectives were now investigating whether Bridget Frisbee's death and the shooting at her ex-boyfriend's house were connected. Let me remind you that Bridget's body was discovered on April 3, 2011 and the drive-by shooting happened three weeks ago, on March 14. Jonathan Larson was identified as the primary suspect, so the police began searching for him. During the investigation, police went to Bridget Frisbee and Jonathan Larson's school. The school administration stated that Jonathan had not attended school in several days. When they couldn't find Jonathan, they decided to speak with Bridget's classmates. They wanted to know who she was feuding with, who might wish her harm, and if she had any enemies. Alexander Olivieri was among those with whom the investigators spoke. He claimed that he and Bridget were friends who frequently spent time together. Alexander claimed that Jonathan Larson was the only one with a motive to harm Bridget. When the investigators asked Alexander about the last time he saw Bridget, he stated that they were supposed to meet on the night she died. They agreed to meet at her house, then traveled to Houston together to pick up Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, at the bus stop. Alexander stated that he arrived at Frisbee's house with his friend Alan Perez, but Bridget was not present. She was supposed to be waiting for him on the street near the house, but she was nowhere to be found. 
Alexandra Olivieri stated that he and Alan Perez returned to Frisbee's house a few hours later, but Bridget was still not present. According to him, it was around 5 a.m. No wonder Bridget was not at home. She had already died by that time. Olivieri stated that he learned about Bridget's death from a news report. After visiting the school, the investigators added two new names to their list of potential suspects, Alexander Olivieri and Alan Perez. However, the main person of interest in the investigation remained the same, Bridget's ex-boyfriend, Jonathan Larson. Detectives discovered that Jonathan's mother did not leave the city following the drive, by shooting. She lived in a friend's apartment for a while. During a conversation with investigators, she stated that she sent her son to live with relatives in Austin, Texas. Following the incident, the woman stated that her son frequently got into trouble, and she was certain that their house had become bullet, ridden as a result of him. That incident, she believed, was a form of vengeance against her son. She also claimed Jonathan fought with another man shortly before the drive-by shooting. She was certain there was a connection between the fight and the shooting at their house. The woman's relationship with her son was not ideal. She had no idea where Jonathan was at the time of Bridget Frisbee's death. She gave officers the address of her relatives in Austin, where she claimed Jonathan was supposed to be. However, the case's breakthrough came before the investigators discovered Jonathan. A lawyer representing the Perez family approached the police. He stated that his client, Alan Perez, has important information regarding Bridget Frisbee's death. When the investigators spoke with Bridget's classmate, Alexander Olivieri, they learned the name Alan Perez. The latter then stated that he came to Frisbee's house with Alan Perez. Alan was now prepared to share important information, but only under certain conditions. He was willing to discuss Bridget's death in exchange for an immunity agreement. The authorities needed answers, so they accepted this condition. Alan Perez claimed that the drive-by shooting at Jonathan Larson's house was linked to Bridget Frisbee's death. This shooting occurred just one week after Jonathan and Bridget split up. Alexander Olivier Airy, 17, whom investigators had previously spoken with at school, assisted Bridget in exacting revenge on Jonathan and firing the shots at the house. Therese and Olivieri met in high school. They joined the National Guard together. But when Olivieri returned from basic training, he began attending a new school. According to Perez, Bridget was one of Olivieri's new friends at his new school. Perez testified that Bridget had been bragging about participating in a drive-by shooting with a friend and that Olivieri later told Perez that he was the shooter. Specifically, Olivieri told Perez that Bridget drove and he shot at her ex-boyfriend's house with his Hugo semi-automatic rifle. Perez testified that Olivieri approached him for a favor on the evening of April 2, 2011. Olivieri explained that he wanted to punish Bridget for informing friends about the drive. Bye. He wanted Perez as a backup. Olivieri told Perez to bring a weapon. Perez arrived carrying a 380 caliber pistol and dressed in a green military uniform, mask, and gloves. Olivieri carried a 9mm Beretta pistol in a shoulder holster beneath his jacket. According to Perez, they arrived at Olivieri's house after midnight. Olivieri then called Bridget and asked her to accompany him to pick up her boyfriend, Zach Richards, from the bus station. Bridget declined, citing her busy schedule. Olivieri went to Bridget's house and instructed Perez to hide under a blanket in the back of his Suburban. Olivieri informed Perez that he wanted to get Bridget into his car. That's why Perez had to sit under the covers and remain silent. Perez was supposed to follow them from a distance once they arrived at their destination and exited the vehicle. Bridget was leaving on her four-wheeler to meet friends when they arrived at her house, so they left. They went looking for her again a little later, and they found her pushing her four-wheeler because it had run out of fuel. Olivieri requested her assistance in locating a cache of random items. She initially declined, but he eventually persuaded her to go with him. Bridget parked her four-wheeler and got into the passenger seat of the Olivieri Suburban. Perez was still hiding in the back of the car, under blankets. Olivieri returned to the same neighborhood where he and Bridget had conducted the drive by shooting. They got out of their car. Perez waited a minute before following them. Perez spotted Olivieri carrying a shovel and leading Bridget with a flashlight. Olivieri pointed out a spot and instructed Bridget to begin digging. As she bent over to dig, Perez noticed Olivieri reaching into his jacket, pull out his gun, place it against the back of Bridget's neck and fire. Perez testified that he was shocked because he expected Olivieri to threaten her with the gun. 
but he had just shot her. Olivieri ran towards Perez, who cursed at him for a while. Olivieri told Perez to shut up and run towards the car while he got his shovel, flashlight, and Bridget's cell phone. Then they left the crime scene and drove to Perez's house, before they reached their destination. They smashed Bridget's phone with a shovel before hitting it. After this, they drove home to Olivieri. They moved everything from the Suburban into Alexander's room. According to Perez, he and Olivieri arrived at the bus station around 4 a.m. to pick up Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards. Perez invited Richards to spend the night at his house. So the three of them drove to Perez's home and went to bed. They told Richards nothing about the crime. Olivieri informed Perez that they needed to be each other's alibis when questioned by police. Perez had to explain that he stayed at Olivieri's house, hung out, watched a movie, and then they went to pick up Richards together. Alexander Olivier persuaded him that saying the same thing and providing each other with an alibi would not put them in danger. Olivieri also told Perez that he was going to get rid of the gun he used to kill Bridget. Bridget was upset because Jonathan Larson, with whom she was in a relationship, cheated on her. Olivieri offered to exact revenge on him by shooting at his home. However, he had not anticipated what would happen next. Bridget failed to keep the drive a secret, which concerned Olivieri. This incident may put an end to his plans. He wanted to be a military man, but now his dream was hanging by a thread. That's why he went to great lengths to keep Bridget quiet. He decided that the only way out of this situation was for Bridget Frisbee to die. During the investigation, the police heard the name of Bridget's boyfriend, Zach Richards, several times. So they decided to speak with him. They wanted to know whether Richards would confirm Alan Perez's testimony, or if the latter was attempting to absolve himself of responsibility. The situation seemed perplexing. Bridget's boyfriend Richards testified that in March 2011, Alexander Olivier Airy said he was going to deal with something, grabbed his AUK-47 and left with Bridget in her car. Later, Olivieri told Richards that he shot at Bridget's ex-boyfriend's house from her car as she drove by. Olivieri told Richards that he participated in the drive, by as a favor to Bridget and simply because he could. Richards testified that Bridget continued to brag about the shooting, and Olivieri confronted her and told her to stop telling people. On April 3, 2011, Olivieri agreed to drive Bridget to the Houston bus station to pick up Richards around 1 a.m. When Olivieri did not show up, Richards took a ride to Denny's and finally called Olivieri at around 2.30 or 3 a.m. Olivieri informed him that he was at home, but would come pick him up. Alexander finally arrived several hours late, and Perez accompanied him. When Richards inquired about Bridget Olivieri, he stated that he attempted to contact her and visited her house, but she was not there. Richards stated that he went to Bridget's house after sleeping for a few hours. Her father answered the door and explained that Bridget had been out all night, and he had no idea where she was. Richards spent the next few days attempting to locate her through friends before learning of her body's discovery. Richards told the investigators that he had previously visited the woods, which have now become a crime scene, with Bridget and Olivier. According to him, Olivier was familiar with this area, and it was not unusual for him to carry a weapon at all times. Thus, everything pointed to Alexander Olivieri being responsible for Bridget Frisbee's death. Four days after her death, police issued an arrest warrant for Olivieri. Given that the suspect possessed a variety of weapons and was proficient in their use, the police requested assistance from SWAT teams in apprehending him. After the surveillance team confirmed that Alexander Olivier was at home, the SWAT team began their work. Fortunately, they did not have to use weapons, and Olivier surrendered without resistance. He was calm and emotionless. He understood why he was arrested, but he denied having any involvement in Bridget Frisbee's death. Alexander's father, Samuel Olivieri, agreed to a search of the house and car. The police discovered neither the AK-47 nor the Beretta, but they did find an instruction manual for a 9mm Beretta pistol. It matched the shell casing discovered at the crime scene. In Olivia Rivery, police discovered a blanket, a shovel, a rifle, and shotgun shell casings, as well as trace evidence samples such as fibers from the passenger seat and floorboard. Ballistics testing revealed that the shell casing from the Suburban match was recovered during the drive by shooting at Larson's home. Fibers lifted from the car's passenger seat matched Bridget's new Rave Fox fur outfit, which she was wearing when her father last saw her on the night of April 2. During his trial, 
Alexander Olivieri claimed that he did not see Bridget on the night she was killed. Olivieri's defense claimed that fibers discovered in their client's car matched the fibers of Bridget's new Ravefo outfit and arrived there a few weeks before her death, but this theory was rejected. During the trial, Robert Frisbee provided a credit card statement that showed Bridget's outfit was purchased on April 2, 2011. She died several hours later. It showed that Bridget was undoubtedly in Olivieri's car before her death, implying that he was lying when he claimed he hadn't seen her that night. The court saw a video posted on YouTube in 2010, approximately a year before Bridget died. It was called Me and My Beretta 9mm. It shows Alexander Olivieri firing a variety of firearms, including a Beretta pistol. Alan Perez testified at the trial that the video showed the same gun that Olivieri used to kill Bridget. On August 1, 2012, the court sentenced Alexander Olivieri to 60 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 30 years. But Robert Frisbee believes Olivieri will be imprisoned for at least 50 years. It is critical that this man be removed from the streets and remain so for the rest of his life. Robert Frisbee stated that after spending so many years in a small cell, he will be a broken man when he gets out. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we look at a story from 2003 in the American state of North Dakota. On November 22, 2003, Drew Shodin, 22, was walking to her car after finishing her shift and talking on the phone with her boyfriend. The conversation was abruptly interrupted. Drew's boyfriend paid little attention to this, which he later regretted deeply. The young woman was soon featured on national television, and her experiences influenced a change in us law. Drew Katrina Joden was born September 26, 1981, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She was the younger of Alan and Linda's two children. Drew's parents divorced when she was three years old, but they remained friends until she was 10. Linda and her second husband, Sid Walker, raised her and her brother, Sven, in a comfortable home on Whitefish Lake which is known for being one of Minnesota's most scenic vacation spots. Drew excelled in high school, becoming an honor student, joining the golf team, and being voted homecoming queen in 1999. But her true passion was for art. Her homeroom was filled with sketches of rock star models and friends. After graduating from high school, she attended the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, a city of approximately 50,000 people. Friends described Drew as someone who loved life and was always willing to help others. Drew often traveled around the country, but her dream was to visit Australia, which she planned to do in the spring of 2004. To save money for the event, Drew worked two jobs in her spare time, a sales associate at Victoria's Secret and a waitress at a nightclub in Grand Forks. On Saturday, November 22, 2003, Drew's shift at the Victoria's Secret store in Columbia Mall ended at 4 p.m. Later that day, she was scheduled to work at a nightclub. Before leaving the mall, Drew decided to go shopping and purchased a purse from a specific store. She called her boyfriend, Chris Lang, as she walked to her car in the parking lot. Suddenly, after Drew said, okay. The call was disconnected, but Chris did not give it much thought. He did not call back because they were not discussing anything important. About three hours later, Chris's phone rang again, this time from Drew. When he answered it, he only heard noises, such as the wind and phone buttons being pressed. Three weeks later, in an interview with a television station, Chris described the thoughts that raced through his mind when his conversation with Drew was cut short. I was unaware of the urgency of this phone call at the time. He said, I never thought this would happen. There was no sense of urgency. It was simply a cell phone call that was cut off for a variety of reasons. I had no idea this terrible thing was happening. Drew was living in a college dorm, sharing a room with her friend Meg Murphy. Around the same time, Chris got a strange phone call. Meg received a call from the nightclub, where they were trying to figure out why Drew hadn't arrived for work and wasn't answering the phone. She was a responsible employee who always arrived at work early, so her absence immediately raised concerns. However, Meg had no idea where Drew was and was surprised that she hadn't shown up for work, so she went looking for her friend Meg. She first called mutual acquaintances, then the local hospital, 
where she was informed that Drew had not been admitted. I called the police around 9 p.m. because I couldn't find anything out. Knowing Drew worked at Columbia Mall, a police officer was dispatched to the location. At this point, the mall had already closed. Driving around the parking lot, the officer noticed Drew's car. After inspecting it, he discovered that the car was unlocked. There was no evidence of a struggle or other crime. A black nylon sheath for a folding knife was discovered on the ground near the car. It was unclear whether it was related to Drew's disappearance. However, such a discovery was not encouraging. Papers, a wallet, and a new purse purchased that day were found on the car seat, implying that even if Drew had committed a dirty deed, it was not a robbery. Neither the friend's boyfriend nor his parents knew where Drew could be, so investigators began to suspect a kidnapping. First and foremost, have detectives checked out Chris Lang. He was almost immediately ruled out as a suspect because he lived in Minnesota, 300 miles from Chris in Grand Forks. The police discovered that one of Drew's phone calls was abruptly cut off, and the second was made a few hours later, when noises and the sound of a button being pressed could be heard. The detectives arrived the next day when the mall where Drew worked was open to review the security camera footage. As it turned out, there were no security cameras in the parking lot where the missing girl's vehicle was parked. But, thankfully, there were several security cameras inside the mall. Detectives went through the footage and discovered a scene in which Drew went into one of the local stores after work and bought herself a purse. She was calm and not in a hurry to go anywhere. At 4.55 p.m., she was wearing a pink sweater and carrying a jacket. Drew paid for her purchase at the register before putting on her jacket and leaving the store. On her way out, she called Chris. The call was made at precisely 5 p.m., and as we now know, at 5.4 p.m., Drew and Chris's conversation was abruptly cut off after she sat down. Okay, knowing that the call was cut off after four minutes, one of the detectives decided to try an experiment. He set a four-minute timer and began walking slowly from the store where Drew had purchased her purse to the parking lot where her car was parked. When the alarm went off, indicating that four minutes had passed, the detective was in the parking lot near where the car was discovered. This indicated that something occurred while Drew was in her car. However, as previously stated, there were no cameras overlooking the parking lot, making it difficult to investigate. Drew's disappearance drew media attention, and as a result, a large number of people learned what had happened to her, many of whom resolved not to be indifferent to someone else's misfortune. In addition to police officers, more than 1,000 volunteers helped in the search for Drew. Officers from the FBI also joined the investigation. Drew's last phone call was traced to the small town of Fisher, Minnesota, which is only a 30-minute drive from the mall where she worked. As you can see on the map, the area surrounding these two towns is covered in fields. Police used helicopters, all-terrain vehicles, horses, and dogs to investigate these fields. The landowners were asked to inspect their properties themselves, but the results were inconclusive and no leads were found at first. The search radius grew with each passing day, and four days later, an ominous discovery was made. A boot was discovered under a bridge in Crookston and a roommate reported that Drew had left the house wearing those boots on the day she went missing. Forensic investigators confirmed that the shoe belonged to the missing girl. Crookston is a small town with fewer than 10,000 people. It is approximately 30 miles from Grand Forks where Drew vanished. Further searches in the Crookston area produced no results because there was nothing of investigative interest to be discovered. A $20,000 reward was initially offered for information that could help determine Drew's whereabouts which was later increased to $140,000. At this point, the only clue that could lead to Drew was surveillance footage from Columbia Mall. The detectives sat down again to review hundreds of hours of footage from various cameras, but this time they decided to focus on Drew. They speculated that whoever abducted her may have been following her and appearing in the videos. The investigators spent hours watching the monitors before spotting the person who had piqued their interest. They noticed a man walking aimlessly through the mall. He didn't buy anything and appeared to be more interested in the people around him than in the merchandise for sale. At 3.41 p.m., he sat on a bench near the mall exit and watched people walk by. After about 10 minutes, he stood up from the bench and, wearing black gloves, walked out into the lobby, where he looked into a camera hanging overhead. 
This photograph was taken 72 minutes before Drew's conversation with her boyfriend was interrupted, and she vanished. Investigators noticed that the man only got up from his seat and walked away after a blonde woman passed him carrying a grocery cart and heading toward the parking lot. The detectives did not believe this was a coincidence. Rather, they believed that the man had chosen an appropriate victim and followed her. The woman's identity was unknown, but police were aware that only one person, Drew Joden, had gone missing from the mall parking lot that day. Given the slight resemblance between Drew and the woman this suspicious man was following, it has been suggested that if the kidnapper was indeed this man, and if he had failed to kidnap this woman, his next target could have been Drew. She had left them all around 5 p.m. when it was already dark, potentially giving the perpetrator an advantage. At this point in the investigation, the case involved three cities, Grand Forks, where Drew was kidnapped, Fisher, where her phone was last active, and Crookston, where the shoe was discovered. With this information in mind, the FBI began reviewing the records of all registered sex offenders from the cities and surrounding areas. When the photos and the files were compared to the image of the suspicious man from the mall, only one man met all of the criteria, and that was Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., who had a lengthy criminal record of committing crimes against women. The 50-year-old man had spent the previous 23 years in prison. Rodriguez was the second oldest of five children, born in Laredo, Texas, in February 1953. Two migrant workers, Dolores and Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., claimed to have had an unhappy childhood, describing his home life as unpleasant because his parents were harsh on him and unreasonable in their demands. His family moved from state to state for 15 years before settling in Crookston in 1963. Rodriguez became increasingly isolated as he grew up, exacerbated by language barriers. His preferred language was Spanish, and he struggled with English, which made school particularly difficult. He eventually dropped out of school in ninth grade and started working as a laborer at the American Crystal Sugar Company plant in Crookston. Rodriguez claimed that he was molested by older women in his youth, which he blamed for his hostility toward women. In October 1974, at the age of 21, he asked a woman for a ride home, but instead directed her to Crookston's driveway, where he grabbed her by the throat and attempted to force her to please him. The following month, he approached another woman sitting in a truck outside a Crookston movie theater. He threatened her with a knife and took her to a remote location in the countryside, where he forced her to have sex with him. Then in 1979, he attempted to kidnap a 69-year-old high school English teacher. While out walking in Crookston one night, the woman fought back as Rodriguez attempted to force her into his car. In a fit of rage, he stabbed her with a knife in her elbow and abdomen, but she managed to escape and flee to safety. The woman, who was artistically talented, was able to create a composite sketch of Rodriguez that closely resembled him, resulting in his capture. He was convicted of attempted kidnapping and aggravated assault and served a 23-year prison sentence before being released in May 2003. He had been released from prison six months before Drew disappeared and was classified as a third-degree sex offender, which meant he was at the highest risk of reoffending. Before being released from prison, Rodriguez and his family expressed their concerns to Minnesota Department of Corrections officials. Even his family feared that he was reverting to his old ways. Despite their fears, Alfonso was released after serving his full sentence. After his release, Rodriguez lived with his mother in Crookston, only a few miles from the bridge that should be recalled. Another disadvantage for Drew was the discovery of his shoe. The detectives decided to speak with Alfonso Rodriguez, who of course denied any involvement in Drew's disappearance. The man confirmed that he was at the Columbia Mall on the day she went missing, claiming that he had gone to the movie theater and seen the film once in Mexico. What he didn't realize was that no movie theaters in Grand Forks were showing the film that day. Police searched Rodriguez's car and realized with regret that Drew was most likely dead. At this point, it appears unlikely that we will find Drew alive. Grand Forks County Sheriff Dan Hill told reporters that he believes the mission is more of a recovery than a rescue at this time. Dark red dried stains were discovered in several locations inside Rodriguez's car, which forensics later determined to be Drew's blood drops. According to the affidavit, blood was found on the passenger side rear window, the back seat, and other areas of the passenger compartment. The blood did come back. It was a DNA match to Drew. 
The sheriff discovered a folding knife in the trunk that matched the sheath found in the parking lot next to Drew's car using DNA from his toothbrush. A receipt was also discovered, indicating that Rodriguez purchased this knife, complete with sheath, from a hardware store located several hundred yards from the parking lot where Drew vanished. Although Drew was not discovered alive or dead, investigators gathered sufficient evidence to charge Rodriguez. The man was arrested eight days after she went missing on December 1, 2003. Rodriguez, who was imprisoned in Grand Forks, claimed he had no involvement in Drew's disappearance and refused to speak with law enforcement or provide information about her whereabouts, despite the evidence against him. During a brief bond hearing several days ago, bail for Rodriguez's release was set at a staggering $5 million. While he remained silent in custody, the search for Drew continued unabated, focusing on these three towns. The abundance of snow in the area made the searchers' work more difficult. This is an unprecedented move. During a press conference on December 9, the governors of North Dakota and Minnesota promised to help with the search for Drew by hiring several hundred National Guard members and other state employees. North Dakota Governor John Hoeven stated that Drew's disappearance has affected everyone in North Dakota, and Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty expressed his pride in the community's cooperation and collaboration with police officials. Despite all efforts, there were no results, and due to worsening weather conditions, the authorities decided to call off the search. In the spring, the intensive search continued. Those looking for Drew hoped to find her as the winter snow began to melt. After five months of searching, they were eager to get Drew home. Finally, on April 17, 2004, Drew's body was discovered. It lay in a field in Crookston, just a few miles from the bridge where the boot had been discovered. Drew's family was overcome with grief after learning of the heartbreaking discovery. Her father told reporters, we were waiting for that call. And when that call came, we all stopped living for a moment. It was her parents' worst nightmare, and it would follow them for the rest of their lives. The field where the body was discovered had already been searched, but due to the large drifts, they were unable to locate it immediately. Drew was naked below the waist, making the motive for the crime clear. Her hands were tied behind her back, with a rope around her neck and a cut. Under the rope, there were remnants of a plastic bag, indicating that the bag had been placed over Drew's head and then tied around her neck with a rope. Hair matching Rodriguez's DNA was discovered on Drew's jacket. Before her death, the young woman had been brutally beaten and repeatedly stabbed. The medical examiner identified three possible causes of her death. It was either suffocation due to the cut on her neck or hypothermia, the third possible cause. After months of silence, Drew's family was finally able to say goodbye to her on April 24, 2004. The mourning ceremony was attended by approximately 1,500 people. North Dakota, where Drew was kidnapped, abolished the death penalty in 1975, and Minnesota, where the body was discovered, did not use it as a punishment either. However, because Drew had been transported across state lines, the crime was considered a federal crime and thus the prosecutor's office had the authority to seek the death penalty against Rodriguez. On August 30, 2006, Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. was convicted in the Drew case, and the jury recommended that he be sentenced to death on February 8, 2007. During the hearing, Judge Ralph Erickson told the unconfessed Rodriguez that his senseless and violent actions made the jury's decision difficult. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. became North Dakota's first person sentenced to death in nearly a century. On June 28, 2013, after six years on death row, Rodriguez confessed to kidnapping and murdering Drup. However, the story does not end here. Ralph Erickson, the district judge who sentenced Rodriguez to death, became a U.S. Court of Appeals judge, and at the age of 21, he overturned his own conviction of Rodriguez and ordered a new sentencing phase. Rodriguez's guilt is beyond doubt, as evidenced by a variety of DNA tests. In this case, the death penalty is at issue. Erickson overturned the death sentence, citing, among other things, defense attorney's failure to properly examine Rodriguez's mental health and forensic expert Michael McGee's testimony, which the judge admitted misled him. This is the expert's testimony, which stated that Rodriguez violated Drew's sexual integrity within 24 to 36 hours of her abduction. There was no direct evidence to back up this claim, such as Rodriguez's seminal fluid on Drew's body. According to the judge, 
the expert expressed an opinion that was not supported by the facts, which misled the judge and influenced his decision. Nonetheless, in overturning the death sentence, Erickson noted that even in the absence of Rodriguez and his seminal fluid, the circumstances in which Drew's body was discovered, naked below the waist with her hands tied behind her back, indicated a sexually motivated crime. Judge Erickson stated that the failure to examine Rodriguez's mental health, both generally and at the time of his crime, violated his constitutional rights. After Rodriguez died, his sentence was overturned. The federal prosecutor's office issued a statement indicating that they would seek the death penalty for him again. However, two years later, in 2023, the prosecutors abandoned their plans and accepted Alfonso Rodriguez's death sentence, which was commuted to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The United States of America issued a statement to that effect through Max Schneider, United States Attorney for the District of North Dakota, withdrawing the notice of intent to seek a death sentence against defendant Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., which was filed on October 28, 2004. Schneider stated in a March 14 court filing that the United States will no longer seek the death penalty in this case. My thoughts today are with Drew Joden's family, especially her parents, Linda Walker and Alan Joden's side Schneider. They're genuinely good people and loving parents who, in the aftermath of an unimaginable loss, have worked closely with our office for nearly two decades. We continue to wish them the greatest level of peace possible. I'd also like to commend the trial team, which included former U.S. Attorney Drew Wrigley, as well as our office's appellate attorneys and support staff. They have consistently upheld the Department of Justice's high standards throughout the last two decades with their work on this tragic case. As a result of their efforts, Mr. Rodriguez has been convicted of murder and will remain so. The directive to withdraw the death notice has altered how the United States Attorney's Office will handle this case. What will not change is that Mr. Rodriguez will die in a federal prison. This case prompted changes in sex offender registration laws. On July 27, 2006, President George W. Bush signed the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act, which included Drew's legislation. Drew's law changed the name of the National Sex Offender Public Registry to the Drew's Joden National Sex Offender Public Website, which informs the public about the whereabouts of registered sex offenders across state, territory, and tribal boundaries. On June 22, 2013, it was announced that Alfonso Rodriguez had been transferred from a death row prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, to Coleman's High Security Facility in Centerville, Florida. This appears to be his final resting place. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A 17-year-old young woman and her friend went on a trip to Australia and, at one point, disappeared. Without a trace, despite an extensive search and many witnesses, her fate remained unknown for 18 years. When this terrible mystery was finally solved, one shocking fact surfaced the police had everything they needed to close the case in a matter of days, but their negligence and unprofessionalism stretched it into nearly two decades. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley. Haley Dodd was born on November 30th, 1981, in England. When the girl was young, her parents and other children moved to Australia, settling in the small town of Mandora. The young woman was an excellent student of sports and planned to go to study to be a veterinarian or a school teacher, but before finally deciding on her choice of future profession, she wanted to travel around Australia. Graduating high school in 1999, at the age of 17, she set off on a trip to Western Australia with her best friend Lisa. Their plan wasn't just to drive through local towns and attractions, but to spend a few months away from home. The young women were going to look for temporary jobs along the way to cover their living food and travel expenses. They planned a hitchhike between cities, which in the 1990s in Australia didn't sound like such a dangerous idea at the time. There had been a number of murders of young women hitchhiking in the country, but compared to the overall number of people hitchhiking safely, these crimes did not cause any mass fear. However, Haley feared that her parents would not allow her to travel that way, even in the company of a friend. For this reason, she assured them that she planned to travel by bus. At the end of July, she and Lisa traveled to a town called Dengara. There, they were going to work as day 
laborers on a local farm they were staying at a camping site where they could get a place to sleep for a small fee such places are in high demand in Australia. Mainly because of their cheapness a few days before going to work Haley decided to use the remaining free time and go to a farm to family, friends which was 200 kilometers away she decided to hitchhike to it and Lisa didn't want to let her go alone but Haley insisted she had nothing to worry about and would be back in a few days to say goodbye Lisa gave her a folding knife for self-defense and some change so Haley could call her. The phone booth. After saying goodbye, hit the road at about 8 a.m. Family and friends at the farm awaited her arrival, but Haley never showed up worried. They called her mother and informed her that the woman feared something might have happened to her daughter, so she immediately called the police. The first thing she did was dial an emergency number and describe the situation. After listening to her story, the operator thought that nothing urgent had happened so she advised her to go to the local police department and file a missing person report. So she did. The detectives began their search for Haley, beginning to reconstruct the chronology of events. The first thing they did was arrive at the campsite where Lisa was staying. She was mortified at the news that her friend had never made it to the farm, but the young woman was able to give the police a comprehensive introduction. She accurately described all the clothes Haley was wearing that day, and even drew a sketch of the earring she was wearing for the police. Haley had bought these earrings a few days before the incident. She and Lisa had gone to the store to treat themselves to some inexpensive items, and the young woman was attracted to this jewelry at that time. She couldn't have imagined that those earrings would be the key to solving this terrible mystery of her disappearance. Detectives disseminated information about the missing young woman along with their description, although she was almost 18 years old, Haley looked much younger. She was 152 centimeters tall and weighed just over 40 pounds. The police were able to locate the first witness fairly quickly. It turned out to be the truck driver who had given her a ride that day, according to the man's story. She had knocked on his cab window at a gas station and asked for a ride to Mora, a town near where there was a farm. The trucker was on his way to another town, but he agreed to give her a ride most of the way the man dropped her off at a turn off at a turn off above 50 kilometers from Mora near the town of Ashangara, where she was to turn off the main road and onto a country road, according to the trucker Haley was in high spirits chatting with him the whole way. And talking about her journey after she said she was almost out of money he gave her $15 so the young woman could buy something to eat the man also left her his number in case she hitchhiked back he made trips down that road almost every day and could have let her down again later. Detectives received several more calls from people who had seen Haley in that area. Based on their statements, police concluded that the young woman had been on foot along the northwest road towards Mora. Apparently, she could not find any driver at the gas station to give her a ride. For this reason, she decided to walk along the road and try to hitch a ride. Based on the testimony of the next witness, he gave Haley a ride to the turnoff on Gunder Doe Road after which she headed further in her direction on foot. A woman driving along the road she spotted Haley just as the young woman was getting out of her car and moving on foot towards Mora and all the police were contacted by more than 10 witnesses after putting their statements together detectives concluded that the young woman was last seen at about 12. Noon on the northwest road about 50 kilometers from Mora there was another witness though he had not seen Haley but still shared a disturbing observation with police the man pulled over on the side of the northwest road because his engine was overheating at one point he heard a dog barking followed by a piercing female scream. He couldn't see the source of the sound as it might have been far enough away the road passed through an empty flat area where there was virtually no extraneous noise with all this information in hand the police's prognosis was disappointing from the start lead detective Eddie Rowe decided that they should look for the body and not consider the possibility that Haley might be alive but management forbade him to investigate in such a manner leaving it to the status of the search for the missing person. It's worth clarifying here that a murder investigation would have given the police more options than a missing person investigation, but to police had no leads. That could help them get on the young woman's trail so they quickly set about looking for potential kidnappers in a short time they were able to identify several dozen suspects who lived in the area but eventually the police focused on three men one worked as a teacher at a local school another was a part-time gardener there and the third lived not far from where Haley disappeared when questioned each of them pleaded not guilty and provided alibis the police could not conclude with certainty of their innocence but they could not find any evidence to the contrary but soon the situation changed dramatically the investigators were approached by a neighbor of one of the suspects a 43 year old school gardener named Francis told them that the day Haley disappeared, 
Francis borrowed his car to go shopping in Mora. When the man returned home around 1 p.m., a neighbor noticed damage inside the car, the turn signal knob was broken, and the dashboard also showed signs of impact. The neighbor didn't even have time to ask what happened to the car. Francis came home done with the shopping bags in the kitchen, got on his motorcycle, and drove off this story seemed strange to the police, and they decided to re-interview Francis the man said that at the time of Haley's disappearance he was many kilometers away from the alleged place of her. Abduction according to his story after returning home, he immediately went to a party in the city of Perth on his motorcycle. But he was not supposed to get there that day on the way there he exceeded the speed limit and had a serious accident that took him to the hospital the information available was enough for the detectives to ask the perfectly logical question, where was he going in such a hurry his own testimony? Seemed very strange and investigators decided to apply for a search warrant of his home the officer searched his residence but they were unable to find any potential evidence they also searched the car and removed the seat covers so that experts could examine them in the lab unfortunately none of. This yield any results and Francis was left alone almost immediately after that he moved to the other side of the country to Queensland and the detectives were left empty handed and the case went into a long drawer they tried to find new witnesses and evidence to move the investigation forward but to no avail this went on for eight whole years until Francis came back on the police radar in 2007. At the time he was living in a remote outback in a small settlement one morning an elderly couple who lived next door to him were sitting on the porch of their house at some point they noticed with horror that a young woman with absolutely no clothes was running in their direction and her head was. Covered with blood she asked for help and the residents of the house called the police the victim said that she had tried to catch a ride the night before a man stopped in front of her and offered her a ride at one point he told her he needed to go to a place to get gas and fill up his car they drove up to a house in the middle of nowhere and he called the woman inside and offered her some tea unfortunately for her she said yes almost immediately thereafter he attacked her and after a brief struggle tied her up for the next few hours the victim was subject to indescribable torture and violence her assailant also tore off one of her earrings and took it for himself as you may have guessed this man was Francis by morning the woman realized that she he could get the rope off her hands and then free her legs and run she loosened the rope waited for the right moment for Francis to move as far away as possible and rushed to the back door of the house before she left she removed her pendant and tossed it under the bed the woman feared that the police might not find any corroboration of her story so she decided to leave some personal item in his house and it really worked the police searched Francis's house found the very same pendant and arrested the man at the trial he quickly realized that he could not get away with it and decided to confess to what he had done he was sentenced to 12 years. In prison the police in Western Australia, who handled the Haley Dodd case were notified of Francis's arrest, but they did not appear to be at all interested no action was taken by the detectives to revive. The eight-year-old case, which was so closely resembling the circumstances of Francis's crime, only through the insistence of Haley's mother did the detectives agree to reopen the case, but they quickly concluded that there was still no evidence against Francis which meant there was nothing they could do about it. All these years, Haley's family tried to get the police to investigate thoroughly, but they assured them that they had done everything in their power desperate to wait for help from law enforcement. The relatives spent tens of thousands of dollars on private investigators, but all to no avail the case. Did not take a new turn until six long years later in 2013 when an extremely outrageous fact came to light it turned out that the police had simply forgotten. About the evidence that ended up being the key to the case, the medical examiner Tracy Horn filed a request to reopen the investigation. The reason was that the very same car seat covers seat from Francis's neighbor's car in 1999 were found in evidence storage. Suddenly it turned out that for 14 years they had never been tested for blood DNA and other evidence. When experts did retrieve them, they were immediately able to find a woman's earring that had snagged on the fabric of the covers, taking a drawing of Lisa's, which she drew for the police just after her friend's disappearance. Detectives were horrified to see it was the same earring that Haley was wearing the morning of her disappearance. But that wasn't all. A human hair was found in one of the car mats that had also been removed from the car. The hair was very likely Haley's own, but that probability was not 100% which made it very difficult to prosecute Francis in the shortest possible time. As soon as the news leaked to the media, a wave of criticism poured in against the police for 14 years as evidence lay literally under the noses of the investigators, but in all that time they never remembered it. Of course, such a find instantly changed the course of the case, 
and the detectives went to the other side of the country to interrogate Francis again at the time he was still in prison for assaulting a woman in 2007. The man gave them the same story he had told them 14 years earlier. He denied his involvement and assured them that he was shopping in Mora at the time of Haley's abduction. The interrogation, which lasted nearly four hours, was inconclusive, so the police had to prepare the case to go to trial. It wasn't until 2015 that he was formally charged with Haley's murder and deported to Western Australia. Two more years later, in late 2017, the trial began. Francis's defense insisted that all the evidence presented was circumstantial. The earring Haley bought at a local store was very cheap and popular, so it could have been left in the car by another woman. The hair found in the car showed an almost 100% match to Haley's DNA but not an absolute exact match. Although a mistake here would have been highly unlikely, that was enough for the lawyers, but all these arguments seemed unconvincing to the judge. Perhaps Francis would still have had a chance to get away with it if not for his crime in 2007. But then he didn't just kidnap a woman who was hitchhiking, he also took her earring. The prosecution believed that the man was collecting the victim's earrings as trophies, which only increased the suspicion against him. In the end, as a result, the judge found him guilty of kidnapping and murdering Haley Dodd, sentencing him to 21 years in prison. All of this took place while his previous sentence was still pending. Francis was 62 years old at the time of his sentencing, but the story did not end there. The court believed Francis kidnapped and killed Haley, then hit her body, but it was never found, and the man himself refused to plead guilty. Haley's mother repeatedly asked the killer to tell her where he hid the body, but to no avail, and in 2018, she helped pass a new law that says murderers are not eligible for parole if they refuse to reveal the location of their victims' bodies. In 2020, another high-profile event occurred when the court granted Francis an appeal to overturn his sentence and scheduled a new hearing. His lawyers again tried to insist that the man would not have had time to kidnap Haley between his trip to Mora and his return home, but the court felt that the time frame allowed him well enough to do so, especially given the rush with which he arrived home and immediately set off for Perth on his. Motorcycle moreover the earring along with the hair were still on the list of key evidence against him, but Francis still managed to get his sentence changed. The court found him guilty of involuntary manslaughter, reducing his sentence from 21 years to 18 years, but thanks to a law passed. In 2018, he would not be able to go free even after that time if he refused to identify the location of the body there is another point in the whole story that keeps the detectives busy to this day. They are sure that many more women have become victims of Francis and that none of them managed to escape. This maniac could have been picking up young women on the roads for decades and what happened to them next only he knows one of the most likely similar cases is the disappearance of a woman in late 2005. She hitched a ride to another city and was never seen again. The detective handling the case is certain that Francis kidnapped her because he knew the victim personally, but there is no evidence at this time. Perhaps the police will find it again in their warehouse a few years later, but it won't make a difference to the perpetrator. If the police had examined the car more thoroughly, Francis would have been arrested back in 1999. Now we can only guess how many lives he ruined in the ensuing years, but sooner or later the mystery may be solved. There's another creepy thing about this whole story. Remember that in the initial stages of the investigation, the police identified three main suspects, including Francis. Now, one of them killed his wife five months after Haley disappeared, and the other, who worked as a school teacher, turned out to be one of the worst child molesters in Australian history. Too bad the police had no way to solve them at the time. If you liked this video, don't forget to support the channel with a like and share your opinion in the comments. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we'll look at a story from 2016. Michelle Lang, 25, had always wanted to study in Australia and one day she realized her dream. Unfortunately, her story did not have a happy conclusion. Meng Mei Leng, also known by her middle name Michelle, was born on January 29, 1991, in Chengdu, Sichuan Province, China. Michelle grew up to be a kind, responsible, and respectful young lady. Michelle had a very close relationship with her parents, 
so it was devastating for her when her father died in an earthquake in 2008. She excelled in school and aspired to live in Australia. Her mother, Mei Jong Leung, remained supportive throughout and believed that if her daughter received an education in Australia, she would have a bright future. Michelle began attending the University of Technology, Sydney, in 2011. This enabled her to travel to Australia and realize her long-held dream. Michelle's aunt, her mother's sister, lives in Australia and has offered her a room in her apartment. She also had a daughter who was two years younger than Michelle. Michelle's aunt, who was 44 at the time, married Derek Barrett, a man 20 years her junior. Derek was a temporary unemployed professional who was only three years older than Michelle. Michelle, her aunt, cousin, and Derek have since lived together in suburban Campsie, New South Wales. The first few years went well Michelle excelled in her studies, made new friends, and found a part-time job. Begin in 2016. Michelle's aunt frequently visited Wollongong for work, and Michelle, her cousin, and Derek continued to live in an apartment in Campsie. Michelle's aunt left for another business trip in April 2016, with a return date of April 24th. Michelle, 25, had been out with friends three days before that date. Around noon, she took a bus from the University of Technology Sydney to a downtown shopping mall. Around 3 p.m., security cameras captured Michelle shopping on Pitt Street in Sydney's Central Business District. She was alone, and the footage showed she was fine, unconcerned about anything. The vision also showed her taking a train from St. James to Campsie, arriving around 4.30 p.m. Michelle Lang was last seen alive at the Campsie train station. However, she used her cell phone to communicate with friends and family until late that evening. Those who spoke with Michelle that evening reported no anxiety or unusual tones in her voice. Derek drove to the train station on Sunday, April 24, to meet his wife after she returned from a business trip. And when Michelle asked Derek about her niece, he said he hadn't seen her in two days. Derek was unemployed at the time, so he spent his time on the computer and slept late. So he claimed he and Michelle had not seen each other. He also mentioned that Michelle had been spending a lot of time with her girlfriends and going to nightclubs recently. Michelle's cousin often stayed overnight at friends' houses, so she didn't see her for a few days. Michelle hadn't been seen since April 22nd, and her phone was turned off. This was unusual because she communicated with friends and family members living in China on a daily basis. It was also odd that Michelle didn't log into her social media accounts. The truth is that if someone who was previously an active user of social media and spent several hours per day on it suddenly stops logging into their accounts, there is a good chance that something has gone wrong. Michelle's aunt searched her room, trying to figure out where she had gone. The room was in perfect condition. Michelle's belongings were all in their proper places, and it appeared that she had simply vanished. The next day, Michelle's aunt and husband, Derek, went to the police station to file a missing persons report. They also informed the Chinese embassy about Michelle's disappearance at the police station. Derek told them about the last time he saw Michelle, and her aunt explained that she had just returned from a business trip yesterday and they had been unable to locate Michelle on their own, much to the disappointment of everyone who cared about Michelle. Her body had already been discovered when the police report was filed the day before, around 10.30 a.m. On Sunday, April 24th, several people called the police after seeing a body floating in the water near Snapper Point. That's approximately 80 miles from Campsie. The same day, some Australian media outlets reported the discovery of a woman's body. According to the report, a woman's body was found face down inside a blowhole on the New South Wales central coast. Police said the death was suspicious and a crime scene was set up yesterday at Snapper Point in the Munmora State Recreation Area. The unidentified woman was found near Mooney Beach between Gosford and Newcastle. She is described as Asian in appearance between the ages of 20 and 35, and stands about 170 centimeters tall. A post-mortem examination will be performed to determine the cause of death. A rescue helicopter spokesman said it was unclear how long the woman had been there or how she ended up in the water. Detective Chief Inspector Gary Jubelin of the New South Wales Homicide Unit stated, we are creative in the way that we recapture the area 
and what has happened in the area so we're looking through CCTV footage to see if we can find anything like that. I won't say what we discovered, but we're getting a pretty good idea of what happened in that area. During that time, he stated, now that the police had received a report of Michelle's disappearance, they quickly cross-referenced this information with a woman whose body had been discovered at Snapper Point and whose identity had yet to be determined. Michelle's relatives were devastated to learn that she had been discovered dead. Inspector Jubilin stated that police had informed MS, Ling's family who live both in Australia and overseas, of the news. We spoke with Michelle's auntie, who she lives with. Then I called Michelle's brother, who lives with her in China. He said it was terrible news to deliver, and you can imagine how upset they were. Police have asked anyone with information about Michelle's weekend activities to come forward and report it so that detectives can determine who is responsible for this heinous crime as quickly as quickly as possible. When the body was retrieved from the water, there were several injuries indicating that Michelle had been severely assaulted. During the autopsy, the medical examiner found over 30 stab wounds on her body. She fought for her life and attempted to fight back against the perpetrator, resulting in defensive wounds to her arms. Michelle's mother flew to Australia a few days after learning of her daughter's death, still unable to accept her loss. Even today, we cannot accept that she has left us and that we are still in great pain. Miss Lang stated that the time when Meng Mei and I lived happily together would never come back. She said, you cannot imagine how painful it is for me. The saddest thing in life is losing someone you care deeply about. While investigating the case, the detective spoke with Michelle's aunt and husband because she lived in their apartment and they were the most familiar with her. Derek stated that he last saw Michelle on the evening of Thursday, April 21st. Following dinner, they watched a movie before Michelle went to bed in her room on Friday, April 22nd. When he awoke, Michelle had left the house. He woke up late, so it was not surprising that she had already left. According to him, Michelle had not yet returned when he went to bed, so he assumed she was out having fun with friends. The following day, he awoke late, and Michelle was still missing. He wasn't sure if she was coming home, so he texted her, asking where she was and if she was all right, but the message went unread. Michelle's aunt didn't say anything because she was on a business trip. Steele. According to some Australian media, Michelle's aunt told the detective that she checked Michelle's Facebook correspondence on her laptop and discovered that her niece had recently dated an Australian guy whom she described as having golden hair, pale skin, and fierce eyes. As a result, the police assumed Michelle had gone on a date with a man she met online. However, that version was quickly pushed aside. In fact, investigators had already identified a suspect in Michelle Lung's death. Derek Barrett was the last person who saw her alive. The police were skeptical of his claims about waking up late and not seeing Michelle. They called him in for questioning and began asking him about his relationship with Michelle when he last saw her and so on. Derek then refused to answer the questions and requested a lawyer, after which he was informed that he had been arrested as a suspect. The truth is that investigators checked his cell phone signal and discovered that he had been in the same area where Michelle's body was found on April 24th. This information contradicted the man's claim that he had not visited Snapper Point that day. A police officer also obtained camera footage of a car matching Barrett's description in the early hours of April 24th, near Snapper Point. However, the image was blurry and Barrett began to claim it wasn't his car which the police denied. Detectives discovered video footage of Derek Barrett paying for gas and purchasing beverages at a gas station on his way to Snapper Point. The image is of good quality and clearly shows Barrett. When told that he was lying about what he was doing on April 24th, he began to claim that he had memory problems and couldn't recall specific periods of time because he frequently used illegal substances. Barrett's phone was seized and handed over to experts for analysis and recovery of previously deleted data. What was discovered on the phone proved beyond doubt that Derek Barrett Barrett was not only involved in Michelle's death, but also had an unhealthy interest in her. His own stepdaughter was also the focus of his desire. A 15-minute video from September 2014 shows his wife's daughter, his stepdaughter, taking a shower. Derek installed a hidden camera in the shared bathroom 
concealing it behind toiletries. In another video, investigators saw Derek enter his stepdaughter's room while she slept, stand next to her bed, and express his satisfaction. After some time, Derek Barrett's attention shifted from his stepdaughter to his niece. Experts recovered a half-hour video of Michelle taking a shower from his phone. In another video, Derek satisfied himself by standing next to Michelle's bed while she slept. The phone also contained images taken shortly before Michelle died. We now know that Michelle returned home around 5 p.m. On April 21st, she sent her last text message around midnight, and no one has heard from or seen her since. Derek Barrett began carrying out his insidious plan shortly after midnight. He attacked, so Michelle tied her up and taped her mouth shut. In pictures on his phone, investigators saw Michelle, bound and naked, lying on a bed, terrified. Michelle had not yet sustained the injuries that caused her death, according to the 17 photos. Derek's last picture was taken around 8 a.m. Michelle was still alive around 4 p.m. On April 22nd, that same day, when Derek's stepdaughter returned home, she had no idea her cousin was tied up in the next room. When questioned by investigators about that day, she stated that she had been home for approximately three hours before leaving again. She didn't hear Michelle's call for help. Experts were unable to determine the precise time of death. So, it's unclear whether Michelle was alive at the time, but she was definitely present in the apartment. She spent the entire three hours at home. Derek was in the bathroom with the shower the following day. April 23rd. Derek left the apartment four times to remove trash bags. This was captured on surveillance cameras. Michelle was reportedly dead by this point, and Derek was cleaning the house. Michelle's aunt Derek's wife told investigators that when she returned home from a business trip, it was spotless, but she didn't think much about it at the time. At 3.19 a.m. On April 24th, Derek drove to Snapper Point, on the way, he stopped at a gas station to buy drinks and fill up his car with gas. When he arrived at Snapper Point, he disposed of Michelle's body and took some photos around 9 a.m. An hour and a half later, police received information from eyewitnesses who saw the body in the water. Derek visited his parents in the meantime, who did not notice anything unusual about his behavior, and then returned home to Campsey. Derek Barrett was indicted on 27 counts including unlawful imprisonment, secret videotaping, and murdering Michelle Lang. It is worth noting, in particular, that he was not accused of soliciting for lustful purposes. Derek, like many criminals, began to complain about his difficult childhood, including being bullied at school. Some people believe that a difficult childhood is an excuse for their abusive behavior. The trial started in October 2017, the psychiatrist who examined Derek concluded that he could be held fully accountable for his actions. A psychiatrist testified that Barrett told him, I lost everything because of a stupid weekend Derek wrote a letter of apology to his wife and Michelle's family, stating, No words can begin to describe the emotional pain I have caused you and your family. I can only imagine what you're going through after your loss. Every single moment of my life. I wish I could go back in time and undo that terrible day my own problems spilled over into the family home, and they paid the price. In some small way, all I can do is dedicate my life to making amends for what I have done. Tam Mei Jiang, in her mother's translated victim impact statement, requested that the judge sentence this vicious rapist, malicious torturer, and cold-hearted murderer to life in prison. In April 2016, the death of Hamong may have caused great pain to my entire family, and as a single mother attempting to support her daughter, who was an international student in Sydney, she stated that my healthy mother was in such grief that she also died. Not long after learning of Meng Mei's death, my family was dealt such devastating blows that we are still suffering irreversibly. Derek Barrett pleaded guilty after being charged with multiple counts. In December 2017, he was sentenced to 46 years in prison, with the possibility of parole at 34 years and 6 months. Barrett sat with his head down during his sentencing, barely reacting. He was supposed to become eligible for parole in 2050. But circumstances changed. Detective Gary Jubelin spoke to the media outside court, welcoming the lengthy sentence. 
The courts recognized the gravity of the offense with the sentence imposed on Mr. Barrett, he stated, from an investigative standpoint, it is satisfying that we have justice, but there is no joy in a situation like this. It's just a very sad case. Michelle's family asked the judge to sentence Barrett to life in prison, so they were dissatisfied with the outcome. The story does not end there. However, another event occurred, forcing Barrett back into the courtroom and causing additional distress for Michelle's family. For years after the crime, a woman discovered a USB drive in the hands of her elderly mother, who suffered from dementia. The elderly woman was not related to Derek Barrett and lived about six miles from where he lived before being arrested in 2016. Because of her memory issues, she couldn't recall where she obtained the USB drive. It's still a mystery. Her daughter decided to view the contents of the flash drive on her computer. The video she saw shocked her, so she immediately called the cops. Derek Barrett was identified by investigators as the man who repeatedly satisfied his desire and treated Michelle as an object rather than a person in the videos. The footage was captured on April 22nd and 23rd, 2016. An offender who enjoyed hurting, humiliating, and degrading MS, Ling defiled her personal integrity cruelly. According to the police statement, the new videos were discovered and reported to Michelle's mother. This caused her even more distress, and she claimed that when the police informed her of the contents of the videos, she began to faint. Barrett set up two video cameras in Michelle's room to record his actions from various perspectives. Supreme Court Justice Helen Wilson, who handed down Barrett's original maximum sentence of 46 years, told the court that if she had known the full extent of his crimes in 2017, she would have sentenced him to life in prison. Judge Wilson described the disgusting contents of the nine videos discovered on the USB drive. She said a compilation of the videos provided by police lasted about 60 minutes and began with Barrett entering his bedroom. She was clearly shocked and alarmed by his entry into her bedroom and didn't want him there. The recordings clearly show that Justice Wilson intended to relive that enjoyment later. She claimed that the offender went to great lengths to make the USB stick and that his disposal of it indicated a desire not to be caught. After new evidence was discovered, Derek Barrett was charged with Michelle Lang's carnal abuse. Barrett pleaded guilty and made no statements. In March 2021, he was sentenced to another 20 years in prison. Unfortunately, both of his sentences will run concurrently. Nevertheless, he will be eligible for parole two years later than originally planned. He will be released from prison no earlier than October 27, 2052. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A first year student went out dancing with her friends and disappeared. Without a trace, several days later her car was found abandoned under a bridge. The police started an investigation, which eventually became one of the most high-profile and iconic cases in the entire state, although they did eventually uncover the truth. The case continues to haunt detectives to this day. 42 years later, Gina Renee Hall was born on August 24, 1961. In the American state of Virginia, she had an older sister named Vienna and loving parents. However, Tragic events followed her in childhood. When she was two years old, she and her mother were involved in a serious car accident. As a result, Gina was seriously injured and suffered third-degree burns. She had to undergo a long course of treatment, but it was impossible to completely get rid of the burns. Her mother blamed herself for the accident, and over time things only got worse. The woman developed serious psychological problems, which eventually led to her leaving the family. Gina and her sister struggled to deal with this event, but their father did an excellent job of raising the children. Later, he remarried, and the girls gained his stepmother after finishing high school. Gina decided to attend a local college to become a nurse, but after the first semester she thought about changing schools. Her older sister was studying at Radford University, and Gina transferred there. This university offered more in-depth education in her chosen field, and was generally more prestigious. 
In addition, the young women could spend a lot of time together as they had been very close since childhood. Diana rented an apartment near the university, and Gina moved in with her from the first months of her studies. Gina had a group of friends with whom she spent a lot of free time. She was thrilled with the university and especially happy to be living with her sister again. Diana was finishing her final year at the time, while Gina was only in her first year during the summer break of 1980. Both young women decided to stay at the university and attend additional classes. Gina also wanted to spend more time with her sister before she graduated on June 28. Gina took her last exam to finish her first year and decided to celebrate. She planned to go dancing at a club with her friends and sister, but Diana decided to stay home at the last minute. Gina was upset about it, but still went to the club with her friends around 10 p.m. She took Diana's Chevrolet Monte Carlo and drove to a nearby city where the club was located at 1 a.m. Diana woke up from a call on the home phone. It was Gina, and from her voice, her sister seemed slightly concerned about something. The young woman said that she was at a lake house with a guy named Steph, and she soon hung up. Diana thought it was strange at 18. Gina had never been involved with boys throughout her life. The young woman had complexes due to burns covering a significant part of her body, so she always avoided relationships with the opposite sex. Diana thought her sister had gone there with other friends and did not attach much importance to. It the young woman woke up at around 6 a.m. and immediately went to her sister's room, but she was not there. The car was also missing from their parking spot. Diana began to worry seriously because Gina should have already returned home at around 7.30 a.m. An old friend of Gina's came to their apartment. He served in the army and returned home for a few days to see his friends and family. A few days before this, he and Gina agreed to meet this morning. Diana became even more worried her sister was irresponsible and punctual person, and she could not imagine her setting up a meeting with someone close. And not showing up, Diana called several of Gina's friends with whom she was that evening, but none of them saw the girl after the club. Then, with this young man from the army, they decided that Gina could have had an accident or someone kidnapped her. They got in the car and drove to the lake, inspecting the surrounding areas around the roads for the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. This task was complicated by the fact that they did not even roughly know which house Gina was in that night. After driving for several hours on different routes, they returned home, and Diana decided to contact the police as usual. In those days, the police were in no hurry to accept reports of a missing person. Gina was 18, so the operator advised waiting until the next day to file a report. In the evening, Diana also called her father and reported her sister missing. The man arrived the next morning, and they again turned to the police. This time, the report was accepted, but they still did not rush to conduct the full-scale surge. The police still thought that the young woman had just gone out and no danger threatened her. Then Diana, her father, and some of Gina's friends decided to go on their own search again. This time they were met with an alarming discovery driving near the bridge on the edge of Radford. They saw Diana's car next to the railway viaduct. The trunk was open and the doors were unlocked the first thing. Diana noticed was that the driver's seat was pushed all the way back, which seemed very strange to her. Gina was just over 150 centimeters tall and she always had to move the driver's seat as close to the steering wheel as possible. Physically, Gina wouldn't be able to drive with the seat pushed all. The way back which led everyone to a very alarming thought someone else must have been behind the wheel. In addition, inside the car relatives noticed several broken handles and a red mark resembling blood was visible on the trunk lid. They reported their findings to the police and detectives examined. The car more thoroughly hairs were found inside that matched Gina's hair color and length near the location of the car. They also found one of Gina's shoes and a blue towel in 1980 DNA analysis was not yet practiced so the police could not determine whose blood was on the trunk door. Despite this, the detectives finally started to properly investigate the case because they believed that Gina was dead. However, at the same time, a mass shooting occurred nearby and most of the police were transferred to that case. As a result, a simple road patrolman with no experience in such matters was appointed as the lead detective. Soon after the car was found, another interesting fact emerged. It turned out that two different Police officers saw the car while driving by the first notice that around 5 a.m. on the night of Gina's disappearance, despite the car being parked with an open trunk. He did not suspect anything and thought the car belonged to a fisherman they really liked to park in that spot. Because it was close to the riverbank, the second police officer drove by a few hours later. He did not approach the car, but only ran its plates over the radio hearing that the car was not. 
and the system is stolen, the officer left the lead detective spoke with Diana and learned that Gina called her at 1 a.m. and said she was at a house by the lake at the time they did not know which exact house she was referring to or whose staff was there for the officers went there and knocked on every door. Unfortunately, this did not yield any results. Most of the houses were only used on weekends and the residents of the others did not see Gina. Meanwhile, divers began inspecting the river next to where Gina's car was found. It looked as though an unknown person had killed Gina brought her to the river and dumped her in the water. However, the divers encountered strong currents and almost zero visibility underwater leading them to speculate that if Gina's body was thrown into the water more than a day ago, it could have been carried far away. Meanwhile, Gina's father and sister held on to hope that she would be found alive. They didn't rely solely on the police and went to the local radio station to report her disappearance, hoping that someone in the community might have information or be a witness the detectives focused on finding that Stephen who was with Gina in the house by the lake he planned to question all of her friends who were at the club but before he could do so Stephen himself called the police station and showed up for questioning he turned out to be 28 year old Stephen Epperly Stephen explained that Bill one of Gina's friends and a member of their group invited him to the club that evening they danced and had a good time and then Stephen suggested going to Bill's parents house by the lake Bill's parents were away for a few weeks and asked their son to look after the house. Gina agreed and they drove to the house in her car Stephen drove and after arriving at the house Gina called her sister, then she and Stephen went swimming in the lake when they returned to the house Stephen tried to kiss her, but Gina refused saying that she wasn't ready because they had only met a few hours earlier they spent more time in the house before leaving at around 4 a.m. Gina drove Stephen to his house and then went home when Stephen heard about Gina's disappearance on the radio he decided to go to the police station and tell them about that night the detective asked Stephen to show him the house by the lake and they went there together on the way the detective tried to get as much information as possible from Stephen about that evening to understand what might have happened to Gina Stephen recalled that she had planned to meet an old friend who just returned from the army that morning he also remembered that shortly before they left the house bill and his girlfriend arrived the four of them talked briefly before Stephen and Gina left the detective also questioned Gina's other friends, who confirmed Stephen's story that she left the club with him after midnight. Bill told the detective that Steph approached him in this club and asked for the keys. Bill's friend warned him that Steph was planning to come to the house later with his girlfriend, and Steph left. However, something interesting happened next. The detectives asked Bill if he saw Gina when he arrived at the house, and Bill denied it. According to him, when he and his girlfriend arrived, Steph was standing in the laundry room, drying himself with a towel. He said that he and Gina would leave soon, and Bill and his girlfriend went to another room. The last thing they heard was the front door closing. None of them saw or heard Gina. The detective found this strange, as Steph had mentioned that Gina was talking to Bill and his girlfriend, but Bill denied it after checking Steph's criminal history. The detectives found nothing serious, there were only a few traffic fines, but when he asked his colleagues at the station if they were familiar with this name, several officers told him a number of troubling stories. Staff often got into fights in bars, and the police had to intervene regularly, but he was never charged in any of these cases. When Stephen was around 18 years old, the police visited his home several times because the young man attacked his younger sister and even his mother with his fists. In these cases, the family refused to press charges, so these incidents did not make it into his criminal record, but that's not all. The detective called several police stations located in other counties where Steph used to live. In one of them, he was told that once the guy broke into his ex-girlfriend's house and beat her and subjected her to violence, but the woman managed to escape. When her little child cried in the next room, Steph let the victim go to calm the child down. Instead, she ran out with the child to the police station. Despite all this, the young man somehow managed to avoid punishment. Sometime later, he deceitfully lured another young woman to his apartment, saying that they're going to a party with friends. Instead, when the young woman entered the room, he closed the door and subjected her to violence. The victim went to the police. But again, Steph somehow avoided punishment. With all this information in hand, the detectives began to suspect Steph. The police went to the house by the lake to conduct a search where they found several disturbing discoveries. When Bill spoke with the investigator, he said he did not notice anything strange in the house after Gina's disappearance, but as soon as the forensic team arrived, they found many troubling signs of a heinous crime. There was a large blood stain on the living room floor that had clearly been attempted to be cleaned. 
Blood stains were also found throughout the house, including on the refrigerator door, a dustpan, some shoes, and so on. In addition, the broken ankle bracelet Gina always wore was found in the house bill, and his parents noticed. The disappearance of several items from the house, including two blue towels, one of which the police found next to Gina's car, a bath mat, and a large number of paper towels, but the most interesting thing was that almost all of the cleaning supplies had disappeared from the house, which had previously been well stocked with them. The police found an empty bottle of bleach in the garbage container, along with long hair of the same color, as Gina's experts examined blood samples from the house. DNA analysis was still unavailable at that time, but they matched Gina's blood group. Learning all this, Bill shared additional information with investigators. He told them that he heard about Gina's disappearance on the radio and immediately thought that Steph might be involved. In addition to being with her that night, all their friends knew about his criminal tendencies and aggressive behavior Bill went to Steph's workplace and started asking him about that evening. Steph insisted that he had nothing to do with the young woman's disappearance, but then something interesting happened when Bill asked him to contact the police. Steph agreed but asked his friend not to tell anyone that he was with Gina that night. He also wondered how many people saw him leave the club with her. Bill also told something else about that night. When Gina left the club with Steph, she looked confused, apparently thinking that all her friends were going to the house by the lake and was in disarray. The next day, Bill and his friends had a barbecue in that house. None of them knew about Gina's disappearance at that time. While they were sitting outside, Steph volunteered to make drinks for everyone and went into the house. He spent a lot of time in there, and when he finally returned, he explained that he couldn't find the bottle opener. The detective thought that in fact Steve had been trying to clean up the blood stains all this time since he hadn't been able to do it completely at night. Despite no direct evidence linking staff to the crime, the detectives no longer doubted that he was the one behind the murder. According to his version, that evening at the club, he invited Gina to the lake and said that the other friends were also going there in the house. He tried to kiss her, but the young woman refused, and then the man attacked her, subjected her to violence, killed her, and hid the body somewhere in the house. After that, for several hours he tried to clean the blood and erase the traces of the struggle. When Bill came to the house with his girlfriend, Steph waited until they went into the room and moved Gina's body to the trunk of her own car. Then he drove her to the river, threw her into the water, and left the car there. The man did not even think to move the driver's seat closer to the steering wheel as it was originally installed. The big problem remained in this story. Gina's body was still not found in those years. Courts rarely sentenced criminals if there was no victim's body. Lawyers could always insist that without a body, it was impossible to consider a person dead with 100% certainty, and there was always a slight chance that the person was actually alive. Investigators continued to search for additional evidence, and two weeks after Gina's disappearance, they decided to re-examine the place where her car was found. This time they brought more officers and it paid off they found the young woman's clothing nearby covered in blood experts found several hairs on it, one of which matched Steph's hair. In addition, they found small particles of foreign fabric after conducting a series of necessary analysis they determined that these particles completely matched the carpet in the house by the lake. In addition to the clothes, they found a second towel missing from the house. However, the police admitted that all these things were thrown by the killer after the car was found as this particular place had already been inspected that day, the detectives did not stop there in an attempt to obtain more evidence he contacted a dog handler, and he came with his search dog to the place where the car was found, then something that shocked all the present officers happened the dog took the trail and headed across the river on a bridge, then it walked through the streets of Radford almost circling the entire city, when suddenly the dog approached one of the houses climbed down to the porch and gave the signal to the dog handler. It was a house where Stephen Epperly and his relatives lived. Even the dog handler did not expect such a result he did not know who Steph was or what he was suspected of. The detective had hoped at best that the dog would lead them to some additional evidence or a body, but in the end, the dog led them to the porch of a possible suspect. Later that day, Steph was called in for questioning with the use of a polygraph. He continued to deny his guilt, but the polygraph operator repeatedly detected that he was lying. After the questioning, the investigators told him that their trained dog had just led them to his home. Stephen covered his face with his hands and said something like, What a good dog dot, however, without Gina's body, he still couldn't be charged with murder and staff remained free. 
When the whole town learned about his previous crimes and the evidence against him in Gina's case, no one doubted his guilt. People came to his house and wrote threatening letters, and the man decided to move to a small town in an Ohio. Five days later, a 25-year-old woman disappeared not far from where Steph had settled, and a month later, her body was found in a cornfield. Local detectives knew that Stephen was suspected in Gina's murder, and he immediately became the prime suspect. However, his guilt could not be proven due to the lack of evidence. Bill continued to talk to staff and tell the police about their conversations when Stephen found out that Bill had a good lawyer he asked if he could represent him and even more disturbingly he asked Bill to ask him if the police could arrest him if the police that the chances of a guilty verdict in court were slim but after the other young woman's murder he decided to risk his career and arrested Stephen he was charged with murder and the case went to trial the situation was complicated by the fact that an inexperienced prosecutor was assigned to the case who had only been in the position for seven months. Others simply refused to participate in such a complex process where they had to prove a murder without a body surprisingly, the prosecutor did an excellent job. The trial lasted more than three months, and ultimately the jury found Stephen Eberly guilty of Gina's murder. The prosecutor presented all available evidence and was able to convince the jury that the victim was dead and the staff was the killer. As a result, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. This was not only the first conviction without a body in Virginia, but also the first time a court accepted a search dog's lead as evidence. Unfortunately, investigators were unable to prove Steph's involvement in the murder of another woman in Ohio. They also continued to search for Gina's body, but these efforts were halted in 1994. However, in 2016, 36 years after Gina's murder, a local resident came forward to the Radford police. He confessed that his family had been keeping a terrible secret all these years. In 1980, their grandfather, who lived on a farm outside of town, saw two men in a white van pulling a body out of a car near. A field detectives thought this could be Gina and resume their search. However, they were unable to find any remains, but the grandson's revelation led to new searches for Gina's remains. Her sister, Diana, played a big role in this continuing to hope for closure. In 2019, she met a forensic anthropologist who invented a unique method for finding DNA underground. His tool detected the presence of any human biological material and investigators used it in their search. After many months, it bore fruit. In 2020, they found Gina's remains in eight different locations. Along the river and lake, these were mostly small pieces that would have been impossible to find without special equipment. Only in one case were they able to find a bone fragment that belonged to the young woman. As for staff, he is still serving his sentence despite numerous appeals and attempts to be released early investigators believe he may have had many more victims, but they have been unable to find the necessary evidence over the years. Their only comfort is that he has been isolated from society and has not harmed anyone else. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The student rode her bicycle and disappeared. Without a trace, the police launched a surge, but none of them could have imagined the disturbing revelations that awaited them in just a few days. So many shocking details emerged in the case that even seasoned FBI agents were horrified, and none of them expected such an ending. Sierra Jacob was born on February 11, 1996, in the small American town of Delta, Ohio. The girl grew up in a very large and friendly family. She had two sisters and two brothers. Sierra loved to play sports and was on the school volleyball team. She also loved to travel. The girl dreamed of visiting Italy and put a lot of effort into making that wish come true until she finally managed to go there. During her studies, she started dating a guy named Josh. After graduating high school, they went to different universities. Sierra planned to get a job with her uncle who owned a metal fabrication company, and the young woman decided to major in human resources. She enrolled at Toledo University, located 50 kilometers from her home. Despite the distance she and Josh planned to keep dating and made plans for their future, the couple even began to take their time choosing engagement rings for their future wedding. After two years at university, the young woman went to her hometown for a summer vacation. At that point, she still had some schoolwork to close, but she decided to do it from home so she could spend more time with her family and her boyfriend in addition to that Sierra was also doing an internship with her uncle's company she was in her 20s at. 
The time and the young woman was thoroughly preparing to work there after graduation on July 19, 2016, Sierra decided to drive to her boyfriend's house. She had bought a new bike a few days before and she couldn't wait to try it out. The young woman left the house at about 5 p.m. and headed toward Josh's house around 9 p.m. Her mother came home and found her daughter not there. This struck her as a little strange. She thought Sierra would have come home by now, but it was summer and it was just starting to get dark outside. Besides, the young woman was already in her 20s and her mother didn't worry about it. She had assumed that her daughter would stay at the boyfriend's house, but that all changed when Josh called her at 1.30 p.m. He asked if Sarah was home since the boyfriend couldn't reach her according to the young man they broke up at about 7 p.m. and she hasn't been in touch since considering that more than three hours had passed since then the young woman's mother began to get seriously worried together with Josh they started calling friends and relatives of the young woman hoping she had stopped by one of them but no one had seen her that night then the mother called all the nearby hospitals but there was no one there either eventually the woman decided to go to the police and around midnight she filed a missing persons report. Despite the fact that Sierra was 20 years old, the police immediately began. Their search given that Josh was the last person to see her, they went to him. The guy said that the young woman arrived at his house shortly after 5 p.m. After about an hour and a half, they decided to go for a ride together. Sierra rode her bike, and Josh rode his motorcycle. The couple rode along country roads along numerous cornfields. Josh even took a picture of Sierra on her bike and the young woman posted it on social media after riding around for a while they decided to go their separate ways Sierra and Josh separated about a mile away from her house. The guy rode back on his motorcycle and she headed home on her bike. While the police talked to the young man other officers drove around looking for Sierra they headed for the road near where the young woman had begun her journey home alone and soon they were able to spot the first disturbing tip off as they drove along the road along the fields one of the officers saw that the corn stalks in one place were heavily pinched as if someone had waded through them he walked over there with a flashlight and after a few yards saw Sierra's bicycle on examining it the policeman saw traces of blood on the handles and seat next to the bicycle was a woman's sock which also had blood stains on it he reported the find to his colleagues and soon other police officers arrived on the scene on closer inspection they found several other items not far from the bike they were men's sunglasses a screwdriver and some car fuses just as interesting was the fact that motorcycle tire tracks led to the bicycle across the cornfield. All this was enough for the investigators to come to a disappointing conclusion it was likely that Sarah had been stolen. As the case took a serious turn, they began to look closely at Josh as a possible suspect. First of all, statistically speaking, it is the people closest to them who are most likely to turn out to be the perpetrators. Second, that night Josh was riding a motorcycle and next to the bike, Sierra found similar tire tracks. Besides that, the detectives wondered why the guy didn't walk the young woman home. She had less than a mile to go, and he was on a motorcycle and could have gotten home quickly anyway. Josh allowed the police officers to look around his house, his car, and his motorcycle, and that's where the officers came across his work overalls, which showed signs of blood. The young man said he wore the clothes when he was hunting, and the blood belonged to animals. Investigators turned the overalls over to experts, and they quickly confirmed that he was telling the truth otherwise. There was nothing to suggest Josh was involved. The experts also examined the items found in the field and extracted one DNA sample from them that belonged to an unknown person. Josh immediately volunteered a sample, and they did not match. As a result, he was no longer considered a suspect, and the police started looking for other leads. The next day they received a call from a farmer the man told them that on the evening of Sierra's disappearance he was driving down the same road with his son at one point they noticed a motorcycle helmet on the side of the road and the father told his son to bring it to the car the farmer later examined it more closely and saw traces of blood on it and then contacted the police detectives admitted that the helmet may have belonged to the kidnapper but his identity remained a mystery at this point the FBI was already involved in the case and the agents decided to take a close look at the Photo that Josh had taken of Sierra shortly before her disappearance thanks to the photo they knew what kind of clothes she was wearing, but the detectives noticed something else the young woman was wearing a fitness bracelet on her wrist. They immediately requested geolocation data for the device but here the investigators were unsuccessful the device had been turned off shortly after Sierra disappeared the police received another tip shortly thereafter Josh told them that as he and the young woman were driving down the road a 
Suspicious white van followed them. The guy got the feeling that the driver was following them. The vehicle was traveling at a slow speed and slowed down. When the couple slowed down at one point, Josh even tried to drive up to him, but the driver pulled away. The guy thought it was strange and he even remembered part of his license plate number. The police quickly found the vehicle and its owner. She turned out to be a woman and detectives determined that she had nothing to do with the crime. During the conversation, she herself accused Josh of trying to drive up to her and push her off the road. As a result, investigators decided that there had simply been a miscommunication between them and continued to look for more leads. Several days had passed since Sierra's disappearance, but the police were still unable to find any additional clues. Then they decided to go through all the residents who had been previously convicted of violent crimes and lived in nearby communities. Going through the list of these people, they immediately noticed one man. 57-year-old James Worley. He lived only a few kilometers from the field where Sierra's bicycle was found. The reason the police were so interested in him was very simple. James had been convicted of kidnapping a young woman in the 1990s. She was riding her bicycle when suddenly a man ran over her in his van, threatening her with his screwdriver. He tried to force the young woman into the car, but she managed to escape. Given that Sierra disappeared during the bike ride and the screwdriver was found next to him, police quickly suspected James of kidnapping her. Investigators went to him to verify this theory. The man was clearly unhappy about the visit and stated that he had not killed anyone. Nevertheless, he voluntarily allowed the officers to inspect his home. James and his mother lived on a 120-acre farm, and there were many different structures on this huge property. It took the detectives a long time to look at them all, during this process, James kept repeating to the police that he had not kidnapped Sierra and had only heard about the case from the news. This behavior began to seem strange to them. The man was literally repeating the same thing over and over again, but something more interestingly awaited them next. Suddenly, James said that on the night of Sierra's disappearance, he had just driven along that road and his motorcycle had stalled near. The very spot where the police later found the young woman's bicycle, according to James, he saw her bike and decided to get closer, so he headed into the field, pushing his motorcycle nearby. The man added that, as he walked there, his car fuses, sunglasses, screwdriver, and helmet fell out. Suddenly, his motorcycle started up again, and James drove on, forgetting to pick up all those items as. You might have guessed the detectives were very suspicious of this story. In addition, just a few hours earlier, a witness had approached them and said that the evening of Sierra's disappearance, he had seen a strange van. On that road, the witness noticed it because the vehicle was driving at a very high speed, breaking all possible rules. He memorized the license plate number and gave that information to the police after running the blades. Detectives learned that the van belonged to James and during a search, he spotted it near the house. The man also allowed them to examine the van and the officers found something of interest inside where a ski mask, duct tape, plastic clamps, handcuffs, and a maze. The items themselves did not in any way indicate his guilt, but given James's criminal record for kidnapping, such a set made investigators suspicious. But the creepiest finds awaited them in one of the barn's detectives found a separate room where behind a hidden door inside which was an air mattress beside it were chains that looked as if they had been designed to keep a person in the room next to the mattress was a refrigerator inside of which. The police found traces of blood. There is also a strong smell of bleach from which they deduced that the blood had been thoroughly clean but the main clue was the contents of a small box. There were bras and several pairs of women's underwear, one of which had blood on it all, this was enough to arrest James, at least temporarily, while experts examined the collected evidence the man was taken in for questioning and asked to explain the secret room with the blood and chains. In response, James gave them another dubious story. He said he had made the room because he wanted to set up his own studio to shoot adult material, so it was just his. Improvised film said, of course, the detectives didn't believe what he said. The room looked as if it had originally been made to hold people against their will. Nevertheless, they still could not connect it to Sierra's disappearance, nor could they determine her whereabouts, but that all changed on the third day after her disappearance. During a lengthy surge, the police found a freshly dug grave in a field that contained Sierra's body. Her hands were handcuffed, and the young woman had a large plastic toy in her mouth. She was also wearing an adult diaper. Medical examiners determined that the victim died from strangulation, but they were unable to determine even the approximate time of death. In addition, they did not find any signs of violence around the same time forensic scientists were actively examining all. The evidence collected from James Barn, they found female DNA on one of the pieces of duct tape lying next to the mattress, and it matched Sierra's DNA. The cops also obtained geolocation data on James' smartphone. It turned out that on the night of the young woman's disappearance, he had spent almost 
Two hours near that location, they received another disturbing piece of evidence from the psychologist James had court appointed for a previous abduction. According to him, during one of his sessions, James stated that he was learning from his mistakes with each new abduction, and then next time he was going to bury the bodies. Apparently, the psychologist decided not to inform the police of such disturbing statements made by his client, and did so only after he had been accused of murder. With this set of clues, the detectives formed the most likely chronology of events. Apparently, James spotted Sierra on the road that night, hit her with his helmet, and dragged her into a field with his bicycle. Based on his geolocation data, the man sat there until the sun went down during that time. He called his brother and told him that his motorcycle had broken down. Apparently, this was his way of creating an alibi. As soon as it got dark outside, James drove home, got off his motorcycle onto his van, and returned to the field, picked up Sierra, and took her to his barn. At that point, the young woman was either unconscious or restrained what happened next. Only James knew he apparently abused the victim for some time before killing her and burying her in a field. Experts only speculated that the victim may have been there for three days. The man himself continued to deny all of these allegations, and the case went to trial. The trial began in March 2018 with the prosecution presenting additional evidence that further pointed to his guilt. It turned out that the key to the handcuffs placed on the victim's hands was found on James' keychain. His lawyers decided to stick with the theory that James simply wanted to set up an adult film studio in his barn, and the cops pulled that into the murder. However, they did not provide any adequate arguments for their client's innocence. The trial ended in less than a month, and on March 28th, the jury found him guilty. As a result, James received the death penalty, with his execution scheduled for May 20th, 2025. Of course, this story was far from over for the detectives. Given everything they had learned about the man, the police were certain that James had committed similar crimes before, but he had managed to avoid responsibility. Investigators were still working on his case, trying to tie the unsolved disappearances to James, but it had yet to yield concrete results. The victim's parents established the Sierra Scholarship and also participated in the creation of a bill that would have required the state to make an open registry of people previously convicted of murder and kidnapping. The bill was quickly supported and went into effect on March 20th, 2019. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will look at what happened in the US state of Georgia. Nobody has seen the 31-year-old Indiana lawyer since 7.17 p.m. On February 24, 2022, a surveillance camera captured her outside her mother-in-law's home in Johns Creek. The police and her family have made significant efforts to determine where Sierra went and what happened to her. Sierra Locklear of Cleveland, Georgia, was a cheerful and ambitious woman. Sierra wanted people to take her seriously. Her mother, Kelly Locklear, said, so. She was tough. She followed in the footsteps of her mother, who was a paralegal. She became a lawyer. Ciara grew up in Georgia and aspired to live in Atlanta one day. Kelly, a Georgia native, claimed that Atlanta had always been her plan. To get there, Ciara had to leave Georgia. She attended the University of Tennessee for college before attending law school at Florida State University. Ciara eventually became a lawyer and specialized in insurance defense. Kelly described her daughter as following she overcame and pushed through. Kelly also stated that she was happy, energetic, and loving. She was extremely motivated in her career. Sierra met Xavier Breland on Tinder in October 2020, and their relationship quickly took off. The couple married after six months. Sierra was already pregnant at this point. According to court records, Sierra assisted Xavier with his legal issues with his ex-wife. After some time, the newlyweds decided to relocate to Carmel, Indiana, to begin their new lives there. Ciara started working at a law firm and had a son named Jackson at the end of 2021. From the outside, Xavier and Ciara seemed like the ideal couple. However, their relationship problems began shortly after they met. Shelby Campbell, Ciara's cousin, said the couple's problems began after their first date. Ciara informed Xavier that she did not want to continue communicating with him, but her future husband was not the type of person who could handle rejection. Instead, 
If Xavier showed up uninvited to her apartment and sat near her door, he began sending her threatening messages because he noticed her with another man. Ciara threatened to contact the authorities if he did not stop. Finally, she gave him another chance. Six months later, they were married. Shelby and Ciara were best friends who texted each other daily. Ciara expressed her feelings to her, stating that she was afraid of her husband. For example, one of her messages read, well, I'm struggling with it in a big way. I don't want to give up on someone I love and abandon him and our family. However, I believe that the behavior is deteriorating. So, if this is how things are now, how will it be in the future? Furthermore, he used to feel bad when he said ugly things. And lately, he's not even sorry for his actions. He's blaming me for it, as if I did it because you forced me to. Sierra stated that her husband would be held responsible if anything happened to her. Shelby claimed she often told Sierra to leave her husband, but Sierra understood that if she was going to leave, she needed to do so strategically. Here is another screenshot of Shelby and Sierra's text conversation. Sierra was obviously afraid of her husband. Shelby Campbell stated that the texts she shared were only a few examples of what was going on between Sierra and her husband. She called the police several times. The police were called to her home in both Georgia and Indiana several times. Campbell stated that by the time the police arrived, she would have calmed down enough to tell him where she was lying. Shelby claimed that after one of those incidents, an investigator called Sierra's mother and informed her that he knew she was lying about what was going on when she called 911 and that he had seen the same pattern many times before. He was worried about what would happen to her. Ciara was preparing to leave her husband. She opened a secret bank account and transferred money there. The messages had a strong impact on the woman. Ciara stated that she loved her husband but couldn't afford to stay in the relationship. Her parents, Kelly and Nick Locklairs, were aware that their daughter's family situation was far from ideal. They wanted Ciara to break up with Xavier and assured her that she could always return to a safe place, i.e. her home. Ciara's fateful trip to Georgia began when she and Xavier loaded their baby and large dog into Ciara's 2017 white Volkswagen Tiguan and drove 11 hours south. According to her family, Ciara arrived at her parents' home on February 19th. She spent the night with family members who hadn't seen her since she moved to Indiana. It seemed like a quick trip to see her family. However, Ciara decided that she would no longer return to Indiana. Xavier was also interested in the trip because his mother lived in Georgia. However, he was unaware that Ciara would not return. She informed her mother that she was going to find work in Georgia. She had also informed her parents that her husband's abusive behavior was escalating and that she was getting divorced. Ciara showed up at Nick and Kelly's home in Cleveland, Georgia, on Saturday, February 19th. The woman remained at her parents' house until Sunday. It had been a long time since we had seen each other. She reiterated that she wanted to divorce her husband and would not return to Indiana. On Sunday, February 20th, Ciara left her parents' house to pick up her son Jackson from her mother-in-law's house in Johns Creek, Georgia, which is about an hour away. Shelby Campbell stated that one of the last texts she received from her cousin read, I'm at Xavier's mom's house, he won't give me Jackson, so I'm waiting for him before I leave. On Monday, February 21st, at 11.17 p.m., Sierra texted her father Nick, I'll be back in the morning if that's okay, of course. It's okay, you don't need to ask. Nick responded to her. Nick stated that the next day, when he had not heard from Sierra, he attempted to contact her again and she said everything was fine. She mentioned that she had felt a little sick. Nick said he contacted her again on Wednesday to see if she was feeling better. He did not get a response. He texted her again on Thursday, February 24th. No one replied. By Friday, the Locklairs were concerned because Sierra had not responded, which was unusual. Then on Saturday evening, February 26th, Nick received a call from an unknown Indiana number. I didn't immediately panic because I assumed they were still in Georgia, Nick said. So I responded, and they said it was the police, and that's when they informed me she was missing. The policeman stated that Sierra's husband had reported her missing. The family was shocked. They assumed Sierra was still in Georgia, even though she had not responded to their messages, which was unusual for her. 
Shelby Campbell is perplexed as to why he did not contact anyone to inquire about her safety. He did not contact anyone. He did not make us aware at all. After speaking with the Carmel police, Sierra's father called her, and Xavier answered. That is how Nick described his brief conversation with his missing daughter's husband. I asked, if Xavier, tell me the truth. What is going on Sierra told me that if anything happened to her, you were responsible, so just tell me the truth. He then hung up, telling me to go to hell. Nick then called Xavier's father, who lived next to Sierra and Xavier and Carmel. The father responded, no, I never saw her as Nick had said. According to a press release issued on March 2nd by the Carmel Police Department in Indiana, Xavier Breland reported Sierra as missing to their office on Saturday, February 26, 2022. During the investigation, detectives discovered a video recording that showed Sierra's last known location. On February 24th at 7.17 p.m., she was at her mother-in-law's house in Georgia. Nothing unusual happens during the video. According to the official missing person report from the Carmel Police Department, Sierra left their home in the Brookstone Park of Carmel Subdivision in Carmel, Indiana, shortly after 10 p.m. On February 25th, walked to the nearby store. She was reportedly wearing a black top and purple shorts in temperatures nearing 20 degrees that night. According to police, Ciara never arrived, and there is no surveillance video of her entering the store. They were also concerned because she had left her phone, work phone, and burner phone behind, along with her ID, credit cards, and five-month-old son. Family members stated that she had a burner phone to contact them in an emergency. There was no evidence of Sierra's return to Indiana. Her family knew she wanted to stay in Georgia. Furthermore, Sierra would not have left without informing them. Even more suspicious was that she had abandoned her five-month-old son. Her mother thought it all sounded absurd. Kelly LaClaire stated that her daughter confessed to her that the couple was having serious financial problems and accused her husband of being abusive to her and using their child as leverage to get her to stay with him. Kelly said she and her husband knew their daughter was dead after police called to report Ciara had gone missing, leaving her child behind. She is definitely gone, Kelly said. That was the first thing my husband said when police called after Xavier reported her missing and the officer said she had left without bringing the baby. She refused to take a shower or let anyone else watch the baby. Kelly described Sierra as a devoted mother who lived to care for her son. She claimed Sierra awoke every hour or two to check on her son, who had a rash. So when they said that, my husband said, no, no, there is no way my daughter would not do that. If that's the case, and you're telling me she's missing, and the baby isn't with her, then my daughter died. Kelly said she would not leave him. On February 28, 2020, two days after reporting Ciara missing, Xavier noticed police officers at his door. According to court documents, a firearm was accidentally discharged at a home on Baldwin Lane. Xavier told investigators he was moving a Christmas tree in the garage when he heard a gunshot and bolted out. He then returned to the garage, found the gun, and unloaded it. He called the police and reported the incident. The investigators discovered two different guns in his home. The police did not reveal whether there was any evidence that Xavier was involved in Sierra's disappearance. However, his criminal background was quickly revealed. According to court records, Xavier was convicted on felony burglary charges in 2005. It was also unusual that Xavier reported his wife's disappearance only the next day after she allegedly failed to return home after going to the store. A few days after the police received a missing person report, Xavier was identified as a person of interest in his wife's disappearance. They arrested him on unrelated charges. Police discovered that he had an outstanding warrant for aggravated stalking in Kuwait County. He was extradited to Georgia to face the charges. According to court records, he placed a tracker inside his daughter's stuffed animal to track down her mother, his ex-wife. The case arose from a custody dispute between the former couple. On Friday, two weeks after Sierra went missing, police volunteers, family, and friends searched several Johns Creek neighborhoods. Their focus was on neighborhoods along Medlock Bridge Road, where police suspected Ciara had traveled during her stay in Georgia. 
In addition to handing out flyers, the Johns Creek Police Department installed electronic signs at two locations along Kimball Bridge Road, requesting public assistance. They've also contacted several commercial electronic sign companies to help spread Sierra's image and information throughout Metro Atlanta. The family asked anyone who saw the white 2017 Volkswagen Tiguan with the Georgia plate RMB 5869. During that time, contact the police. The license plate of the vehicle was framed by the Florida State University Law School. The police said that forensic investigators searched the car for evidence and then released it. Sierra's last known location was at her mother-in-law's house in Georgia, so the police assumed her disappearance was related to something that happened in this house. They traced Avier's route back to Indiana, but couldn't confirm Sierra was in the car. Xavier was the only one who stepped out of the white Volkswagen at gas stations and shops. It is unclear how much cooperation Xavier Balin's mother provided during the ongoing investigation. However, law enforcement officials confirmed that evidence was collected from the residents using a search warrant in their pursuit of answers. Investigators from Johns Creek used forensic professionals and cadaver dogs to conduct the search. The emphasis was on finding potential bloodstains, signs of a struggle, or any other clues that could shed light on the events surrounding the couple's visit. Despite the use of a canine unit, authorities reported that the search yielded no discernible scent trail at the residence. The specifics of the evidence gathered during the search remain unknown as the case is still being investigated in March 2022. Wii investigators obtained a jailhouse video that shows Xavier Braylon telling his children that Sierra would not be returning home because she had been kidnapped. It contradicts his statement to the Carmel police about her disappearance. Someone kidnapped my wife. He told one of his children at the end of the call, you know what it means to kidnap an adult she isn't coming home. However, Xavier was booked into the Cowata County Jail in Georgia on March 16, 2022. After being extradited from the Hamilton County Jail for aggravated stalking, the case was unrelated to Sierra's disappearance. The charge stemmed from an incident in Georgia in March 2021 in which he hit a tracking device to stalk the mother of his child. At the time, the woman he stacked had a restraining order against him. In August 2022, he was found not guilty. However, he was arrested again and extradited to Indiana. This time, the charge was for unlawful possession of a firearm by a serious, violent felon. At Brooklyn's initial hearing, he pleaded with the judge to reduce his bond to a level his mother could afford. The court reduced his bond to $35,000. While prosecutors wanted it increased to $50,000, all I needed was an opportunity to get my life back on track. Breland informed the judge. Breland stated that he could get a job as a truck driver if he was released from jail. After reviewing the case, the judge set the bond at $100,000. In February 2023, Xavier Breland was released after posting bail. This court decision had consequences, which I will discuss later. He was repeatedly interrogated about Sierra's disappearance but denied any involvement in it. His version is unchanged. She disappeared after going to the store. Several locations have been suggested for the search for evidence in Sierra Brellin's disappearance. Georgia alone has over 85,000 acres of state parks, nearly 2 million acres of land managed by the United States Department of the Interior, and more than 300,000 acres of undeveloped land. Fulton County contains 440 acres of parks. There are also hundreds of thousands of acres of railroad and utility easements both active and inactive. Georgia has 37,295,360 total acres. Approximately 15% to 20% are covered in vegetation. Sierra Breland and her husband drive through areas other than Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana. According to Johns Creek Police Lieutenant Gregory Todd Hood, if we knew her exact last known location, we would direct the investigation accordingly and without going into detail. Kelly Locklear stated that law enforcement has gathered evidence and statements from multiple states, but they are essentially pieces of a puzzle without a complete picture. Some items were removed from Xavier's mom's home, according to court documents from a civil case in which Xavier's mother sued Xavier's Xavier's sister. Crime scene investigation removed the carpet and mattress from Xavier's mother's home on April 21, 2022, 
as part of their investigation. According to documents from the familial civil dispute, five-month-old Jackson was placed in state care immediately after Xavier Brelin's arrest on March 1st. Sierra's parents, Nick and Kelly Locklear, have since been able to spend time with the baby and are working to bring him back to Georgia. Multiple organized searches have been conducted over the last year, some of which targeted specific areas, but no one knows what happened to the new mother. As investigators continue to piece together the facts, officers have been busy handing out flyers and even using electronic signs to raise awareness. The police described Ciara as being five feet tall, weighing approximately 120 pounds, and having blonde hair. She has three small trees tattooed on her ring finger, a Florida State arrow on her left wrist, and a sunburst on her back left rib cage. The couple was driving a white 2017 Volkswagen Tiguan with the Georgia tag RMB 5869. The Florida State University Law School frame encircles the license plate. Anyone who saw her or her car in February is asked to contact the police. Xavier is the only person of interest that police have publicly identified since Ciara's disappearance, but no charges have been filed. Her family is adamant that he knows what happened to her and that he is the only one who can provide the answers they require to find closure. Finally, let Sierra rest in peace. Kelly Locke Lair believes Sierra's body may be in Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, or Indiana. She is pleading with woodsmen and fishermen to keep an eye out in those states and to contact law enforcement if they have any information. Sierra's parents have now been granted custody of the couple's child, as I previously stated, if Xavier Breland was released on bail in a case involving illegal firearms, the trial was scheduled for December 28, 2023. But Xavier Breland did not appear in court and his whereabouts are unknown. A re-arrest warrant has been issued in his name and law enforcement is working hard to find him. This latest development complicates the already perplexing case of Sierra's disappearance. The warrant describes Xavier Breland as a black man standing six feet tall, weighing 160 pounds, with brown hair and green eyes. The FBI has joined the search for the missing woman, but her body has yet to be found. This, combined with Xavier's recent disappearance, has resulted in numerous unanswered questions. Kelly Locklear, Sierra's mother, has publicly stated that she believes Sierra feared Xavier and had no intention of returning to Indiana with him. With both individuals missing, the case has become even more urgent. The trial for Xavier's gun charge has been postponed several times, and law enforcement and Sierra's family are now asking the public for help. They are looking for any information that can help them find Xavier and Sierra in the hopes of shedding light on the strange circumstances surrounding their disappearances. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A woman was found dead in her own bedroom. Her two sons, who lived with her in the same house, heard and saw nothing. Detectives started investigating but they couldn't find the culprit. It took 38 years for a breakthrough in the case, but nobody was prepared. Linda Slighton was born in 1950 in the state of Alabama, USA. She had loving parents and a younger sister named Judy. From an early age, Linda was ambitious and kind-hearted. She always tried to help others, which earned her many friends. Later, she married a man named Frank, with whom she had two sons, Jeff and Tim. However, as the years went by, their marriage became increasingly problematic. Frank developed an alcohol addiction and started to abuse his wife and children. Eventually, Linda left and decided to move to Florida with her sons. They settled in the city of Lakeland, where Linda's parents and sister already lived. Linda rented a house in a residential complex by the lake and dedicated all her time to providing for her sons. Linda took various jobs, but money was always tight for her. Sometimes she had to sell her belongings to pay the bills she couldn't even afford a car, so her elder son Jeff had to ride his bicycle to school. Her younger son Tim played on a football team, and often he had to ask his coach for a ride home after practice to avoid walking despite the financial difficulties. Linda always strived to give her sons the most time and attention she could she took them on hikes brought them to concerts of their favorite bands 
and overall try to ensure their childhood was filled with positive moments on the evening of September 3, 1981, when Linda was 31 years old, she waited for Jim to finish his practice and went with him to the neighbors who were hosting a small family gathering. Meanwhile, Jeff arrived home and wanted to have dinner, but there was hardly any food in the fridge. He got angry at his mother, hopped on his bicycle, and rode to his grandparents' house who lived on the other side of the city. Later, when the whole family returned home, Jeff argued with his mother about the empty fridge. But eventually they wished each other a good night and went to bed. The next morning, Linda's sister, who lived in the same complex, went to her house to invite her for a cup of coffee. She knocked on the door but received no response, thinking that Linda had gone somewhere. The woman turned around and was about to leave when she noticed that the bedroom window was open. She approached it, looked inside, and saw Linda lying across the bed. In the next second, the woman screamed and ran to the neighbors to call the police. One look at her sister's face was enough for her to realize that she was dead. Detectives arrived at their house and began examining the crime scene. Linda was lying on her bed, her clothing partially pulled down with a wire hanger around her neck. Based on this evidence, the police suspected that an unknown man had entered the victim's room and assaulted her and strangled her. Soon, forensic experts confirmed this theory by finding a palm print on the windowsill. Linda often left it open since there was no air conditioning in the apartment, making it easy for the killer to gain access. While the detectives worked at the crime scene, the eldest son of the victim woke up from all the commotion. The investigators took him outside and delivered the tragic news of his mother's death. Afterward, they woke up his younger brother and led him towards the exit. However, at that very moment, as the boy passed by his mother's room, another police officer emerged from it, and through the open door, Tim saw his mother's body in frozen place until the officer pulled him away. Jeff and Tim, age 15 and 12 at the time, were in deep shock initially. They simply couldn't believe that their mother was dead. Later, the investigators managed to talk to them, and the brother stated that they hadn't heard any noise and hadn't even woken up that night despite having their own rooms. The detectives found this strange considering the building had very good acoustics and given the brutal nature of the murder, loud noises should have been audible from the victim's room. The police interviewed the neighbors, who also hadn't heard anything. None of the residents in the complex had seen any. Suspicious individuals that day, medical experts examined the victim's body and confirmed that she had been subjected to violence. They extracted the killer's biological material, but at that time they couldn't conduct DNA analysis. The experts also confirmed that Linda died as a result of strangulation, so the detectives had to investigate the case with almost no evidence. The palm print could only help them if they managed to find a suspect and make a comparison. Linda's sons moved in with their grandparents. They remained in a state of shock and constantly feared that the unknown killer would come after them. The fear was so intense that they slept in the same room as their grandmother while their grandfather sat in the living room with a rifle. However, the detectives believed that the children were not in danger. In their opinion, the crime had solely a sexual motive and the killer must have known the victim. After speaking with Linda's relatives, they learned about her ex-husband, who had a history of domestic violence. He immediately became the prime suspect but the police quickly determined that the man was in a different state at the time of the murder afterward the investigators discovered that shortly before her death linda had started dating a certain man they located this person but he also had a solid alibi the detectives checked all the victim's neighbors comparing their fingerprints with the sample found on the windowsill the then conducted a similar comparison with all previously convicted men residing in lakeland but they couldn't find any matches Several weeks after the murder, Linda's sons gradually started to recover, and eventually the relatives decided that the best option for them would be to return to school. Over time, it did help the brothers as they began interacting with friends again and gradually returned to a normal life. Tim rejoined the football team as his mother had always been proud of his accomplishments in the sport. A month after her death, he hung a photograph of his team in his bedroom as a reminder of how his mother had taught him to move forward and achieve his goals. Meanwhile, the detectives reached a dead end, failing to find a suitable suspect. They decided to go back to the beginning and reconsider why the sons hadn't heard any screams or signs of a struggle. The police reviewed Jeff's statements and noticed that he had an argument with Linda on the day of her murder. Furthermore, the teenager himself mentioned that he and his mother frequently engaged in verbal disputes. This made the detectives wonder could Jeff have killed his mother? They called him in for questioning and started asking various questions again. Soon, Jeff realized that the investigators suspected him of the crime. He denied his involvement, 
but the detectives continued to pressure him. They offered Jeff to undergo a polygraph test, and he agreed. The polygraph operator did not detect any signs of deception, but the police were not ready to give up. Soon after, they called a man for questioning again, and even planned to bring in a hypnotist to put him in a trance state. Jeff constantly faced pressure, and the investigators directly accused him of strangling his mother. This led to the breaking point for Linda's relatives, who demanded that the police focus on finding the real killer and prohibited them from approaching Jeff. Despite this, Jeff agreed to undergo another polygraph test, and after successful results, he was finally no longer considered a suspect. From that point on, the case remained stagnant for many years. Jeff and Tim grew up, got jobs and started their own families. The murder of their mother still haunts them. But every time they contacted the investigators, they received the same response. No progress had been made in the case. In March 1999, experts extracted a DNA sample from the biological material found on the victim's body. Two years later, a new detective assigned to the case compared it with samples from all the suspects, including Linda's two sons, but there were no matches even comparing it with the FBI database yielded no results. When Jeff met with this detective, he realized that they had been acquainted for many years. It turned out that the men regularly played bowling together with mutual friends they talked and the investigator promised Jeff that he would solve the case no matter what around the same time Tim and Jeff heard about another unsolved crime that had remained unresolved for many years after it received widespread media attention new evidence emerged leading to the capture of the perpetrator that's when the brothers decided to approach journalists and share their family tragedy they gave a detailed interview and the story made it into the local newspapers in September 2001 the detective received an interesting lead he learned that a man named Jimmy Ulmer had abducted a young woman through her bedroom window a year after Linda's murder for which he received an 80-year prison sentence. What made it even more intriguing was that during Linda's murder, this person lived in the same residential complex just a few meters away from her house at the time of Homer's arrest. The DNA of criminals was not yet entered into a common database since it simply did not exist. The man himself passed away in 96 and there were no remaining biological samples. However, the detective contacted the perpetrator's mother, who provided several personal belongings from which the experts managed to extract the sample. Unfortunately, it did not match the DNA of the killer, but despite the setback, the detective was not ready to give up. He continued to search for new. Suspects consistently asked the FBI to run the DNA sample of the killer through all available databases and stayed in touch with Linda's sons. At that point, Jeff and Tim had almost resigned themselves to the thought that they would never find their mother's killer. However, in 2019, Ian New Hope emerged when C.C. Moore, a renowned expert in genetic genetic genealogy, took on the case. She took the DNA sample of the killer and uploaded it to public databases, then began searching for any matches. Typically, such databases can even help find the most distant relatives of the DNA owner who could be living in different parts of the world without the slightest knowledge of each other's existence. With this information, it is possible to trace their family tree and find common lines, filter out thousands of relatives and identify the DNA owner. After conducting all this extensive work, Moore was able to pinpoint one family living in the area at the time of the murder. Within that family, there was only one person who fit all the parameters, leaving her to conclude that he was highly likely to be the killer when the detectives heard his name. They immediately realized they had come across him in old reports his name was Joseph Clinton Mills. Tim's football coach, who regularly gave him a ride home from practice, had never been on the list of suspects, but back in 1981, the police took a statement over the phone as he had dropped Tim off at home on that same day. None of the detectives even considered the possibility that Mills could be the killer at that time. He was only 20 years old, and there was absolutely no evidence against him, so the police didn't compare his DNA and fingerprints with the samples found at the crime scene. The investigators decided to hold off on informing Jeff and Tim about this discovery. First, they needed to make sure that Mills was truly behind their mother's murder. After studying his biography, they discovered that Mills was arrested in 1984 for forgery of a will and his fingerprints were taken, which are still kept in a paper archive to this day. Experts compared them with the fingerprints found on the victim's window cell and obtained a perfect match. After 38 years, they finally learned the identity of the probable killer immediately after the after the they discovered that the man still lived in the same house as in 1981. Mills was now 58 years old, owned a small business, was married, and had children and grandchildren. 
The detectives monitored him for several weeks, hoping to obtain some item with his DNA. It could have been a cigarette butt, a coffee cup, a bottle, and so on. However, they never had the opportunity, so the police decided to discreetly retrieve his trash. They handed the bag to the laboratory, where experts tried to find an item with his DNA, and soon they succeeded. Mill's DNA matched completely with the sample found on Linda's body. Afterward, the detectives met with their sons to inform them of the progress in the case. They were both shocked, but Tim had a much harder time accepting it. He couldn't believe that his football coach turned out to be the same monster who had killed his mother. Tim respected him and looked up to him, and what's more, Mills continued to give him rides home from practice even after the murder. The man constantly encouraged him and always asked if there were any developments in his mother's case. For all these years, a photo of his football team hung in Tim's old bedroom, with the monster who killed his mom standing right behind him. In the same year Mills was arrested, he remained calm and didn't even ask what he was being accused of. When brought in for questioning and asked about Linda's murder, he claimed to have no involvement according to him. He dropped off Tim and left. Mills insisted that he never entered their house, but the detectives knew it was a lie. They informed him about the DNA and fingerprint match, after which the suspect suddenly changed his version of events. Now Mills insisted that on that night, Linda herself invited him to sneak into her bedroom through the window for an intimate encounter. Then she asked him to lightly choke her with a hanger, but Mills miscalculated his strength and ended up killing her. Of course, the detectives didn't believe this story for a second considering all the existing evidence. They had a much more plausible theory based on the fact that Mills had repeatedly given Tim rides home he had seen his mother and could have targeted her as a victim. On the evening of the murder, he dropped off the boy, who immediately went to a party at the neighbor's house with his mother. Mills took advantage of the fact that no one would be home in their house. He drove away for some distance and returned on foot, sneaking into Linda's bedroom through the window and hiding in the closet. He spent several hours there waiting for everyone to go to sleep. In that same closet, he took a wire hanger and used it as a murder weapon. After subjecting the victim to violence, he left the house through the window based on all the available evidence charges were brought against Mills for the murder, and the case was handed over to court in the state of Florida. The death penalty was a possible sentence for such a crime, and on February 920, Double Two Mills decided to make a deal with the prosecution to avoid this fate he confessed to the murder, but under the conditions of the agreement he was not required to disclose the details of the crime Linda's sons were unhappy with this fact in the courtroom Tim shouted at his coach demanding to know why. Dull. He took his mother away from him, but the man remained silent looking down only when given the opportunity for a final statement Mills said I'm a good person. I'm not who they're trying to portray me as. This angered the brothers even more, but ultimately they were grateful to the investigators for bringing the case to a conclusion and finally finding the killer. Mills was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole after the verdict was delivered. Jeff and Tim promised to try to live honorable lives and dedicate themselves to their families, as that is what their mother would have wanted. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more.